Chapter 26, 26. The Old Witch is Back. When Alexander reached the forest of Albania the first thing he did was to locate Edward. He looked around for hours but couldn't find him. The deeper into the forest he went the more silent it became. Not even mosquitoes made sound. He constantly felt like he was being watched and equipped himself for battle with a nice dragon hide suit. It had very high resistance to magical attacks and also physical attacks. Then he took out his magic assault rifle. Increasing his flying speed he kept on going towards the center of the forest. There were no animals in sight for as far as he could see. Suddenly his senses tingled and he dodged to his left. In retaliation, he quickly fired his assault rifle. Tens of bullets left the barrel in a matter of seconds. He looked at what attacked him, it was a tree like the Whomping Willow at Hogwitz. Though it is dead now, his assault rifle was too powerful. Enhanced with magic, every bullet left a hole in the trunk of the tree, each being 30 centimeters wide. He wanted to test the shotgun and rocket launcher now, seeing that there was nothing else that attacked him, he headed forward. After another hour he finally reached a crumbling castle. It was in ruins but he could still sense many strong wards protecting it. Being confident in his abilities he approached the castle and forcefully destroyed the wards. Then he opened the rotting wooden door. Who dares to trespass? An angry female voice resounded. It was quite powerful. Then out of nowhere a big ball of fire fell from the sky on Alexander. Alexander just used a defensive charm to fight if a but. Five seconds later. What the hell? What happened? Where am I? He shouted. He remembered that he tried to fight back the fireball but then he lost consciousness. Did I die? But how? I thought Dumbledore was the strongest in this world and I am stronger than him. Who can be stronger than me now? He annoyingly questioned. I remember God's words now. I may be unkillable but I am not invincible. I guess I got a bit arrogant. I should focus on saving Edward Bow. He once again took to the sky and headed to the big castle. This time he prepared himself. The moment he reached the castle he fired full power destructive charms. Bombarda Maxima, Fiend Fire, Protégé Maxima. The charms did have a destructive effect. The walls of the castle crumbled to the ground leaving just the inner structure standing. Finally, he saw the woman. An old middle-aged woman was sitting on a big sofa and in front of her was the frozen body of Edward. There was also a snake near Edward's body which was also frozen. You. How are you still alive? The woman shouted in surprise. Ha ha ha. I am very strong, woman. Now release both of them or I'll. How dare you threaten me? Me, the great Morgan Elife. I will destroy you. She pointed her wand and sent some red light at him. It was not a spell but pure materialized magic. Alexander did the same with his hand. His spell made blue light. They both collided and made a colorful yet destructive mess. Damn, she's quite strong. I don't think I can hold her for very long. She's still increasing her power Alexander mumbled. Haha, <laughs> good, good. You are the only person after Merlin who is able to make me use so much power but, if you think this is my limit then you are mistaken she increased the magic and slowly started to push back Alexander. Alexander saw that he could not defeat her so he thought of a way to leave with Edward and probably Nagini. He was pretty sure that his newly created mind arts were something no one knew. He used them on the witch. He couldn't penetrate into her mind but it did shock her for a second. That's all he needed. He operat to their frozen bodies and operat back to his office in Galaxy Tower with them. He also left a present for Morgan. It was a magic grenade. Morgan Ellie Fay was shocked when the small ball that blew up and destroyed her entire castle and the jungle in 50 meters radius. As soon as the smoke settled she found a note. I'll be back. Let's see who kills whom she scoffed and went back to remake her castle. Meanwhile back at the Galaxy Tower, Alexander fixed Edward and Nogany. Thank you, Professor, I thought I would never see the world again. Edward weakly said. What happened there and where did you find the snake? I followed the snake to that castle but the witch living there was too strong. I tried so hard but. Edward felt disappointed with himself. It's alright buddy, even I wasn't able to do anything to her. It's crazy knowing that there is someone out there even stronger than me but considering that she is the thousand year old witch from Merlin's time, it's not really surprising. She's probably a supreme magus but I was able to fight for a while which would mean that she hasn't reached her full potential, Alexander said. What are we gonna do now? If you cannot stop her then who can? Edward questioned. I'll get back to research. I'll try to get stronger as much as I can. She hasn't attacked the world yet so let's just hope that what we did does not change her mind. In the meantime I want you to pour all your sweat and blood into training. You must reach the level of the Grand Archmagi. Teach Hermione with yourself. She needs to reach at least Archmagi level. Alexander ordered. Edward nodded and then looked at the snake. What are you going to do with it? He asked. I'll remove her maledictus and let her live a normal life. Maybe she can teach you a thing or two. Then Alexander approached Nagini. She looked scared. Can you understand me? He asked using his mind-talking skill. Nagini nodded her snake head. Good, I can remove the blood curse from you permanently. You will be able to turn back to human and live normally. Will you allow me to do it? The snake excitedly nodded her head. Okay then, drink this. This is an elixir. It has amazing healing abilities he put a saucer filled with the potion. It was not just some elixir from the stone. There were hundreds of other things in it. She slowly drank it whole and then waited. She could feel something happening to her but couldn't pinpoint it. Haha. <laughs> It'll take some time for effects to show up, girl he said and patted her snake head. She didn't like it at first but the warmth of kindness coming from him made her enjoy it. 
It had been so many years since someone showed her true kindness. After about three hours Nagini's transformation into a human was completed. Though she was sleeping the whole time, Alexander put a warm blanket on her and left some clothes nearby for her. He went back to researching the Philosopher's Stone. It was really an amazing thing but finding out how it was made was really hard and for that he decided to pay a visit to Nicholas. Only he could answer his questions. Next morning, Nagini got up from her bed with sleepy eyes. She looked around and found out she was alone. Without thinking much she rubbed her eyes. It took a few seconds before she realized that she had arms and legs. Once again a human. An excited scream left her mouth as she ran to a mirror to see herself. Her jaw dropped looking at the girl in the mirror. Pretty face, long black hair and a well-defined beautiful curvy body. Her gaze checked out the body from head to toe. Soon she realized that she was naked and embarrassingly put on clothes near the bed. They were all black, well, most of it. The pants were made of very comfortable black leather. Then a dark gray shirt and a dark black leather long coat with dragon scales like top layer. The coat was so well designed it complemented her figure. Then there were black long boots. The clothes were made so that they fitted themselves to the size of the wearer. She went back to the mirror to see how she looked in the dress. Satisfied was an understatement for her current mood. She was so happy. She didn't even know that she could look this pretty. After all, most of her life was spent in the circus and then on the run after permanently turning into a snake. She quickly shook her head to throw away all those bad feelings. It was a new chance for her. She then combed her hair and styled them a bit. Her hair was deep black, long and silky, so she let them stay loose with front fringes. Being satisfied with herself, she decided to go out. Oh no, I don't even know that sir's name. She rushed out. In the hall, Alexander was working beside his portable workbench. Sir. A sweet sound came from behind. He turned around. He looked at her for a few seconds before collecting himself. She looked very beautiful. Her face was somewhat of a mixture of an Asian and European but with Asian genes being more dominant. Haha. <laughs> How do you like the dress? I love it, sir. Thank you for saving me. She bowed. It's nothing, by the way, my name is Alexander Maxim Universe, you can call me professor as I was a professor at Hogwarts for a while. I am the current minister of magic of the British wizarding world. He introduced himself. Thank you, professor. If you hadn't come then I don't know what would have happened to me, she said. Ah stop thanking me now, I am happy I could help. By the way, how did you end up in Albania? He asked. Well, I was running away from that noseless man. He had nearly caught me but that witch saved me. I thought she would help me but instead, she tried to do experiments on me she shuddered thinking about that. No need to be afraid now, that snake man wanted to make you his horcrux but I have already killed him. The witch in the forest will also be dealt with soon enough. The ministry is also going to pass a law soon which will give intelligent non-human species the same rights as any other human. You should just enjoy your life. You can live here as long as you want, there are too many rooms. He said and also threw a money pouch at her. It had 10,000 gold galleons. I can also find you a normal job if you want but you should first get yourself accustomed to the surroundings. Yes, thank you she bowed again. Alexander nodded with a smile and went back to doing his research. Chapter 27, 27. Try Wizard Tournament and two years. He headed to France to meet Nicholas. Finding him was easy with the help of Uniphone. Everyone uses it these days. Many Death Eaters or criminals were being caught every day because of the Uniphone. Spying on people was bad but also necessary. Even more so when the people we are talking about are wizards and witches. He found the address of the ancient wizard and met him. He was surprisingly very calm and told him how he made the stone. Turns out, he didn't really make the stone from scratch. He had found the incomplete stone in Egypt and did a lot of research on it. After many years of hard work, he completed it. So there was no way of finding out how it was made. Sad and frustrated, he returned to Galaxy Tower. He had no new leads to work on. Across the room, he saw Nagini sitting on the couch watching the TV and eating candy. The news was also showing something important. A new law for magical equality was passed today with full majority. Umbridge and Lucius did a good job in swaying people. The law even gave rights to house elves. It was now a punishable offense to beat and torture mentally or physically and kill them. Most of the people of the wizarding world did not care much about it but it was a big deal for the non-human magical species. Like goblins, werewolves, vampires, giants, merfolk, etc. All the credit was given to Alexander for this by the media, which increases his approval ratings among muggle-born wizards and witches to new heights. His golem clone was continuously giving interviews to the media. Seeing that he had nothing to do, Alexander decided to visit the ministry and explore it a little, mainly the Department of Mysteries. He operat into his office in the ministry and headed to level 9 from there. The first room was the Hall of Prophecies. There were racks with white orbs stacked in an orderly manner for as long as he could see. He just walked around and inspected things. He tried to find a prophecy on him but couldn't. There wasn't anything else of interest there. Next stop, he went to the room filled with brains in a glass thing filled with green liquid. He was fascinated. They were trying to create human-like artificial intelligence which could be later used to make intelligent castles. The idea was to connect these brains with hearthstones and then let them control things. Though they were still stuck at creating the brains. Still, mechanical AI was much better in Alexander's mind than a real AI with a human brain and possible feelings. 
He still copied all the research material and then left to the room of Time Turner. It was filled with various clocks. It was a very tempting power to go back in time and change things. Though he felt crazy how wizards had real time machines but still knew nothing about the universe or its laws, then he checked out the space chamber where they had made a miniature real like solar system with all the planets floating around. There was nothing much to be seen. It was like a school summer project where your teacher told you to make a solar system model. He skipped the love chamber and moved on to the death chamber. For this, he came prepared. Even though he wanted to go into the veil and see what's beyond he decided not to cross it. Who knows where it would take him, though he still checked it out and he still had many things to do here. He took out his 100 meter long expanding stick with an enchanted camera at one end and a screen at the handle. It showed live feed through the cables. He didn't know if wireless signals would work in it so he chose wired enchanted setup. He got near the veil and started to hear some whispers which sounded like dog barks. He held the handle of the stick firmly and started expanding the stick. He kept on looking at the screen. For many meters, he could only see white light but after crossing 50 meters the scene changed. He saw a vast field of grass and surprisingly, many dogs. There was only one man, playing with them. He had a long white beard, hair, and plain white robes. Old man is that you? Alexander spoke out loud. His voice seemed to have attracted the attention of the old man. Son, is that you? The old man came closer to the camera with a confused face. Yeah, it's me. I sent this camera to explore the other side of the veil of death. He explained. Oh, I guess she forgot to add anti-physical matter feature to the veil. Good thing it was you and not some other guy. This veil leads to the other world. The moment a person enters it their body gets destroyed and their soul crosses on. This place is filled with these cute dogs and they are tasked to judge people and lead them to hell, heaven, or the waiting area for the continuation of the reincarnation cycle. Well, he found his answer. From God himself. Why did you even put this thing here? He asked. God shook his head. It wasn't me. It was the deity of that world. Death was her name if I remember correctly. She put that veil in the world some thousand years ago with my permission. I never asked her why he answered without care. Well, I'll ask her myself if I ever get the time. I should be going now. When will you be coming back, my son? I am very bored. I'll throw a party when you come back and Jesus will also be there. Oh, I'll invite those Greek and Nordic gods as well, maybe the Indian gods too? Nah, there are so many of them that it would get crowded. He started thinking loudly. Alexander just left silently and returned to his office. He was then about to leave the ministry to go and teach his prodigies. School had already started. Hermione was in her second year and Edward was in his sixth, though he was going to leave as soon as his n.e.w.ts result came out. Knock knock. He was interrupted by his assistant. Sir, the headmasters of Bosbaton's Academy of Magic, Durmstrang Institute and Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry have come to see you. Sigh. Must be the Triwizard Tournament he said to himself. Okay, send them in he ordered. Hello my friend, how are you? Dumbledore entered first with a wide smile. Behind him were two other headmasters. Their chat went on as he expected. They decided to hold a Triwizard Tournament in two years. They wanted him to act as its head jury and overseer, to which he agreed. His prodigy Hermione was going to win it for sure, he thought. Two years passed by in a blink. Alexander poured his sweat and blood in getting stronger. He could feel that he was about to break through to the realm of Supreme Magi. Edward had now taken over the company and he also invented many new stuff. He was a reincarnator and had the gift of a bright mind, so he made many magic appliances from his past memories. Buildings like the Galaxy Tower were erected in many countries and they were used by his news agency, production studio, manufacturing base, and mall. Universe Industries had built these head branches in the USA, India, China, Australia, and Brazil. He refrained from making too many as it would dilute the crowd and decrease the earnings of each mall. Small Portkea branches were present in every magic market in the world so it was easy for anyone to visit the mall. Alexander's extensive research on the Philosopher's Stone made him able to make many kinds of new potions. His potions were able to help people suffering from all kinds of diseases and curses. Even the blood curse was curable. The Greengrass family were among the first buyers of that potion. Later they became a firm supporter of Alexander and all his ventures. He had to buy a large piece of land to grow plants for his potion business. He bought a whole island near the west coast. Its security was even tighter than Azkaban's. Only Edward, Hermione, and his house elves were allowed to be there. Many of the plants were extremely rare and were used for some high-level potions. A new thing that he introduced was a revision in the Quidditch. Since his company started making super fast brooms that would put any other company to shame, the Quidditch matches started getting boring as the seeker easily caught the golden snitch. After his proposal, the speed of the snitch was increased to make it harder to catch it. Not just that, the bludger's speed was also increased. Because of him, Quidditch became profitable once again. He started a new galaxy championship like the World Cup. But galaxy championship was made to be capitalized to its limit. Merchandises were made for all teams, advertisements were placed all around, and a new stadium that could house 500,000 people was made. Plus some blood pumping music made the game more enjoyable. Even betting on wins became official, but everything was kept under extreme surveillance to avoid match fixing. He had also recently launched flying robes which could change into any kind of fashion, color, or fitting as the wearer wanted. 
They were also fireproof, waterproof, dustproof, and also damage-proof to a limit. They were an instant hit in the market. People lined up for days to buy them. His fortune had grown so much that he didn't even know what to do with it. There were two different accounts in the Gringotts. One was the company account and another was his personal account in which all his dividends from the profit came in. Although he was the sole owner of the company, he only took a small percentage of profit. The rest was invested back in new ventures. His personal account now had 12 billion gold galleons, 115 billion US dollars, and the company account had 93 billion gold galleons, 895 billion US dollars. At one point the goblins had to ask him to use his magic for expanding the vaults because there were no vaults made to store that much money. He was the richest man in the world and owned the richest company in the world. He knew this would happen one day as his company was a one of a kind and had no competition. On top of that, it was internationally spread. The gold poured in from all over the world. The figure was stabilizing now though as they had reached the peak customers possible in comparison to the wizard population. E-commerce also played a major role in his wealth. Gringotts also became richer with him and they asked him to design a universal currency exchange system so that all the Gringotts in the world could be connected. In these years, Edward had reached peak Archmagi strength. Meaning that he was stronger than Dumbledore now, because he had enough strength to protect himself, Alexander named him his heir. He also gave Hermione 5% ownership of the company. Nagini proved to be a very strong wizard. When her accumulated power from so many years was put to training she quickly reached the level of a peak master magi, professor level, and would surely break through to arch magi in some years. He also gave her 3% of the company. Hermione was going to be the minister of magic so she needed wealth to stay on top of others. Nagini had given herself the position of overseer of the company. She watched out for any kind of corruption in the system and hence she deserved the 3%. Professor, it's time for the Triwizard Tournament commencement dinner. We should head to Hogwarts now Edward Operat Din. Edward, even though was a reincarnator, understood that Alexander was different from him. He understood and accepted the fact that Alexander was his elder whose job was to improve the world. The years that he spent with him were his life's most fun and memorable years. Voldemort was already dead so he had even forgotten about his revenge mission. Ah yes, I nearly forgot about that. Let's go they both operat to the Hogwarts lakeside entrance. As soon as they reached Hogwarts they were blasted by the screams and cheers of the students. Boys were a big fan of Alexander and considered him their role model and on the other hand, the girls were head over heels for Edward. Alexander remembered that there was an article some months ago in the newspaper which said that Edward is the number one most desirable bachelor in the magical world. But he also pitied the girls as he knew that Edward's heart already belonged to some girl with curly hair. Hermione was much different from canon in this world because of Alexander. She was wild, super strong, smart, and pretty. Especially now as her bodily features have started to develop, more. Edward knew that the age gap between them wouldn't make it appropriate to date her for now but he decided to wait. Hermione also didn't see any boy as a romantic companion other than Edward. She liked him a lot and loved to spend time with him. She had also agreed to wait a bit before going public with their relationship. But for now, they were happy to be beside each other. Where did Alexander fit in all this? Well, he was more of a father figure to them, someone whom they both considered family. Chapter 28, 28. Hagrid the Badass. First came the Durmstrang. Their headmaster had been recently changed as Karkaroff was tagged and bagged to Azkaban under the charges of conspiring against the ministry and having ties with Voldemort. The dumbass was afraid that the Dark Lord would kill him when he returns so to redeem himself he wanted to capture Harry Potter in the new tournament and as expected, he was caught in the act. All thanks to the great uniphones. Alexander wasn't going to let anyone spoil the Triwizard tournament. It was time for his prodigy Hermione to rise and shine. He removed all the people who could cause trouble from the equation. Lucius and Umbridge were already in his pocket. He had also recently uncovered the whole conspiracy of Barty Crouch Jr. being out of Azkaban and hiding in his father's house while his mother was rotting in Azkaban with Polyjuice. The whole world was in shock when the news came out. It only made his new law easier to pass. Now, death punishment was allowed as long as proven guilty. His new type of pensive helped a lot in that matter. Most of the guilty ones still living in Azkaban were put to death, Barty Crouch Jr. included. Karkaroff was also to be put to death within a week. After Durmstrang, Bosbatons came with their flying carriage pulled by many flying horses. Soon an extremely tall woman like a person came out of the carriage followed by the students. She went to Dumbledore and gave him a hug. Her size dwarfed him in both length and breadth after that she looked at Alexander and went closer to him. Oh, it is a pleasure to meet you again Mr. Universe. I very much liked the new line of cosmetics you just invented she blushingly said. Haha, the pleasure is all mine Madam Maxime. If you really like that product then you'll like the newer version of it even more. It will not just make your skin smooth and soft but will also make you look younger. My, you are doing such a boon for us witches. She flattered. Dumbledore and the no-name new headmaster of Durmstrang came to them. Let's head inside, Madame Maxime and Mr. Universe. It's time to start the feast. Yes yes, let's go, Albus. Madame Maxime said and walked away in a supposedly graceful manner. Hagrid's gonna fall in love with her. I can bet on it, Edward whispered to Alexander. No thanks, I don't bet on something I know I will lose. He said and followed. 
of course Hagrid's gonna fall in love with her. Hagrid's social circle is even smaller than Snape in his emo days and it's very rare to find a half-giant woman so he'll be in the heat for sure. Inside the Great Hall, things happened just as they were supposed to. Durmstrang and Bosbatons made their cringy entrance. Dumbledore introduced him, Ludovic Bagman, head of the Department of Magical Games and Sports, and other headmasters. Plus the new permanent DADA Professor Sirius Black. As Voldemort was dead with all his horcruxes destroyed, the D.A.D. .A curse was lifted. Not that anybody knew about Voldemort's death. After everyone had eaten their fill the tables from the center were removed and a giant goblet of fire was brought in. Dumbledore stood up and introduced the flaming goblet. This is the goblet of fire. Anyone wishing to submit themselves for the tournament merely write their name upon a piece of parchment and throw it in the flame before this hour on Thursday night. Do not do so lightly, if chosen there's no turning back. As from this moment the Triwizard Tournament has begun. All students above third year can put their names. Unlike in the movies, because nothing dangerous happened in Hogwarts in the past two years and most of the magical world was at peace. The age limit was not increased. After that, all the teachers exited the room. Hagrid suspiciously followed Madame Maxime. Alexander and Edward also went after them and found the giant boy Hagrid stalking and drooling on her from a distance. Pat. As soon as Hagrid felt someone behind him his face turned pale as if his soul left his body. Then he looked back and became a bit calmer. It's just the professor. I mean Minister Universe. I thought it was someone else. Well, Hagrid. She won't be impressed if this is going to be your tactic. Let's go to your castle and talk there. He suggested. Oh yeah, Hagrid has his own small castle now. Gifted to him by Alexander. His hut was burnt down when lightning struck it a year ago. Later Alexander came to Hogwarts and created a castle in a matter of minutes. Now he lives in a 20 room, 3 floors high castle. Big enough to let him live comfortably. Alright, Hagrid. If we're going to do this then we're going to do it the right way. The way you look right now, even a forest troll wouldn't want you in her bed. You need to get rid of that crappy beard and long hair. Alexander said and conjured a pair of big shrub cutters. No. No professor. My beard is my life. I can't live w. He started walking backwards in fear. Hagrid, what's important? Your filthy bush of keratin or a nice naked lady like Madame Maxime by your side every day you wake up, Edward argued. What the hell Ed? I feel like puking now, Alexander lowly grunted. Ha ha ha. I am enjoying this way too much Professor Edward said with an evil laughter and made sniping sounds from bush cutters. Hagrid's thick skull seemed to agree that giving up on Madame Maxime for a beard wasn't worth it. What happened next was magic. The highest tier of magic. Making Hagrid from looking like a dumb dirty giant to a badass viking. His beard was correctly trimmed and hairstyled. Alexander had to make him drink a crazy amount of permanent beauty potions that hadn't even been released to the market yet. The potions changed his facial structure and made him look more badass handsome than his earlier jolly kind face. His fat body had now turned into a body of a giant Greek god. And the masterpiece is done. You can look in the mirror now Hagrid, Edward said with a proud face. Hagrid slowly moved to a huge mirror and looked. He stood there motionless for 10 seconds. Blimey, who is this? Is this an illusion? He shouted and started caressing his face. After confirming that it was really him, he felt happy. Happy beyond words. Join Discord for image, https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash wtvhdba. To see them on Instagram, https colon slash slash www.instagram dot com slash mr underscore immortal underscore novel. It's time for Madame Maxime to fall head over heels for you, Alexander said. Eh, ah, I hope she likes this look Hagrid mumbled to himself. Okay, now change your clothes to nice clean modern robes and head back to school and also take this wand, Alexander said with a long wand in his hand. Hagrid just looked at his old wand which was taken from him so many years ago by the ministry. Hey are you sure? It was confiscated. Hagrid, I am the minister of magic. I write the wizarding law. If I say you can have your wand, then you can have it he forcefully pushed it into his hands. Hagrid looked flabbergasted for a second and then quickly bear hugged Alexander with small tears. Haha, alright alright big man, don't break my old bones he laughed. Edward also grinned, looking at the happy Hagrid. Back in school, Hermione proudly put her name in the goblet of fire. Harry also put it, but this time when no one was trying to get him killed, the chances of his name being selected were close to zero. He was just a slightly above average wizard at best, except the D.A.D.A. and Pody one in courses. His two godfathers were teaching him pretty good. The only talent he had was in Quidditch. Ron also put his name for just the sake of it. Alexander had always felt weird about Ron. Why was he the only one with no talent in anything? All his brothers were good at something. Even Ginny was better than him, that is if getting Harry into her pants was to be considered an achievement. He conducted thorough research on the mind of Ron Weasley and what he found surprised him. It turned out that his brain was damaged in some ways. Not physically but magically. Later he also found out that Ron was conceived when Arthur Weasley was unknowingly under Imperious Curse back in the time of First Wizarding War against Voldemort. When he told about his findings to the Weasley couple they broke down in tears. All these years they considered Ron a bad seed but it turned out that it was not his fault. He was bullied by his brothers for something that was out of his control. They asked Alexander if he could do something and he agreed to help. 
These days, Ron was on a regular regime of potions that were supposed to heal his brain. Though he would live most of his life just being average but, at least it will be better than being below average. Still, he will try again when he levels up into the realm of the Supreme Magi. Some days passed and finally came Thursday night. Everyone gathered around in the Great Hall. When Alexander entered with Hagrid, everyone gawked. The giant badass hunk looked so out of place. Madame Maxime checked Hagrid out with lustful gaze. You look. Amazing, Hagrid my friend, Dumbledore exclaimed. Ha ha ha. It's all thanks to Minister Universe here. He laughed it off, being as cheerful as always. Well, there were no potions to change someone's nature so Madame Maxime will have to satisfy herself with what she's getting Alexander thought looking at simple-minded Hagrid. Let's see who are the chosen champions, Dumbledore spoke. The goblet spat out a piece of paper. Dumbledore caught it and announced. From the Durmstrang, we have Victor Crumb as the champion the hall erupted in clapping and cheers. Soon another piece came. From Bosbatons, we have Fleur Delacour as the champion. From Hogwarts, we have Hermione Granger he announced. Alexander started to crazily clap like a proud father. Soon the whole hall followed him and everyone started to clap. After that, they were all interviewed by Rita Skeeter. Though this time she came with a camera crew. Chapter 29, 29. Breakthrough. The next day, the news about the champions rolled out. The Triwizard Tournament was going to be broadcast live to the world and hopefully, there will be a World Wizard Tournament in the future. Alexander also announced that the tournament was being sponsored by Universe Industries and the winner will win 500,000 galleons. There were just three contestants so there would only be two rounds but to make things more interesting he decided to change the second round. The first round was the same as in canon but the second round was much harder. The champions would have to complete a cross-country race with many obstacles in between. Obstacles such as illusions, enchanted forests, wild beasts, under Alexander's control, traversing through the muggle world, crossing a big river with provided means, and finally, when they are tired, there will be a duel at the end. There was still a week before the tournament began so he thought of focusing on his breakthrough and probably reaching the realm of Supreme Magi. In the past two years, Alexander drank many potions made with the help of the Philosopher's Stone. If he were to try to break through with sheer work then it would have probably taken him more than 500 years but with the help of the stone, the process was greatly shortened. Many times he had thought about straight up eating the stone. He knew he wouldn't permanently die so there was no risk but he still controlled himself as it was the only philosopher's stone in the world and without it, he wouldn't be able to study it. He was also close to being able to make another philosopher's stone and now only needed to search for some alternate materials but that was for later because for now, he had found a way to break through. Back in the galaxy tower, are you ready old man? Edward asked. He nodded, when I say, open the valves at full capacity. Edward took his position near a complex mechanism of pipes. The pipes were attached to Alexander's backbone at one end and on the other, they were connected to a large glass tank filled with red liquid. For the last time, he took a long breath. Do it, he said softly. Getting the green signal, Edward slowly twisted the valves. The red liquid started to slide in the pipes to the backbone of Alexander. The liquid was made with the help of various rare substances and the stone. It was meant to strengthen Alexander's body to the point where he could store enough magic in his body so that he could break through. Yes, the painful infusion of the red liquid was just the first step. Alexander gritted his teeth and endured the pain while using magic to make the red liquid evenly flow at every point in his body. His bones, skin, and organs were getting strengthened. The process was somewhat similar to what he did back in his world to increase his lifespan. The only difference was that this was a lot more painful. It took him 22 hours to consume all the red liquid in the glass tank. By the end of the process, his body was glowing red and emitting heat. Edward carelessly touched the skin and hastily leapt back as it felt like lava. Alexander just sat still with closed eyes trying to cool his body and flow as much magic into his body as he can. It took eight more hours before he opened his eyes. He looked around and found Edward sleeping on a chair in a very uncomfortable posture. He took a very long breath and stood up. With a wave of his hand, his body got cleaned and new clothes wrapped around his body. He could feel the power surging in his veins. He felt like he could punch a hole through earth and come out on the other side. Why eh? How do you feel old man? Edward spoke with a loud yawn. Better than ever. I really can't describe this feeling in words. He said while clutching his fist. Well, I guess I'll have to work harder and reach your level then. Yes, you and Hermione, both. I'd be at more ease if both of you became at least as strong as me now, Alexander said. And we will. Can you defeat that Morgan Ellie Fay now? Edward hopefully asked. Her threat was even bigger than that of Voldemort. Hopefully, but if push comes to shove, I'll try plan B he grudgingly said and looked at the Philosopher's Stone in the now empty glass tank. Edward understood his meaning and didn't talk any further. Need to prepare before we leave, he asked. Growl. Yes, I need something to eat and you are not coming, Alexander said. What? Why can't I come? Alexander put his hand on Edward's shoulder and said because she's an overpowered ancient witch. She is way above your level. Even I couldn't do anything to her and I'm not sure even now. I am immortal Edward, but you aren't. Edward clutched his fist and gritted his teeth, feeling useless. Don't bash yourself. All you can do is focus on practice and get stronger. Strong enough to at least put a scratch on my shirt he jokingly mocked. I am not that weak, old man. 
You just wait, me and Hermione will one day beat your ass, Edward replied with determination. Ha ha ha. In your dreams, boy Alexander laughed it off. By the way, you are the Minister of Magic so you must know what the first task will be in the Triwizard Tournament. Give me some hint old man, I gotta help her he pleaded like a boy under a love potion. You know that's cheating, all I can say is that the first task will be tough, though she can do it with ease but still, learning the tongue will help, Alexander said while eating his cereal. Edward looked at him with wide eyes was, was that a clue, who knows, well, I should get going, he shrugged, don't you want some armor or something, Edward asked, there is no armor that can withstand that kind of power I and my opponent possess, though I would love to make one in the future, okay then, bye, he checked the philosopher's stone in his pocket and operat to the forest of Albania, he heard a voice just as he reached the jungle, I see, you have gotten stronger, interesting, intriguing, it took me 600 years to become this strong, but sadly, you are still not strong enough to pose a threat to me. Alexander started flying to the old castle while talking to the voice. I'll be the judge of my power, though do tell me why the strongest wizard in the world is hiding here in this jungle. Like a rat hiding in sewers he mocked. Clap clap. You expect me to get angry at your attempt to berate me and tell you all my secrets? Sorry, but I am not some soul-splitting snake man, the voice replied. Well, no harm in trying, who knows when Lady Luck would give her blessings. Seriously, though, why wait so long? What do you want? This time he asked seriously. There's no point in telling you as you'd not be going back this time, but I will make sure to show you how I take over the world. You should rejoice, you are going to be my, Morgan Ellie Fay's new lieutenant. Haha. <laughs> and you expected me to just bow to you and start kissing your feet. Alexander scoffed. Sure, if that's what you're into, the voice said. He had to agree, that was a nice comeback. Let's just get over it. I have many other things to do than squabble with an old hag. He flew straight near the castle and waited for her to come out. Fine, let's get this over with. A middle-aged woman flew out of the building towards him. He checked her sins first. Morgan Ellie Fay, Category 5. Murder, 2,321,757. Blood Sacrifice, 3,246,764, 1,469,132 babies. Magical Beasts Murder, 286, All Unicorns. Torture, 286,578. Sin Percentage, 100%. Whoa, she's the epitome of evil. Good thing I came here. I don't know how many would have died trying to defeat her with just Edward. Alexander wanted to test his strength to see if he could fight her as he was now, so he attacked her first. He threw a hundred grenades with different exploding timer at her. The moment they started exploding, her focus shifted from him for a second. At that moment he pointed his right hand at her and released pure magical power with intent to kill. Without even looking at him she also sent her magic to counter him. Their magic got into a tug of war which she was winning slowly. I told you, you are weaker than me. I'm giving you a chance. Kneel, and you shall have everything you wish for, she yelled. Anything you say he asked with a low voice. Morgan smirked thinking that he was breaking. Yes, anything, she repeated. Then I want, your head. Boom. An upgraded exploding bullet from his desert eagle touched Morgan's head. Alexander capitalized on that chance and increased his power. His magic started gaining some lead and started closing up on her. SH asterisk T, how is she so strong? He cursed under his breath. His happiness was short-lived as she regained her composer. Though she did lose an eye. You bastard, I'll kill you, I'll kill everything you love she screamed in rage and started unleashing her full power. The lead he had gained started to diminish. She overpowered him. Damn it, I hate dying. He had realized what was going to happen. Avida Kedavra, another shout came from behind him. Who was that? Soon he was hit by two overpowered killing curses and ended up dying. But just before he closed his eyes he looked behind himself and sure enough, it was the damn snake boi. 50 miles away. Alexander res beyond in the air. Motherfuck, why is he still alive? Arg. It's all my fault to assume that he did not make more horcruxes. How can I forget that this is not the same Harry Potter world as in books or movies? I guess it's plan B then. But I must make sure that I take her memories the next time. Maybe she'll know something that will help me make another Philosopher's Stone. Who knows what kind of knowledge she has in store he reprimanded himself as he took out the Philosopher's Stone from his pocket. He looked at it for the last time. Here goes nothing. He put it in his mouth and started chewing it. Hmm. There's a taste of sand and a lot of other things with very bad taste. Then swallowed the powdered stone and waited for something to happen. He waited. And waited. No no no. I just wasted the only philosopher's stone in existence, and how am I going to beat that ancient hag? He started to get frustrated, not knowing the changes happening inside his body. The stone broke down into small particles and started spreading all around his body. It started to strengthen his body to the molecular level. Soon he noticed the increasing red glow on his skin and hurriedly took off his vest and shirt. This looks like just what happened when I used the enhancement potions a while ago. But this time the red glow is too strong. Hmm. Something must be happening to my body. Worried that Morgan might see him in his breakthrough, he operat back to his office and started full-powered wards. Boss, what happened to you? Nagini came running at him. She apparently came to give him some stats report. Nothing girl, I just ate the philosopher's stone he nonchalantly said and laid down on the couch. 
Oh, okay then, I came to. You ate the philosopher's stone, she panicked. What should I do? Are you feeling okay? Should I call someone? Yes, I should call someone. Hey hey, easy, I'm fine, it's just the color. But then he felt an itch and realized. Wait. Shit. Run Nagini run. My power is going to break out. Apparate out of here. Now he roared. She did as he said with a worried face. After going out she urgently called Edward. Meanwhile, in the office, Alexander's body had started to glow more and more. He wanted to apparate away to a secluded area but realized that if he cast even a Lumos, his magic would break out. Soon his body was filled with magic to the brim and had no other way than letting it out. Lumos he cast a harmless spell. At least he thought it was harmless. His Lumos had so much energy that an eye-blinding light covered the whole of Diagon Alley. That was after it was minimized by the most powerful wards in the world. Boom. An explosion was heard at the top of the galaxy tower. The top floor's windows had shattered and the roof had come down falling. After 10 seconds the blinding light subsided. Edward and Nagini hurried to Alexander, only to find him shirtless and in shredded pants. He was unconscious. His natural white skin had returned and he seemed to have grown taller. Edward used Reparo charm to fix the damage and then put him on his bed. He tried to diagnose Alexander but couldn't find any problems. He called Snape for help as he was now a devoted following of Alexander. It seems he had too much magic built up and released it in a burst. His body is healing itself to create space for the increased capacity to store magic. Snape diagnosed. When will he wake up? Edward asked. I can't say, maybe an hour or a day. It's hard to predict. Do you know what happened to him? Snape asked. Edward shook his head. Last I remember, he went to fight a powerful dark wizard. Snape nearly jumped in shock. His mind started to think, who could be strong enough to fight Alexander? Who was it? He asked. Suddenly he heard the answer from the bed. It was a thousand-year-old witch. You know Morgan Elifay. Alexander spoke as he slowly got up. Edward quickly ran to help him. You mean the legendary dark wizard that was defeated by Merlin? Snape asked. Not a legend, apparently. She's been alive and has grown strong. C.A. Can you defeat her? He stuttered. Hell yeah, after what just happened, defeating her is gonna be child's play. He bragged. Edward looked at him with wide eyes. Did you? Breakthrough again. Alexander shrugged. I don't know. I certainly became a lot stronger than before but there is no higher level than the Supreme Magi so there's no way of knowing. Still, considering the power needed to break through each time, I'd say I am at least two level higher than Supreme Magi. The Philosopher's Stone certainly packed a good punch, he thought. So you're basically a wizard god now, Edwards joked. Maybe, maybe not. I have no foo asterisk king idea, but I am gonna kick some medieval ass for sure. Snape just silently heard the two talking and easily deduced that Alexander had gotten even stronger than he was before, which made him feel a bit better. Thanks for coming here, Severus. I'll be finishing the fight now, you can wait here if you want to, he offered. Snape just came off of his stupor and nodded. All right, now that I know that I can defeat her, I must create a spectacular show for the whole magical world. The world should remember me as the second coming of Merlin he silently planned with a devious smile which made even Snape creep out. Chapter 30, 30. The Purge. Alexander immediately started planning for the show slash fight. If he wanted the wizarding world to blindly follow him, then he needed to show them how powerful he was. He was going to be fighting Morgan Ellie Fay while Edward will fight Voldemort. This would make his social standing stronger when he's gone from the world. The fighting ground had been set to Hogwarts. Hundreds of magic cameras were being set up all around the castle and its surrounding areas in the name of shooting a documentary. Alexander had cast a wide area charm on and around Hogwarts which when activated would teleport all students and bystanders away when he needed to. As soon as he was finished, he got back into his suit and prepared to go and lure Morgan. Edward and Alexander had assembled in his office to discuss the plan. You ready Ed? This is going to be the final fight. He asked. Yes professor, but I am worried about the new horcrux of Voldemort. We don't know what it is or where it is. Edward pondered. Worry not my boy, chances are Morgan has it. But it doesn't matter. I just want you to destroy the body of Voldemort in the most spectacular way possible. I'll take care of the horcruxes. He answered and patted Edward's shoulder. All right then, you go to Hogwarts in the name of meeting Hermione while I go and bring those two. You can also check the cameras and live feeds. We don't want anything to be missed. We both are also going to wear microphones. Alexander gave his last orders. Edward nodded and operat to Hogwarts. Alexander operat to Forest of Albania. This time he directly appeared near the castle. You. How can this be? A shocked voice came. Haha, I am immortal. Puny mortals like you cannot hurt me. Alexander proclaimed with an overbearing aura. I will have all your secrets soon, Morgan yelled and tore out of the castle's terrace. Voldemort also followed behind. How's it going, Tom Marvolo Riddle? I see all your death shitters have left you. Is she the one sucking you nowadays, ha? Huh? He mocked, wanting to make them angry. How dare you talk filth about my master? Avida Kedavra Voldemort shot. Alexander backslapped the killing curse away like swatting a fly. I see, you've gotten stronger, I don't know, how, but it doesn't matter as all shall fall before me, the great. Morgan screeched. Before she could complete it, Alexander sent a charm her way which turned her head into a donkey's and her last words sounded like braying. Ha ha ha, the great donkey Elife. 
He heartily laughed. Voldemort looked at his master with wide eyes. Master, why your face? Shut up, she yelled, her eyes turned bloodshot red. All of her crazed nature was shown clearly. That was exactly what he was trying to do. He wanted her to follow him to Hogwarts but he also knew that she was a hundreds of years old cunning witch. She might smell a plot if he didn't enrage her. She started to mindlessly shoot various curses at him. Voldemort followed her. Alexander fought them for a while before acting like he was losing. Then, as he planned, he let one of the curses from Morgan touch him. He acted like he was wounded and immediately Operat away to Hogwarts. No, not this time. I will have all your secrets and power she screeched and Operat after the magical residue of Alexander, left behind by him on purpose. Voldemort hurriedly followed his master. The moment Alexander reached Hogwarts, he hid his magical aura and checked all the recording equipment and microphones. Soon, Morgan and her dog arrive. She tried to sense him but couldn't. Come out you filth. Come and accept your fate, she called out with a deafening roar. Alexander didn't come out, after all, heroes always arrive at the climax. Surprisingly, Dumbledore went out to see who was screaming. Who are you? How did you get in? He asked. Ah, Dumbledore, I know about you from my dog and I am the great Morgan Elife, the defeater of Merlin, the strongest witch alive. Dog, say hello to your headmaster, she said, looking at Voldemort. Voldemort took down his hood and showed his noseless snake face. Hello Dumbledore, I see you have grown pathetically weak. Tom, W what are you doing? Shut up you weakling, I have come to kill that Alexander bastard, bring him here she ordered. Him, he's not here and what do you want from him, he asked. You, I answer to no one she roared and attacked Dumbledore. She really had gone crazy. Well, what happened next was obvious. Dumbledore was defeated miserably, he fell and was about to be attacked by Voldemort but surprisingly or say, conveniently a hero saved him. Edward jumped in front of Dumbledore and started countering Voldemort. Who are you? Voldemort asked. My name is Edward Firestorm, and you killed my parents. Prepare to die he said with a plain face. Ah, yes, I remember the Firestorm family, their screams were music to my ears. Sadly, my supporters were against ending your pure blood family line so I refrained myself from killing you. Mistakes were made, I shall correct them now with that, he threw curses at Edward. They both took to the air to fight as they both knew how to fly. On the other hand, Morgan was seething in rage. Fine, if you don't come out then I'll start with killing all those puppies in the school. I wonder how many heirs will be killed today. She started waving her wand and the whole Hogwarts castle started to get lifted in the air. Scared screams of students could be heard in the school as students ran to protect themselves. The school was lifted for some 300 meters in the air when Morgan ended her magic to let it fall down. Dumbledore looked pale as he didn't have the power to do anything. Even Voldemort and Edward stopped to look. The whole wizarding world held their breath as they saw things happening on their TV uniphones and advertisement panels. Parents who had their kids stuck in school cried. When it seemed that all hope was lost, a beacon of light emerged. Literally, Alexander appeared with his body shining in white and golden light. He waved his hand and the school stopped falling in midair. He used sonorous charm and spoke. Hello, kiddies. Your favorite professor universe is here and there is nothing to fear. I'll teleport all kids, elves, and any other living beings to Galaxy Tower. Sit tight and relax. At the end of his words, the whole Hogwarts building started to shine in a soothing golden aura. It happened for three seconds and as the aura disappeared the school fell to the ground, getting destroyed beyond recognition. I see you've had your fun, Albus, he said, looking at battered Dumbledore resting on the ground. I've grown too old for this, Dumbledore grunted. All right then, it's time to deal with this ancient old hag. Edward, can you deal with Snake B.O.I.? He asked in Edward's direction. Easily Professor Edward smirked and took a fighting stance. All the parents of students, ministry orers, ICW members and many other important people of the wizarding world came to Galaxy Tower to see if all the students were really teleported and also see if they could help. All of them unanimously agreed that the enemy was way above their level so they only focused on securing the perimeter. The whole world was keeping a tight eye on the fight that involved the fate of the whole world. Finally, you might have saved them, but for how long? When I am done with you, I'll destroy everything. Yes, yes, we all know that. Seriously, can't you villains find a new speech or do you guys have a chat group to discuss your lines? He joked. Morgan gritted her teeth and launched her magic towards him. In response, Alexander brought out his favorite weapon. He wanted to test it for so long and finally had a chance now. The golden handheld magic Gatling gun started firing magical exploding bullets. Hundreds of bullets were launched from the six muzzles. Each bullet was twice as strong as muggle grenades. Boom boom boom. She tried to counter the bullets by levitating large chunks of ground and throwing at him but Morgan was continuously bombarded and her body was engulfed in a cloud of explosions. Each bullet was so strong, her whole body had become disfigured. Let's make this even more dramatic he said under his breath and secretly activated the weather change cheat code. Suddenly the shiny morning turned into a rainy depressing morning with thunder. Alexander looked at Edward to see how he was holding and sure enough, Voldemort's face had gotten swollen due to all the punches he received. Edward was making the fight as much humiliating for Voldemort as he could. Seeing no other way out, Voldemort tried to flee but the area was surrounded by Alexander's anti-apparition wards. Then he did what they were waiting for. Snacky Bowie called for his Death Eaters. 
He didn't have many left, most of them had been executed, but there were still some remaining. One of them was Lucius Malfoy. He had been under the impression that Alexander had removed his dark mark but when the call was made he unknowingly operat to his master. Alexander allowed all of them to pass the anti-apparition wards. About 16 low and high level death eaters came to their master's aid, but most of them died if not permanently crippled by the storm, Edward Firestorm. It was a massacre. A purge. Morgan Ellie Fay was a pretty old and powerful witch. She survived the fight with Merlin using a blood sacrifice which only she knew how to do. For the sacrifice, she had to give up most of her magic and blood. It took her 600 years to heal and then get stronger with the help of consuming muggle life, including babies, essence every day, but once again, here she was fighting someone she could not defeat. While fighting Alexander, she had felt the power behind every spell or that projectile. That power was way above her level. So, in the face of death, she once again made the same choice. It doesn't matter if she had to give up her blood and magic if it meant it could save her. There was no lack of muggles to be consumed either. There were nearly six billion of them if the muggle newspaper was to be trusted. And finally, she had found a chance to perform the sacrifice while being hidden under the cloud of explosions. Chapter 31, 31. Wizard God. You forced me into doing this. Now die. A green energy ball the size of a football came out of the explosion cloud and struck Alexander. He was thrown to the ground, his shirt was burnt leaving behind a deep, wide wound on his chest. Damn, that hurt a little. This must be how she survived Merlin. I can feel the chaotic energy in that blood magic Alexander groaned on the ground. Seeing that Alexander was still not dead, Morgan attacked him with what energy she had left to finish him off. Alexander wasn't in much worry, he had already sensed Morgan's weakness. What he was doing now was for the sake of the show. A hero should have some scars to show in battle after all. If he straight up butchered her then his plan might backfire. Wizards would probably start fearing him due to his powers. But now, they were cheering for him to stand up and fight. He calmly looked at the oncoming killing curse. He still laid on the ground acting like he was injured. But, suddenly a loud voice echoed. No, I will not have another good soul lost to darkness. Even if I have to sacrifice myself. Out of nowhere, an old man with a long white beard and shredded robes jumped in front of Alexander to stop the killing curse. Alexander looked shocked at the sudden turn of events, Dumbledore was trying to save him, even at the cost of his own life. He could feel the diminishing magic in Dumbledore's body but the old boy was still holding on somehow. I can't hold on for long Alex, get to safety. Please take care of Hogwarts for me, Dumbledore weakly said. Already having submitted to his fate. SH asterisk T, he's no Dark Lord Dumbledore, instead he's the good BOI Dumbledore. Maybe a bit senile but still good. I guess it's time to show my true power Alexander thought while walking towards Dumbledore. Then he checked Dumbledore's sin percentage for the first time. Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore, Category 3. Murders, 3. Indirect murder, 15. Wizards who died because he didn't deal with Voldemort. Sin percentage, 51%. Well, I guess he's not that bad. When he reached him, he just put his palm in front of the trajectory of the killing curse and the curse was gone. He held Dumbledore from falling to the ground. Everything around them had stopped moving. It was like the time had stopped, even the rain was paused in midair. It was his highest tier of magic which stops the time in a certain radius. I am sorry my friend, I misunderstood you. I'll have to think of a way to repay you. For now, you just need to sit back and relax. Drink this potion, he said, conjuring a large bed and putting Dumbledore down. The potion was his creation of the highest level. An elixir made by combining the Philosopher's Stone's power and Phoenix Tears. Dumbledore was shocked, everything around them was frozen. He lightly asked, H how strong are you? Haha. <laughs> That, I would also like to know, my old friend. Fox, watch over your old man will you? He spoke to the worried phoenix sitting near Dumbledore. He turned around and walked to the paused battlefield. A wave of his hand and things resumed. It's time to finish things Morgan Ellie Fay, he announced and lifted his hand towards her. He cast a superior silent oxio and Morgan's already battered body flew directly into Alexander's hand. Her head being firmly held. He used mind arts to force sweep every ounce of magical knowledge in her brain. She started screaming like she was possessed by some demon even after her voice box had been torn apart, for the crime of murdering and eating souls of more than 5 million people and killing countless magical creatures. I sentence you to die and never be reborn then he pointed his other hand towards the sky and what was happening there started to appear in the sky all around the world, but only magical people could see it. His body started to shine in golden color. Let this be a reminder to all wannabe dark lords, dark wizards and witches, if you harm even a single hair on any innocent living creature in the world. This will be your end he said while looking in the sky. All the people with a guilty conscience who were seeing the scene in the sky or other channels felt like Alexander's gaze was directed towards them. They felt like all their deepest and darkest secrets were like an open book. Fear, fear from the depth of their soul was what they felt. Even the Dementors around the world cowered in fear and flew to hide inside some deep dark cold place. Snap. All the while she was still screaming, the head of Morgan Ellie Fay imploded into a bloody mess. Not wanting to leave too much blood, Alexander used his eyes powers. The body of Morgan Ellie Fay got covered in golden pure fire and started to get burned. Not even ashes remained. She was a category 5 evil and for that, her punishment was to get destroyed and forgotten from space and time. 
But he didn't let her be forgotten because she was an example to the world. Alexander looked towards his student, Edward. He was sitting down on the rubble of Hogwarts with the dead bodies of Voldemort and Death Eaters around him. He gave a tired smile. It's done, Morgan had the final horcrux around her neck in the locket. He told Edward directly to his mind. He had used his oxio for horcruxes earlier and nothing came. Edward nodded in acknowledgement. Feeling done with the rainy weather he lifted his finger towards the sky and a golden ray came out of his finger, piercing the sky, making the clouds turn goldish. The clouds started to move away and rays of sunlight fell on Alexander, from there expanding all around Great Britain. He then lifted the anti-apparition wards. As soon as the wards were lifted, hundreds of wizards and witches operate to the remains of Hogwarts. All of them ran to where Alexander was standing. They all surrounded him in a crowded circle. Arthur Weasley was the first to speak. His eyes filled with worship, delight, and happiness. Not just him, all of them had the same eyes. Wizard god Arthur Weasley spoke loudly and quickly did a nightly kneel. Following him, other witches and wizards, goblins, elves from all around the world kneeled as well. There were some kids as well who had come with their parents. They were also about to kneel but Alexander quickly spoke. Get up, all of you. A wizard or witch should never kneel. Not even in front of a god or a dark lord. The day you kneel is the day you forfeit your freedom. We should use our gift of magic to make the world a better place not only for ourselves but for powerless people too. Because it doesn't matter if you are pure blood, half blood, muggle blood or straight up muggle, in front of a wizard, like Morgan Ellie Fay, all are cannon fodder. Your blood will not save you, your magic can. Let's end this class on this point, if any more, I'll have to ask Albus to pay me a salary. His last words made everyone chuckle. One by one they started to go back except the Hogwarts staff. Alexander went to check up on Dumbledore, only to find him up and running around. His potion did wonders for him. It was an enhancement potion. It made Dumbledore look 50 years younger and also granted him another 100 years of life. His senile behavior or any other mental problems were also probably healed now. How are you feeling my friend? He asked. What was that potion Alex? I feel like I am back in my prime. He exclaimed with stars in his eyes. It was an enhancement potion, Albus. It made your body 50 years younger and also granted you another 100 years of healthy life. Dumbledore straight up gave Alexander a hug. He looked like a happy child. He was thinking of dying and now here he was, not just healed but also young. Thank you, Alex, thank you. I'll never forget this debt. Dumbledore said. Alexander shook his head. No Albus, I am sorry that I doubted your goodness. I was unhappy with you following that damned prophecy and letting Harry face danger. No my friend, I accept that I was wrong. I should really stay away from prophecies. Knowing them tends to do more damage than good. You had every right to doubt me. I was not right in my head. So I've decided, I am going to retire from Hogwarts at the end of this term. I want to travel and enjoy my life. Alexander was truly surprised. He had never expected Dumbledore to have this kind of wish. Well, I won't stop you then. On second thought, I might be able to find a companion who wants to travel the world with you. Who is it? Dumbledore asked. Hee hee. It's a surprise, Alexander chuckled and walked away. The media was going crazy with an influx of news reports. Many newspapers had already started writing reports for the next day's print. With a slight push, the word wizard god started trending on all social media platforms. The video of the whole fight was uploaded on YouTube. Edward was also given a new name by the crowd. They called him the Light of the Wizard God. Alexander quickly told his production company to start working on a movie based on the fight and events leading to it with some slight change of facts. The movie was to be released in the Muggle world too, so only Muggles actors who knew about the wizarding world were to be cast. On a good note, every single wizard and witch now stood with Alexander. Something which he was going to use to deal with the internal discrimination problem. But first, he had to fix Hogwarts. Chapter 32, 32. A Free Elf. The next day, Alexander sat in his office at the ministry. His spectacular show had come to bite him in the ass. Heads of various magical factions or ministries were either coming to greet him or join him. He had to be present to meet them all. Just now he sent the Vampire King away. They had signed a pact to let Vampire Kids learn in Hogwarts. The Vampire Kids would be given magically produced blood from ambient magic. Courtesy of Alexander's new invention, a machine that could turn the ambient magic in the surroundings into blood of any flavor. The adult vampires would also be allowed to buy these machines at a discount and now they were also allowed to work in magical establishments. Though there were strict laws against any aggression too, werewolves were given similar choices. Their kids will be provided with a free yearly shot of superior wolfsbane potion. The normal werewolves community is also given the offer to buy the potions from his shops at a discount. Ha! Huh. So much work. I hate this, he sighed and cursed. You get what you sow. They treat you like a god now, even bigger than Merlin. I received reports that all magical ministries in the world have decided to create a giant statue of yours in their respective places. Her too, I heard someone talking about replacing the Merlin statue with yours. Edward said, Arg, they should do this after I'm dead. It feels weird right now. Alexander grunted. How's Hogwarts going? He then asked. Well, it would take a lot of time to rebuild the school. The three headmasters have decided to postpone the Triwizard Tournament Edward answered. No, I won't let anything stop Hermione's rise to fame. She's supposed to replace me. 
F asterisk CK it. I'll rebuild the school myself. Let's go Ed he stood up and got ready to apparate. Haha. I knew you would do this. They are probably already waiting for you. Edward laughed. Pop. They disappeared at what was supposed to be Hogwarts main entrance. Haha. Welcome my friend. We were just waiting for you. Dumbledore said with a lemon lollipop in his mouth. Alexander confusedly looked around at the small crowd. Hermione, Snape, Sirius, McGonagall, Hagrid, and other professors were there. Am I really that easy to predict? He amusingly asked. Yes all of them replied at the same time, making him flinch. He scratched his head in embarrassment. It made them heartily laugh, and Alexander was happy to have lightened the mood. All right guys, out, all of you. I am going to fix Hogwarts. If there's anyone inside, tell them to leave the castle. Dumbledore nodded and signaled to everyone to head to the open field. Some house elves who were working inside also popped away. Alexander flew to the sky and hovered at a height. He started waving his hands and all the rubble started to fly, slowly arranging themselves. Alexander was going to make some changes to the new castle. He was making the great hall even bigger. The classrooms were also bigger. The whole castle was going to use magic LED lights. Potions lab was upgraded to cause fewer injuries. The library was upgraded with superior enchantments and wards. No one would be able to take out books without getting permission from the librarian or the headmasters if the book contains some questionable material. A new restricted section was made with only one entrance. It could be accessed by anyone over 16 years of age, as long as they sign the contract to not use the knowledge for bad things or else they will be obliviated. All kinds of knowledge could be accessed there, from lightest to darkest. It had safety features as well, if someone attempted to break in or attack, the person would be put into stasis and the DMLE would be informed automatically. These were just some of the minor changes. Major changes included attack wards. If anyone tried to attack the school they would be put in stasis after getting a crucio to their face. The internal wards also made sure that no kind of bullying would happen. Light-hearted pranks were okay though. Words like mud blood were banned from being spoken. The sorting hat was upgraded to have the power of slight divination. It could now sense which house is best for the students to nurture the most in a good way. Cheering wards were also included to lighten up any kind of depression. It took just one hour to create the new Hogwarts. It was looking even more majestic than before. The paint was renewed. Shining white marble was also used here and there. In the end he repaired Hagrid's small castle too. The small crowd just watched in shock as the new school formed. Hermione made sure that everything was clearly recorded on her uniphone. She knows the value of propaganda now. He slowly descended to the ground near the crowd. Wizards and witches, and children his last word was directed at Dumbledore who still had a lollipop in mouth. I present to you, Hogwarts. By the way, I made some changes, be sure to read these booklets. He said and gave a small booklets to each of them. Dumbledore quickly scanned it and excitedly spoke. This is brilliant my friend, many times better than before, you also made classes, dorms, and great hall bigger to accommodate the extra students that will be joining next term. Alexander nodded and invited them for lunch in the castle. So, I hope that we will not have to postpone the Triwizard Tournament anymore. I am the Minister of Magic and from me, it's a green light. Alexander said, hmm, it's a go from me as well, sir Madame Maxime agreed. Yes, from me as well no name Durmstrang headmasters also agreed. Then they all looked at Dumbledore who was busy cutting his steak. What? You don't need to ask me. Hogwarts is here, we are here, so what's there to ask? He spoke. I think my potion made him too relaxed Alexander thought. Okay then, the first task will happen in two days from now. Tell your champions to prepare. That evening, before leaving the ministry, Alexander signed a new law, it was fully introduced by him. It was called Magical Equality Law. According to this, all kinds of discriminatory behavior against any intelligent living being and smart magical beings were to be considered a crime punishable by law. The law also said that the ministry or any other organization in Magical Britain will destroy all its public records of pure blood, half-blood or non-magical born wizards. From now on there will only be one term wizard or witch used. All intelligent magical beings are the same and will enjoy equal rights in the eyes of law. Furthermore, only Gringotts will keep a record of families and blood relations. The new law is sure to cause some ruckus, but it was much needed. There weren't many pure blood supremacist families left, to begin with, so he wasn't much worried though. The world purity level had reached 88%. Just two more and he'd have to leave. But he was going to take his sweet time to increase the world purity level. He needed at least five more years before he could arrange Hermione to take over the ministry. Edward had already proved himself sufficient in running the business, so he wasn't worried there. Nagini was enjoying her life while working happily. Snape was happy to be with his new godson. He had also started dating some Japanese witch. Apparently, he found her on Unibook. Sirius was a wild dog so he didn't feel like finding a permanent girl for now. Harry had developed a crush on Cho Chang but Alexander was sure that it was teenage hormones. Ginny was still salivating over Harry. Ron was slowly healing from his birth defects. He couldn't find a girl so he tried to impress Hermione but was brutally rejected. It's not his fault, he didn't know that she was already dating the most eligible bachelor in the world. Hagrid was dating Madame Maxime. His new look had her going crazy. All in all, everyone was happy. Now, Alexander was headed to the production center in the Galaxy Tower. He had full trust that the paid and happy elves would not do anything untrustworthy. 
After all, they all were treated so nicely. They all wore clean clothes, ate clean food and slept in nice rooms. Most of the money they earned was just continuously getting accumulated in their vaults. Alexander entered the working area. The project manager elf was leading the way. While checking things out Alexander saw a weird elf. The elf was doing no work, he just sat on a bench swinging his legs and humming some unknown song. Hey, Grippy, who's that elf? Alexander asked the project manager. Oh that, that's a masterless elf. His master died recently. He's very weird, he's not even trying to find a new master. He says that he's a free elf. Grippy said in a disgustful voice. Alexander looked at the happy elf and felt pretty sure on his guess of who it was. There can be only one elf that would call himself free. Dobby, come here, he called out. Alexander also used his judgment power on him. Dobby, the free elf, category nil. Sin percentage dash 1%. Wait, is that even possible? Dobby looked surprised seeing that someone knew him. He tippy-toed towards him. Dobby was checking out the wizard in front of him. He knew who it was, he saw the face in many newspapers and that box thing called Unifone. What can Dobby do for Great Master Universe, he said with his ever-excited voice. What are you doing here? Dobby's master died yesterday, Mistress Malfoy did not bond with me so Dobby came here to see friends. Alexander nodded and had an idea. He was working on a new potion for body evolution potion. Dobby, would you like to bond with my magic? I don't treat my elves badly, I pay them, give them work, food, and a good home to live in. You will still be free to do whatever you want. Alexander asked. Dobby's already big eyes got more bigger. Alexander feared that they might pop out any second now. Yes, great master universe, Dobby will be very lucky to bond with you he excitedly said. Good, come here then, Alexander put his palm on Dobby's big forehead. Dobby's body and Alexander's hand produced white light for a split second and it was done. Grippy, give Dobby a new set of clothes. Don't worry Dobby, it's a rule that every elf must wear clean clothes if they are to serve me. Okay, T thank you great master un. Stop, from now on, you will just call me boss. Okay, Alexander ordered. Yes boss, Dobby nearly shouted. Chapter 33, 33. Dobby, the mountain that operates. Well Dobby, how did Lucius treat you all these years? Now, neat and clean Dobby in gentleman suit and boots replied, Oh, Master Malfoy used to beat Dobby a lot in the beginning but something happened two years ago and Master started treating Dobby like Dobby was the master. Mistress Malfoy still beat Dobby though. They beat you because you are small and weak Dobby. Would you like to evolve and get stronger? Alexander asked. Dobby quickly nodded his head, Yes, Dobby would be lucky if that can happen. Then let's go to my office. I'll give you a potion that will make you evolve. Hopefully. Here, drink this and go to sleep. The changes will happen overnight. That is your room from now on he pointed to a door at the end of the lobby. Yes boss. Dobby gulped down the shining golden liquid and went to sleep. Alexander went to work on his new project. He was going to leave his inheritance to Edward because he saw him worthy, but that didn't mean that all the next generation will also be worthy. Hence he created an inheritance test for anyone to ever be able to inherit the company. Gringotts were responsible for conducting the test, and for each successful test, they would be paid 300,000 galleons, many god-level curses were waiting for them if they tried to cheat and they knew it. If none of Edward's descendants were able to pass the test then they would not get the company. Gringotts will conduct the test on random young high achievers of Hogwarts to choose a new owner. The house elves under the company were to bond with every new owner. Though the owner will be oath-bound to never mistreat them and whenever the seat of owner was empty the elves will bond with the galaxy tower's magic source. The test was unchanged eatable, if someone forcefully tried to become the company's owner they will be cursed for life to live a life of extreme poverty. All this was to ensure that the company always remained under righteous and competent hands. After completing his inheritance test and binding it with various contracts and other things he called Edward to come to his place the next morning. He was going to explain it to him. Good morning professor. Oh hey good morning, Edward, and it's grandpa for you. Come sit with me. Alexander showed Edward the inheritance test. Edward was in favor of it as he also knew that it only needs one bad seed to destroy the years of hard work. While they were discussing, Dobby's voice came from behind. Good morning boss. Oh good morning Dob. Alexander's words got stuck in his mouth when he saw Dobby. What the hell, Dobby, what happened to you? Alexander cried. Dobby doesn't know, boss. When Dobby woke up Dobby noticed that the bed's legs had broken, then Dobby got up and saw myself in the mirror. Dobby looks like a human, boss, a human. He cheerfully jumped around. I know, you were supposed to look like a human but how the hell did a four foot tall elf evolved into a freaking seven and a half feet tall buffed giant? Dobby looked like a slightly thinner version of Hulk in normal human skin. What? You mean, he was an elf before? Edward asked, shock clearly visible on his face. Yes, till last night. I gave him a potion that forces humanoid subspecies to evolve into a better version of themselves. I was thinking of making an elf army for protection of universe industries assets. How are you feeling Dobby? Throw your most powerful charm at me, he ordered. But boss. Do it Dobby, it's an order. Dobby sent his full powered attack charm at him. Alexander easily caught it and neutralized it. Damn Dobby, you are a master mage now. You are as strong as any Hogwarts professor. You elves also have natural dueling talent. I can't even imagine what would happen when you properly study magic. 
Do you feel like if I give you clothes our bond will break? He asked. Now that boss said it. Oh, Dobby feels different. I think Dobby can do whatever Dobby wants, but I still feel the need to bond or else the magic will weaken. Dobby answered. Alexander nodded. He had all his answers. It seems that whoever made your species wanted to keep you under check. They made your mind in a way that you'll have a base instinct to serve your master. Your magic was also dependent on your master for this reason. But it seems that if you get evolved you change from that species. You are a human elf now. Alexander loudly muttered. What are you gonna do now pro? Grandpa. Edward asked. He he. Now, now we're gonna do the biggest heist ever. We are going to abduct every single house elf in the world. We will bring them under our banner and feed them evolution potion. Once they all become human elves we will register them in ministry. All the elves will never have to worry about magic bonds as they will always have it here. We will then teach them podiwonering, enchanting, rune making, dueling, business or how to be a butler. Then we will open a new company through which people can hire them for services under contract. No elf will ever be mistreated. And just imagine if someday a new dark lord rises they will have to fight thousands of master magi plus you and Hermione. World peace baby Alexander said grinning. Edward was truly impressed with the plan but there was a problem. What about all the places like Hogwarts where elves are used to make food? I already have a plan for that. I am working on magical nanny bots. I'll give them to all the schools in the world for free but at a request that they'll have to say good stuff about it in the news. After that we'll start selling them on the market. They can cook and clean even better than house elves. Prophet baby. Ha ha ha. Alexander started laughing. Are you sure you weren't some evil capitalist in your past life? Edward jokes. Ha ha ha. This is not the end of my plan boy. I have too much power. Even if I am not required to do anything for the world, I still want to do it. I am going to open thousands of orphanages all around the world. These nanny bots will be heavily used there. The new human elves will also be responsible for it considering that elves enjoy taking care of children. I am going to remove hunger from the world too but that will be a slow process. For now, focus on the kids. I don't want any child to sleep with a hungry stomach ever again. Alexander said his last words sounded more firm than others. Out of nowhere a little curly haired cat jumped and hugged him. Alexander's face changed into a warm smile. Haha. <laughs> Finally, you found time to see this old man. He said. Alexander had now grown to 6 feet 5, so Hermione looked even smaller in front of him. I was training for the Triwizard Tournament, Grandpa, Hermione happily said. She mostly acted rowdy in front of people but whenever she was with Edward, he or her parents she would always turn into a spoiled happy child. Oh yes, I nearly forgot about it. Do you want me to train you? He asked. Hermione shook her head no Grandpa, I don't want to have anyone to think I had an unfair advantage. Besides, I am confident that I'll win, she proclaimed. Oh, and training with me isn't an unfair advantage. Edward said with arms crossed. Hermione was so engrossed in Alexander's words that she hadn't noticed Edward. When she looked at him her face turned red. She had her first kiss just a day ago in one of the training sessions. She embarrassingly hid her face in Alexander's chest. Alexander understood by her face and faked that he got angry at Edward. Boy, don't tease my Hermione. Or I'll turn you into a donkey he winked at the end. Edward understood, oh really, not before I turn you into a pig. Ha. Huh. They both shouted like they were about to shoot charms at each other. Knew a stop, Hermione roared, stepping away to see the situation. When she saw both of them smiling at her, her face turned even redder. All of them started to laugh, including Dobby. The next day, it was time for the Triwizard Tournament. Alexander was supposed to be head judge so he had to be present there early. Alexander went to the platform for the four judges. As soon as he entered the vision of the people, a loud cheer engulfed the whole arena. Alexander had to wave hands and tell people to sit down. Unlike in the movie, this time the arena was very big. There were more than 100,000 people there. Many came from foreign countries. At that time Alexander had the idea to make an international wizard tournament in which champions from all magic schools in the world will compete for the trophy and 1 million galleons. Chapter 34, 34. Alexander, the mother of dragons. The audience was waiting for the tournament to start, the cameras were set and the people of the world were watching it. The in-between ads were stacked properly. It seemed that the big businesses of the wizarding world had started understanding the value of advertising. Behind the champion's entrance, the three champions were briefed about their task. Then they all took out a miniature dragon from the bag. Hermione was matched with a Swedish short snout. Fleur Delacour was matched with a common Welsh green. Victor Crumb was matched with a Hungarian horn tail. Their order was Hermione, Delacour, and Crumb. Hermione prepared herself for the task. Took a long breath and walked into the arena. As soon as she entered she heard the cheers of people and distinct screams of Edward and Alexander. She embarrassingly ignored them and walked towards the dragon. The Swedish short snout was acting as if asleep while covering her eggs. Hermione calmly walked to the dragons and made some weird noise from her mouth. No one knew what she was speaking except two beings. Alexander and the dragon. The dragon lifted her head, seemingly interested in the little human. Ha ha ha. She did it. She mastered the dragon tongue. Alexander roared, nearly scaring the other judges sitting on both sides. What? When did she? Dumbledore delightedly asked. She's been at it for the past two years, Alexander answered. Truly a genius, Madame Maxime complimented. Yes yes. 
She's the best. He bragged smugly. What do you want, human? Go away. Hermione heard the dragon. Delighted that at least the dragon is ready to talk. Uh, hello, my name is Hermione. You see, that golden egg in your nest is not real. She was cut off by the dragon's angry voice. I know that, human. Do you take me for a fool? Then why are you risking yourself for it? Please give it to me. She requested, she didn't want to hurt the dragon. Hermione always had a soft spot for magical animals. No, it's mine. So shiny, such perfect shape. The dragon said looking at the golden egg. Hermione understood now. She had forgotten that dragons are gold junkies. They would fight for anything shining. I didn't want to hurt you, but if that's what you want, she took a fighting stance. Wait, I can feel your power. I don't want to die so I suggest we trade. You can take the fake egg if you give me something comparable to it. The dragon suggested. Alexander was trying to control his laugh hearing the business savvy dragon. Hermione suddenly had a thought when she saw Alexander in the background. UMM. What does freedom sound like? You must not like being in chains. After your babies are born they will also be chained. I can get you freedom, she proposed. And how will you do that? You are just a small human. Not even grown fully dragon countered. Yes, I am small but my grandpa is a very big man. He's the boss of all wizards. If I ask him, he will help you. Hermione said while pointing to Alexander. The dragon followed her fingers and looked at the judge's table. When the dragon saw Alexander her pupils expanded. Holy moly, what's the old man doing here? You know grandpa? Hermione curiously asked. Dragon nodded her head. Yes, he's a divine being. Not like us mere mortals. He came to our dragon enclosure last year and defeated all of us with a single hand. He has already promised us freedom as long as we behave. If you are his granddaughter then just take the golden egg. I don't want to anger God. The dragon had pure worship and a little fear in her eyes as she spoke to Hermione. Thank you Miss Dragon, BTW you are clearly an intelligent being, so why do you act like mad beasts? She asked while walking to take the golden egg. Call me Myra and yes we are intelligent but we are dragons. It's in our nature to be angry and wild. We just don't like to interact with you humans and in return, you all declared us mad beasts. Myra grunted. Well, I think Grandpa must have something amazing planned for you all so be happy. I should go now. Thanks, Myra, Hermione said with a slight bow. No problem little humans, Myra went back to sleep. The audience just looked at the shocking interaction between the dragon and Hermione. They even forgot to cheer but then Alexander stood up and started clapping. People followed him, ushering the arena in crazed cheering. The judges showed the scores on slates in front of them. Madame Maxime and Dumbledore gave a 9, no-name Durmstrang headmasters gave 8 and Alexander shamelessly gave a 10, total being 36. Next, it was Fleur de Lacour's turn. She elegantly used some Vila bloodline-related spells to confuse the dragon and stole the golden egg. Everyone gave the same score to her except the no-name guy, who gave her a 7. Her total was 35. Alexander glared at the Durmstrang headmaster making him shudder in fear. The headmaster must have forgotten that the tournament was being shown live all around the world. He was spoiling his own image. The next was Victor Crumb. It was his bad luck that he was matched with one of the most dangerous dragons. He entered the arena with caution and looked around to assess the situation. The Hungarian horn tail was looking at Victor with anger. Suddenly she lunged at him. It seemed like Victor was planning for that. He threw a spell at the dragon's nest. Feeling a threat to her eggs, the dragon jumped back to her nest. Due to being preoccupied the dragon didn't see a conf ringo, blasting curse, sent towards her. The curse hit her neck, causing a deep wound. The mother dragon screamed in agony and lost her balance. She started to fall on her eggs in the nest. Without waiting a second Alexander jumped from the judge's seat and stopped the dragon from falling on eggs. People gawked at the scenes. The cameras started making shutter sounds. The audience was so shocked because Alexander didn't use some magic to levitate the dragon but he used his bare hands to hold the giant mother dragon's 50 feet body. He quickly put down the dragon and looked at her wound. She was bleeding a lot Victor Krom felt Alexander's anger even though he was quite far away, not just him. The whole arena felt it. Alexander had strictly told everyone that under no circumstances should the dragon be fatally wounded. He quickly put a healing potion with phoenix tears on the wound. The wound healed mostly but the dragon was still unconscious due to losing too much blood. So he fed her a lot of blood replenishing potions. Charlie, come here and keep an eye on her he called out. Quickly a redhead bearded boy came running to the dragon. He was Charlie Weasley. Then Alexander left her and went on to check on the eggs but as he was walking towards the nest he heard a slight cracking sound. He looked and sure enough, the eggs were hatching. One by one, all three eggs started to hatch and soon the first little dragon came out and opened its eyes. The dragon made a small screech followed by its two more brothers or sisters. F asterisk CK, Alexander said out loud. The reason being that he knew what their screech meant. Mother. 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 That's all he heard repeatedly. They had imprinted him as their mother. The little dragon started to jump around him. One of the brave ones even jumped and latched onto his golden chain hanging around his neck. Ha ha ha. I can't really get angry at such cute little guys. Though I still hate being called mother he thought to himself. Then he started caressing them. After a while, he heard the mother dragon waking up. Alexander prepared himself for a chat. My babies. She roared. Easy there. They are fine. 
Look, Alexander said, pointing to the three baby dragons. Two on both shoulders and one on his head standing like he was king of the world. The dragon mother waited for her babies to come to her but they didn't. To them, she was a stranger. Feeling the rising anger in her, Alexander spoke. Yeah, there is a problem. They think I am their mother. But worry not, I can help you. You should remember me from a year ago. I am the human that your leader called God. He tried to ease her. The mother dragon looked at him for a while then spoke. Yeah, now that you say it. You do look like him. Your aura also feels quite different. Pure. Okay, tell me, how can you help me? Alexander smiled. Yes, I can imprint you as their mother but there is no way of making them forget that I am there. Ah, mm, mother, without messing with their minds. It's your choice, what do you want? The mother dragon fell into contemplation. She looked at her three bundles. One of them was quite energetic. It was now hanging down on the gold chain. She thought about it and didn't like the idea of messing with their heads. Okay, as long as you don't take them away from me I'll agree to let you be their mother too. She answered. Alexander felt relieved, he also didn't want to obliviate them. Thank you, by the way, what should I call you? I am called Valina and the one proudly standing on your head will be called Bunty after my first caretaker, the cheerful one hanging on your chain will be called Bobby after my second favorite caretaker, the silent one on your shoulder will be called Dexter after my third favorite caretaker who was also very silent and smart. She introduced and also named her children. Alexander felt a bit funny about the names but accepted them, after all, it could have been worse. All right, I'll imprint you in their minds now, Alexander said and one by one put his hands on the trio's head. Soon they stopped whatever activity they were doing and looked at the big dragon standing there. Mommy, the three said. Then they turned to look at Alexander. Mommy they started running and jumping around and on Alexander and Belina while repeating the same word. To them, having one mommy was good but two were even better. Alexander just shook his head and accepted the situation. He sent Belina and the trio away and took his seat at the judge's table. Victor Crumb had picked up the golden egg and returned to the champion's waiting area while Alexander was talking with Belina. Then it came to scoring and Alexander gave a solid one. While Dumbledore and Madame Maxime gave five each, no-name headmaster shamelessly gave nine. Alexander had already decided that punishment will be given to Victor Crumb in the next round. Chapter 35, 35. A small history lesson. The first round had been concluded and the crowd had dispersed. The champions had returned to Hogwarts. There was no clue for the next round in the eggs. They were just eggs with a small vial with some red liquid in it. Alexander was against giving any clues for the next rounds. The next and final round was to be held in five days. Alexander had decided to deal with the elf heist till then. There was also a poor dragon chained under Gringotts. But first, he was invited by Dumbledore to his office. What's with you and your weird candy-related passwords? Lemon vomit tart, seriously. Alexander entered the office. Haha. <laughs> My friend, when you are this old you have to find happiness from little things Dumbledore answered. Alexander shook his head, and only you can find it in things like these. I should probably invent video games for people like you. Video games, what's that? Dumbledore asked in excitement. You'll find out pretty soon. So, why did you ask for me? Oh yes, I nearly forgot. Can you have a look at Fox? He's not leaving the nest no matter what I do. Dumbledore sounded worried. Alexander slowly walked towards Fox. He patted his head and scratched its neck. Fox made some happy noises. Alexander curiously used his eye of judgment at Fox. Error 69, too pure to judge. What the? And what's with the old man and his fetish for number 69? All right, buddy, what's the problem? This old boy Dumbledore is worried about you Alexander asked and used his mind arts to talk to Fox. I can't leave the egg. I must protect it. Fox voiced. What? What egg? He asked. Fox slowly stepped aside showing a small blue egg. I found it in the forest. I think it's a phoenix egg. Fox, you gave an egg, but I thought you were a boy, Dumbledore said out loud. Fox didn't like it and flew to Dumbledore's head and pecked at it to show his disapproval. Ha ha ha. No Albus, he found it in the forest. He thinks it's a phoenix egg. Alexander clarified. Oh, sorry Fox, my boy, Dumbledore apologized. Humph Fox made a sound and flew back to the egg. It's cracking, it's cracking, Alexander heard Fox voice. He looked at the egg which had started twitching. Dumbledore also excitedly came close. It was a very rare chance to see a phoenix being born from an egg. The first cycle of many births in their lives. The egg hatched and the tiny head bobbed out. A small piece of eggshell still on its head. Due to Alexander's divine soothing aura, the little phoenix turned its head towards Alexander. Then it opened its eyes for the first time. Chirp. F asterisk CK Alexander cursed out loud. Alexander returned to his office at Galaxy Tower. In front of him were Hermione, Edward, Nogany, and Sirius sitting, trying to hold their laughter. You can laugh, you know. I won't bite. Ha 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 ha. Oh my god, you became a mother of three dragons at the tournament and now a phoenix Sirius roared in laughter. The little phoenix chirped happily from his prized nest on Alexander's head. All jokes aside, Grandpa, why is he blue, unlike Fox? Hermione asked seriously. Well, Albus said that the blue phoenix are an extinct species, they haven't been seen in the past thousand years. Just like its color, it breathes blue flame. They are supposed to be purer than the red ones, guess. Alexander explained. And you are his mommy now. 
Did you name your son? Edward asked, still chuckling. Yeah, if he thinks I'm his family then he should share my name too. I've named him Barry Maxim Universe. Just call him Barry, he said. Hello there, Barry, Hermione greeted the little phoenix, which in return gave an acknowledgement chirp. All right fellas, now to important business. Dobby, have you collected all the homeless elves around the world? He asked the giant elf. Yes, boss. I have gathered them in the warehouse. They have all been bathed and fed. They are waiting to bond with you now, Dobby replied. Alexander nodded and stood up. All right, guys, I'll tell you the plan. We are going to help slash kidnap all the house elves in the world and bring them here in the largest warehouse underground. Then I'll activate the isolation wards which will break their connection to their master. We will tell them that they were forsaken by their masters and feed them the evolution potion. After they evolve, I'll bond my magic with all of them. Due to my superior strength than any other wizard, their past bond with their masters will probably vanish, granting them freedom. Then they will sign the contract and start their various trainings. Alexander instructed. UMM okay, but where do we fit in all this? Sirius asked. Nowhere in this plan. What I want you four to focus on is the next stage of this. All of you know about the Muggle world so I want you to visit every country in the world and start establishing orphanages. As many as you can. I want at least 30,000 orphanages up and ready to start in one month. He answered. Don't get me wrong but what is your purpose in doing all this, Grandpa? And who is going to man these orphanages? Hermione asked. Well let me tell you a small story. At the beginning of it all, there were ten witches and wizards. They were the first living humans on earth. Soon they all mingled and each couple had three children. But out of every three children, only one was born a witch or wizard. The other two were all born squibs. From there the wizards married each other and procreated more magicals. On the other hand, the squibs forgot about their magical origins and procreated as ordinary muggles. After thousands of years both the magicals and the non-magicals had forgotten their common roots and started fighting. But non-magicals gravely outnumbered the magicals. The number of witches and wizards started to fall. Humans also started burning anyone with even a tiny bit of magic on stakes. In the end, the magicals decided to go into hiding for forever. Alexander narrated. He had found this knowledge from Morgan L.E. Fay's mind. Damn, so muggles and we have the same blood running through our veins. Also are all muggles squibs? Sirius exclaimed and asked. Alexander nodded and continued. Yes, not just that but every squib also has magic in them. It's just that it's very weak. In a way, you can say that all the squibs are very late bloomers. Through the orphanage, we will teach all the kids the art of wizardry. I am currently working on a new wand that is more sensitive to magic but not as strong as common wands. Chances are that with some years of practice all the kids will be able to use chore magic. Magic like creating some fire, cleaning things, repairing small broken objects or levitation something. The wands will come with intent-based enchantments, if anyone tries to use it to harm someone then it won't work. Hopefully, their next generation will be born wizard or witch. Now, on the other question. We have a huge jobless population of muggle wizards who couldn't find a job after school because of discrimination. They were forced to go back into the muggle world and work there to earn a living. I'll hire them under contract. There are also many jobless real squibs and also these thousands of soon-to-arrive elves. Now, your next question might be, how will you finance all this? Simple answer, magic. We will establish antique cars, jewelry, and item restoration businesses around the world. We will use magic to restore them and then sell them. We will also start a real estate business and buy all rundown buildings or apartments and magically restore them to sell them. I already own a movie and TV show production company, so we will be expanding it. All this will be kept a secret through a magical binding contract with the strictest punishment being getting obliviated. The opportunities are endless, we just have to take a step. I've been teaching Edward all about business in the past three years so he'll manage all the business. I'll manage the orphanages, he ended his small speech and took a long breath. Yes, I'll manage it properly professor. You don't have to worry Edward comforted him. Goddamn Edward, how many times I'll have to tell you. Call me grandpa, he refuted. Ah, uh, yes grandpa Edward embarrassingly said. Hermione chuckled looking at her boyfriend. Okay, move move. Travel the muggle world and buy all the property you can. Use the money from the company account, Alexander ordered, and all spread out. Alexander looked at Dobby. Let's go to the warehouse. In the underground warehouse, there were about 1,000 house elves waiting for him. They were all masterless. Everyone, I think you already know me. I'd like you all to bond with my magic and in return, I'll give you work, food, and housing. All those who agree can come to me one by one. House elves didn't have many expectations when it came to work. They were happy as long as they had something to do. Bonding with a magic user as strong as Alexander was a cherry on top. In the end, all 1,209 elves stayed with him. Next was telling them about his elf heist and making sure they did it properly. Chapter 36, 36. Lucky Harry. That night, Alexander's elf army raided places all around the world kidnapping all elves they could find. The process was repeated for another day and by the end, they had gathered 12,000 elves. But there was a problem now. They had no way of finding out if there was an elf still left out. When Dobby went to report the problem to Alexander he found Alexander beating his head on the table. Stupid, stupid, stupid. How can I be so dumb? 
Oh hey, Dobby, I know why you are here. I know the solution to the problem. Let's go to the warehouse. Alexander walked past Dobby. Yes boss. Edward was working on ordering the horde of elves. Oh hey, grandpa. Alexander ignored his greeting and cast a charm loudly. Oxio Suprema all the house elves in the world, except those in this room. His superior Oxio teleported things if they are too far or have physical obstruction in between. Out of nowhere, about 2,000 elves started to pop up in the room. Edward looked at him shockingly. Why didn't you do that in the first place? Alexander stayed silent. You forgot, right? He asked. Ah, uh, I think I've grown old, Alexander muttered looking at the ceiling. You're immortal, you will always grow older, Edward interjected. Ah, uh, I am feeling hungry. Dobby, tend to the elves. Give them food and clothes. Also, tell them why they are here. Then give them the potion, Alexander instructed and went back to his office. Hey don't ignore me Grandpa Edward followed behind him. Diagon Alley, go on Harry, you can do it. You're a freaking quid ditch star. I am sure she will say yes and you don't even need to worry about anyone interruption. I've booked the whole Florian Fortescue's ice cream parlor, Sirius said, giving a push to Harry. Harry was trying to ask his crush Chok Ching out for the ball night and as always his two godfathers had decided to support him in some unconventional ways. Perhaps you can use some aid from Felix Felici's luck potion. Just gulp it down and say the magic. Snape suggested showing a transparent vial. God damn, finally something good came from you Snivella serious praise and slapped Snape's shoulder. Harry agreed and gulped down the potion. He headed straight to the ice cream parlor. He entered and found the Asian beauty sitting by the window. When she saw him she tried to stand up to say hello but unfortunately slash conveniently her foot got stuck in the table's leg and she lost her balance. Harry quickly moved to catch her head on. They both fell on the ground with Cho Chang on top of him. Her lips touching his. Her melons pressed against his chest. She quickly got up, her face turned totally red. Ah, uh, sorry, my foot got stuck. Oh, it's okay. Let's order something Harry said, changing the subject to save her from embarrassment. Which won him some gratitude points. They ordered some ice puddings and chatted about Quidditch while waiting. The server was taking a large ice cream cake to storage but unfortunately slash conveniently he slipped. The whole cake was about to fall on Cho Chang but Harry quickly shouted. Wingardium Leviosa. Then he realized that he didn't have a wand in his hand but surprisingly the cake was still levitating. Then the cake assembled itself back on the tray. Cho Chang looked at all that with her mouth wide open. It was widely known that Harry Potter was just a slightly above average student in his studies but he was extremely talented in Quidditch. He was even offered a place on the national team. What he did just now was wandless magic, something which not even the best of students can do. Cho Chang was head over heels for Harry Potter now. After some time they ate their pudding and Harry asked. So, Cho, I was hoping if you are interested in going to Yule Ball with me tomorrow. Yes. She abruptly answered before even realizing. Then she turned red again. Thank you, I'll see you tomorrow at the ball then, Harry said and left. He couldn't gather more courage to talk. Behind the scenes. Sirius and Snape had been keeping an eye from a quiet corner at the proceedings in the parlor. OSH asterisk T, the cake is about to fall on her. Wingardium Leviosa, Sirius chanted while pointing his wand at a distance. All right, how did your mission go, Edward? Alexander asked. Well, we did even better than we expected. We have registered Universe Industries in the Muggle world. A total of 34,000 buildings and sites have been bought under the name. We had to use some slight memory charm to keep things away from the government's eyes, Edward reported. Nicely done, now we move to stage 3. I want you to hire various non-profit population census organizations. I need a list of all homeless or orphaned children in the world. All of them? I've already done it. The list will come in probably 3 days. Edward said, good job, Edward. Okay then, you are free to go and practice for tomorrow's dance with Hermione. Edward happily walked out of his office. Alexander laid back in his office chair, looking out of the window at sunset. Sigh. Just one more thing to do before I call it a day, he said loudly and walked out into Diagon Alley. He walked towards the Gringotts. People kept looking at him as he walked by. He mostly operated to wherever he wanted to go. It was rare for him to walk in public areas. He walked straight into the large hall. The goblins stopped doing whatever they were doing the second they saw him. I need to meet with your director Zanrok, he said. The goblin sitting on the highest counter ran away in a hurry to call the director. A moment later the goblin returned. He will meet you in the meeting room, sir, he respectfully said. Alexander nodded and proceeded to the meeting room. He found Zan Rook standing near the door waiting for him. Welcome to Gringotts, sir. What can I do for you? He asked. I need something from you. Just make the demand, sir. We will try to fulfill your needs, Zan Rook proudly said. I want the dragon that you have kept underground. You are breaking the magical equality law. Dragons are considered intelligent magical creatures and enslaving them or hurting them is illegal, Alexander cited. Well, sir. We respect your wish but we need that dragon to protect our vaults. Perhaps we can get you another dragon. The goblin smiled deviously. Alexander felt disgusted and he also found out that goblins were smuggling dragons. One slight probe into Zan Rook's mind and all his secrets were known. It turned out that goblins' greed had made them forget that just some time ago they were considered second-class beings too. If not for Alexander's new law, perhaps. Alexander said. 
Zen Rook smiled thinking that he agreed. Perhaps, I should just take over Gringotts. I certainly have the money and I am certainly not lacking power either. Perhaps you goblins should have stuck to forging swords. Your greed has taken over you people. Perhaps I should start a new bank. People will surely trust me as I am, you know, the strongest wizard to ever exist. Perhaps. Alexander was too intimidating for Zen Rook, who had started shaking in fear. No, please. We will agree. You can take the dragon. He pleaded. Sorry but I've changed my mind now. I want to have a meeting with every executive level Gringotts official in the world. From the lowest to the highest level. I don't care what means you guys use but I want all of you here in two hours. It's a matter of life and death for Gringotts so you better hurry. Zen Rook he ordered and silently took out a glass and some fire whiskey. Zen Rook ran from the room on his tiny legs like his ass was on fire. But Zen Rook knew if he didn't bring all executives in two hours, his whole body would be on fire, literally. Two hours later, the meeting hall was filled with hundreds of goblins. There was a lot of ruckus. Alexander quickly did a wide area mind sweep to see how many of them were greedy sons of bit asterisk keys. Sure enough, all of them were. Hence without restraint, he used his time torture ability to re-educate them a little. He made all of them go through their birth and upbringing in a very positive and truthful yet cunning way. Their memories were altered in such a way that their already pre-existing memories didn't conflict with each other. In one minute, all the goblins in the room had lived another life. When they all woke up, the most senior goblin came to Alexander and bowed, asking for forgiveness for their various crimes. He forgave them. Then he told them to release any magical beast they had enslaved, and that if they needed something to protect their vaults then he'd provide each Gringotts branch three magical dragon golems. They were as big and strong as normal dragons. They just didn't breathe or eat. They'd follow orders too. The only requirement was that they be charged with magic every three months. All the Gringotts executives were very happy with the arrangement. Hopefully the next generation of goblins will turn out naturally better he thought. Chapter 37, 37. Time to dance. The next day, the first thing Alexander did was go to the warehouse. All the elves most probably would have gone through physical evolution by then. When he entered, he was overwhelmed by the thousands of now human-sized elves, some looked like Dobby too. Dobby, what's the status? He asked. Everything is good, boss. I've already told them about their new life and they have happily accepted your offer. They are ready to bond with your magic, Dobby answered. Nice, okay let's start the bonding and also get them to sign the employment contract. After they finished up with the elves and also assigning them different classes to learn to, he headed back to his office to grab the soon-to-be-launched magic gaming console. It was magical as it not only gave the player a sense of smell but also touch. The games could be played through the controller or headgear, whichever the user likes. He had already prepared some games and had also started a new game production company. It would cater to both the magical and muggle world. For now, Alexander had copied some old games from his past world. Games such as Grand Theft Auto, Assassin's Creed, Witcher, Fallout, Cyberpunk 2077, Skyrim. These games were open world and multiplayer. The games with more than one number of installments would be combined into one big map. He picked up the console and went to Hogwarts to gift it to Dumbledore. There was also Yule Ball that evening so he decided to take that day off. Haha, what brought you here my friend? Dumbledore asked. He had really changed since the gift of God. Yeah, that's what the people named his fight. Nothing, I just came here to show you my new, soon to be launched device called Gaming Console. It's an interactive type of movie you can say. Anyway, you'll understand it if you try he said while connecting the console with Uni TV. Alright, put this headband on your head. He then started the Witcher game. Mainly because it had medieval settings and there were magic and monsters too. Well, what happened next was beyond expectation. The old boy Dumbledore was so hooked that he even forgot that he was in his office. After two hours he finally stopped. Oh my god, Alex. This is amazing. It's so hard to imagine that what I just saw wasn't real. But the beauty of the world and the monsters. Sigh what else do you have? He excitedly asked. Then Alexander introduced him to other games. Until the evening they just sat in the office playing co-op. While playing Alexander had a crazy idea. What if he made a counter strike but instead of guns there will be wands. They will have to cast spells by thinking about it. The headgear will make it all look and feel so real that it would turn all players into real duelists. I can also host tournaments later. Deciding to work on his plan later, he left the Dumbledore's office to get ready for Yule Ball. He simply put on a long coat over his daily gentleman clothes. He always looked magnificent so there was no need for more improvement. After getting ready he operat to ball venue. The venue was selected by him. It was a large rooftop which was immensely decorated. A fall ceiling was also made to hold disco lights for later. His main purpose for selecting the rooftop was because he had prepared for six hours of continuous sky fireworks. They were magically made, so no fear of harming the climate. Plus it would make the night more beautiful. Mainly for couples. Another change that he made was that all students were allowed to visit. But only fourth years and higher could dance in the ball. First, second, and third years could dance in the disco hours. There was also an all-you-can-eat buffet, alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages, and many more fun things. He had included an open-air theater set for later hours. It would show the Titanic movie, which his studio had recently released in the muggle world. 
He had already searched for movies and shows that had scripts and copyrights in the world. He left those that were there but those that were missing, he decided to make. Titanic was never supposed to come out in this world as Titanic never happened because there was a wizard present on the ship. He had also started up the whole Marvel comics and had begun to plan for movies. Back to the ball. Students below fourth year also had a curfew. All of them were supposed to go back to sleep by 10. Alexander reached the venue when the ball was just about to start. The surrounding speakers started to produce music. The three champions took to the dance floor with their partners. Hermione had her hand around Edward's arms. They both looked like beautiful couples. Shameless as he was, he couldn't help but whistle at the pair. Hearing his whistle, both Edward and Hermione's cheeks turned red. Fleur Delacour entered with Cedric Diggory. Victor Crumb came with some random Slytherin girl. He couldn't find anyone decent after what he did at the first task. The lights dimmed and music started. They started to slowly dance. Just then the fireworks started to happen. Ceiling was enchanted to be transparent. Colorful lights started to fall upon the terrace. Edward and Hermione lifted their faces and looked at the sky while slowly dancing. Edward's arm around her waist and her hands on his shoulder. Suddenly a peculiar bright blue firework appeared in the sky and started to write something. When it finished writing, everyone started to laugh. It said, kiss her already, damn it at the end of the line there was Alexander's face with a wink. Edward and Hermione embarrassingly ignored everyone and just looked into each other's eyes. Mesmerized with each other. God damn it, why aren't they kissing? There can never be a better opportunity to declare themselves a couple in public. I guess I'll have to bring out the big guns. Alexander disappeared for a second. When he reappeared, he had two new guests in his hands. All right, Fox and Barry. I want you two to sing the best love song you can. A song so good that it would turn even those soulless Durmstrang boys into lovers for each other. Go now. Bring me some pride, he said. Fox and Little Barry puffed their chests out proudly. Then they flew in the air and started chirping the song. Their song turned the atmosphere of the room to a full 180 degrees. Edward and Hermione finally kissed. But they weren't the only ones. Many other couples were kissing too. Hagrid and Madame Maxime, Harry, and Cho Chang. The most shocking one was actually Malfoy. He left Daphne and was currently in a passionate threesomes tongue twister with Crab and Goyle. Well, who am I to judge? But damn, Fox and Barry are too good. SH asterisk T I miss her now, Alexander said. Missing his old wife. Soon both Phoenix came back to Alexander and sat on his shoulders. He petted them and said, good job, both of you. Your song was so good that I was just a pinpoint away from turning into another Dumbledore. Both of the Phoenix looked at each other seemingly confused about what they heard. Alexander noticed it. Ah, you guys are too pure to understand the complexities of this word. Go, eat whatever you want now, but no stealing from people's plates. Just point your claws at whatever you want and someone will give it to you. He sent them away. Then he slowly walked to the dance floor. Just when he was about to enter the floor he loudly clapped his hands and in an instant, the whole theme of the venue changed to more unofficial. The dance music came up and colorful lights started to blink. All right, everyone. The real party starts now. It's time to dance, he roared. The whole hall followed him and loudly cheered. In a matter of seconds, the whole dance floor got filled with people jumping and dancing. Alexander was absolutely the craziest of them all. He was jumping around with two first-year kitties sitting on his shoulders and Fox and Barry flying around him, chirping heavily. He was also casting small flying charms at first, second and third years, making them fly in the air. He then shot a patroness which divided itself into 20 different magical animals. Even the definition of having fun involved a crazy amount of power for Alexander. The night was wild. Edward and Hermione came closer to him while dancing and gave him a quick hug. Thank you, Grandpa, they said. You call me Grandpa and then say thank you. Come on guys don't hurt me like that he dropped some fake tears. The party continued and soon it was Luna who was happily sitting on his shoulders. Hey, where are your shoes, little Luna? He asked. Hmm, I don't know. It was hurting to dance so I put them somewhere, but someone took them, she expressionlessly said. Alexander knew that someone was messing with her on purpose. He then realized that the wards couldn't pick it up as bullying because Luna didn't consider it bullying. She was just too pure. Right there and then he rewrote the anti-bullying wards to include cases like these. Then he happily looked at her. What is your favorite magical animal, Luna? He asked. UMM. It's Crumplehorn Snorkak, but I haven't seen them yet. She answered. Oh, that. It's quite hard to find you know. They have a special ability to hide from people. Luna's face showed a rare shock and excitement. Can. Can you help me see one? Absolutely, my dear. Let's go as he finished speaking he operat to a forest in Sweden. Luna, still sitting on his shoulder. Chapter 38, 38. A happy Luna. Where are we, sir? She asked. Oh, no calling me sir or professor. I am no longer a teacher at Hogwarts and working hours are already over at the ministry. Just call me grandpa or do you want to call me by my name? He asked. No, grandpa. She said. Haha, good. Let's go and find that fatty crumplehorn snorkak. He said and flew towards a hill at the center of the forest. Does it live here? She excitedly asked. Yes, he does. The reason they are so hard to find is that they have various kinds of hiding abilities. They have the ability to stay invisible for as long as they want and even if someone sees them they forget where they saw it or what it looked like. 
They release a kind of magic which partially obliviates people near them. They can literally walk on a crowded street without anyone noticing them. Another major reason they are hard to find is that they sleep a lot. By a lot, I meant ears at one stretch. He explained to her while flying. No wonder people think they don't exist, Luna interjected. Yes, oh we've arrived. He helped Luna to get down. Alexander went ahead and lightly kicked something invisible. He repeated the kick some ten times before a voice came. Yawn. Oi, get up. Your number one fan in the world has come to meet you, Alexander said. Luna was looking at the direction Alexander was talking with excitement. Then suddenly something appeared. A bear-like purple furry creature. It had a long uneven horn on its head. The face of the creature also looked very cute. Luna couldn't control herself and ran to the creature and hugged its furry belly. Crumplehorn Snorkak. You are real she spoke. Well, of course, I am real. How else could you touch me? A soft voice came. Luno lifted her face and looked at Crumplehorn Snorkak's face. Why you can speak? Yes, I can, young lady. But, who are you and how did you find me? Snorkak asked. Oh, Grandpa brought me here she pointed to Alexander. Snorkak looked at Alexander and got alerted. Boss, but why are you here? I thought that you would come to take me and my people after six years. He asked. I'm sorry to disturb you, Bob. But this young lady was on a quest to find your kind. She is a pure-hearted girl so I thought of helping her, he explained. Bob nodded and looked at Luna. If the boss says you're good then you're good. Ask me anything you want. Luna felt so happy at that moment but then she turned at Alexander with a sad face. I didn't bring quill and paper. Oh, nothing to worry. Here you go Alexander gave her a pen and paper from his dimensional pocket. For the next two hours, Luna played with Bob and asked him many questions about his kind. In the end, he allowed her to write about him but also made her promise that she wouldn't disclose his location. Luna happily agreed to it. Okay, Luna. Sit tight. He said and they operated back to Hogwarts party. Luna was already past the curfew so he had to help her get into her dorm. He then went back to the terrace. Most of the couples had hidden themselves in whatever isolated corner they could find. Edward and Hermione weren't one of them though, they could have alone time whenever they wanted. Edward himself owned a great castle. They just sat at the bar, drinking some butterbeer and fire whiskey. And here I thought that I'd not find you in the castle anymore. Good thing to know that youngsters these days can control themselves. Alexander said while standing behind them. Action like a typical shameless elder. Hermione turned red hearing him. Ah, don't tease her anymore grandpa. She's turning into a tomato, Edward joked. Oh, being overprotective ha. Huh? Anyways, did you see Dumbledore? He asked. UMM, he's watching the second rerun of Titanic movie, Hermione answered. Alexander was about to say something but was interrupted by the oncoming crowd from open theater. Dumbledore straight up walked to him, God damn it Alex, why did you have to kill Jack? That plank had enough space for two people. My friend, that's what the story was about. Two people, so close yet their worlds so far apart. Life is not always sunflowers and fairy tales. Many times, life is just, tragedy, Alexander solemnly said and put his hand on Dumbledore's shoulder. Don't give me that bull. I know you wrote it. You could have changed it. He refuted. Yes, and then it would have flopped. The death of Jack is the selling point of the movie. People are so accustomed to happy endings that tragic endings come as a surprise to them. It makes people cry. Also spend more money to buy a ticket and watch it again he smugly replied. You and your crazy business strategies, Dumbledore shook his head. Well, you gotta be a bit crazy to get this rich, Alexander refuted. Wise words indeed, Snape interjected. Good to see you, Severus. Where is Harry? Alexander asked. He could see the slightly reddened eyes off Snape. The emo boy must have cried a little at the ending. Probably in some corner with his new girlfriend, Sirius butted in with a large glass of butterbear. Alexander nodded and then looked at Dumbledore. Albus, I want to talk to you. Dumbledore nodded and led him to the office. What is it, Alex? Well, I mean no offense, I want to try your elder wand. You see, I haven't been able to find a wand that could match me. I don't really need one but I still want to feel how it works. Considering that your wand is the STR. Alexander was interrupted when Dumbledore straight up took out his wand and shoved it into Alexander's hands. Just like that. Yeah, just like that. If I can't even trust you this much then I should just jump out of the tower's window, Dumbledore said. Damn it. I'll have to work on that surprise for you faster. Alexander mumbled. Truly touched by the trust Dumbledore showed. Alexander checked out the elder wand in his hand. He could feel that it was somehow bound to Dumbledore but he also felt that if he tried he wouldn't feel any problem in using it. He lightly flicked it and cast some low-level spells. Elder wand my ass. If I use any more magic then it would snap in half he said to himself. Sigh as strong as it may, it's still not strong enough to handle my full magic. He sighed and handed it back. How did it feel? Dumbledore asked. Well, I can feel a slight ease in the flow of magic. It's like breathing in a city and the countryside. You can breathe in both places but the countryside feels a bit better. However, this has cleared my doubt. Wands don't make magic stronger. It's like crutches to help walk. He said. Do you mean that wizards are meant to do wandless magic? Dumbledore asked. Alexander shrugged. I don't know, but think about it. We know that wandless magic is possible but is hard to learn. We know that wands make casting magic easy. So basically a wand is just a cheat. 
Don't you guys ask the question has anything ever happened around you which was hard to explain? For example when you're excited or too happy to all non-magicals when giving them a Hogwarts letter. Those kids had performed wandless magic even without them knowing magic. So tell me, aren't we just making them handicapped by giving them the cheat called wand? His words hit Dumbledore hard, who then fell into deep thoughts. Alexander just silently left the room and went back to his office. Dobby and Nagini had been overseeing the new elves. The elves were also diligently studying. They wanted to be useful for Alexander as fast as possible but overworking was against the rules. Alexander started working on his muggle wand. Now that he knew how a wand worked he felt many new ideas emerging in his head. He now knew how the wand drew out magic from its user. Using the same principle he made a wand that used the meager amount of magic to get the command but to cast the magic it used ambient magic in the surroundings. This was also the reason why the wands could only be used to do chore magic. Happy with the results, all that was left now was designing an assembly line for it. He could see the happy faces of some official squibs like Argus Filch, the janitor of Hogwarts. The next day, he wore one of his finest suits. He rarely changed his clothes from his everyday vest and shirt combo but today was an important meeting. He was going to work out Dumbledore's surprise. He got up from his office chair and operat to a certain castle in Austrian Alps. Halt, state your name and the purpose of your visit a guard at the main entrance stopped him. Ten more guard had their wands out, aimed at him. I am Alexander Maxim Universe, the current British Minister of Magic. Here to meet Gellert Grindelwald Chapter 39, 39. Gellert Grindelwald. We are sorry sir, but no one is allowed to meet him. A supervisor said. And why is that? Alexander asked. Be because he's a level 10 criminal with a history of successful jailbreaks. He's very strong too, sir, the supervisor replied. So you're telling me that a more than 100 year old wizard, who hasn't been able to use magic since the past 50 or so years, who is probably in his most vulnerable state right now, can fight me and run away? He asked with a slight irritation. He needed to act like a big man or else they wouldn't take him seriously. No, no sir, it's not like that. The supervisor stuttered. It's all right man, I'm not going to eat you. Just go and tell the prison director about me. I'm sure he'll know what to do. He suggested. The supervisor nodded and ran back into the castle. Soon he came back with another guy. We're sorry to keep you waiting, sir. Please follow me, I'll take you to your destination. The man said. Nice. Let's go then Alexander followed the guy. They entered the castle and the guy led him to a small room with a small globe at the center. Please touch the globe, sir. It will take us to the prison. Hmm, I knew this castle in the mountain was just a fake. The real prison is somewhere else. He said and touched it. They were portkeyed to somewhere frozen. For as far as he could see there was only ice. Whoa, who knew it was at the South Pole? Wait, are those? Yes, sir. They are ice dragons. We feed them and in return, they guard the perimeter. The guy answered. Cool, by the way. What's your name? He asked. My name is Sam. Me and my brother Dean run this prison. We keep many dark and dangerous creatures in here, he answered. Why did you allow me in so easily? Alexander asked. Sir, we all know that this world runs on the concept of survival of the fittest. You are the strongest being in the world, so you get to do many things that no one else can. And I also knew that even if I denied you, you would have found another way in. Sam answered. Haha, I like you. Can you tell me about Grindelwald? How's he been behaving? The last time I met him was in 1944, when he was madly running around the world calling for magical purity, he asked while walking. Well, he's surely calmed down a lot. In fact, he's been spending all his time watching the TV that you gifted him. He really likes it. He even counseled some guards to invest their money in the market, especially your company. It kinda really makes you ask, why did he turn evil back then? Sam said in a thoughtful voice. That's a big question indeed, he added. Here we are. This is his cell. I'll wait outside. Sam said. Alexander opened the door and walked in. The cell was quite spacious. There was a bed at the corner, a covered lavatory. And then there was a couch and a TV in front of it. An old man sat there on the couch watching the Terminator movie. Finally, we meet again my old friend. Come, sit. Alexander calmly walked and sat on the couch. I must say, Nurmengard is much better than Azkaban. And I agree with you. Azkaban is really an inhumane place. Instead of giving a quick death, they throw you in a place full of dementors to be tormented, and they call me evil. Alexander quickly checked his sins. Gellert Grindelwald, Category 2. Indirect murder, 300. Kidnapping, 300. Torture, 400. Sin percentage, 34%, reduced from 68% for already serving some punishment. Quick death is what they get now. If proven guilty, Alexander said, Is that why you've come? To grant me quick death? Well, I suppose I've lived more than I ever expected to. It's not really a bad time to die. Grindelwald said with a sigh, I can give you death if you're so fixated on it, but I came here to discuss the terms of your release. His words shocked the withered old man a bit. Is that your new way of torturing people? By giving them false hope. Oh, you have no idea about my ways of torture. Anyway, just read this and tell me what you think. He gave him a paper. Grindelwald read it slowly. Interesting, a blood contract. It makes me unable to break the clause written or else my magic will kill me. And you want me to follow the command of this Edward Firestorm. Yes, he's my apprentice. My heir. 
He will also accompany Dumbledore in his world tour that he's just about to start after retiring. He answered. Dumbledore has retired. He asked. Not yet but he's doing it after the end of this term. And why are you doing all this? Last I remember, you abhorred my way of thinking. And I still do. You are a pretty strong and smart wizard Gellert. I want to use you for the betterment of the world. That contract will make sure you don't turn rogue. As said in it. You will never be allowed to wage war or fight against any person, country, or organization in the world. You cannot study or perform dark magic either. Except for some fighting curses. You cannot go against the universe industries and Edward Firestorm. You will also listen and help Edward Firestorm. These are just some of the clauses. He said. So you want me to become a slave? No, you will be free. If you want you can just spend the rest of your life with Dumbledore and travel the world, see new things. Like a normal retired old man. He answered. Sai I can agree to that but I have two requests. One, I will only follow the Firestorm boy if he can defeat me and second, I want you to tell me why you were against my ideals. Your own parents were murdered by muggle weapons and you still helped them he asked. Sure, Edward can easily defeat you. Even after you return to your prime. As for your question. Well, it's simple. Shit, there's no memory about this. I guess I'll have to bullsh asterisk t my way out. I remember your sales pitch. Your pure blood supremacist theory. Though I know that you yourself didn't believe in it, you just wanted to obtain strong followers. You said that humans were barbarians, they waged big wars. You gave the example of World War I. But I saw things differently. We wizards were barbarians too. Did you ever think about the ratio of the muggle population versus the magical population? There were more than 2 billion muggles back then and probably about 13 million wizards. How many humans out of 2 billion waged war? Millions. How many wizards of those 13 million waged war because of some random dark lord? Again, nearly a million. In fact, we wage war more often than muggles. Now tell me, are we better than muggles? No, instead I'd say, we've become even worse. At least muggle society learned something from their mistakes and focused on advancing. Now they number more than 6 billion. While we wizards were stuck in the same cycle. A new dark lord comes and dies with a lot of other wizards. How many of us are there now? Nearly 30 million. 6 billion vs 30 million. He stopped. Grindelwald stayed silent for a while and then signed the document with his blood without any second thought. You are much stronger and better than me in things I thought I was good at. I can see the future wizarding world flourishing because of what you are doing now. I'd rather join Albus in his travels. Though I still want to fight your apprentice. Good decision. Now I just need to go and convince the ICW. I'll return at the end of the school term to get you out. In the meantime. Drink this potion. It will make your body 50 years younger and also add extra lifespan. See you later, Gellert. Thanks for having me, Sam. I can see that you guys are in some need of repair. I'll donate 10 million galleons for the prison funds and also get you some good builders. He said while shaking hands. T thank you, sir. We will put that money to good use. Sam answered. With that, Alexander returned to the UK and then to his office. Boss, there is an important letter from the International Confederation of Wizards, Nagini told him on a call. Okay, I'll check it he replied and hung up. He opened the letter and slowly read it. The more he read the happier he became. Dumbledore had stepped down from the post of Supreme Mugwump. The ICW Council had unanimously agreed to make him the next Supreme Mugwump as he was the strongest and righteous wizard alive. The ICW would have a meeting the day after tomorrow and they had humbly asked him to be present. This makes things so much easier he mumbled aloud. Chapter 40, 40. Hermione wins, obviously. The next day, it was the second and final round of the Triwizard Tournament. There was no big arena set that day as most of the race was to be seen on Unity.bs. So, most of the people decided to rather stay at home and watch it in a good warm room with a jug of butterbeer. The people who were present at the starting line were just the students of the school, staff, and some reporters. Currently, Alexander was giving instructions to the champions. All right champions. For each of you, pick one pouch from the table. If you look inside, you will find, a guide map, a broom that can only fly for 7.8 kilometers. A rope, an iron ingot, and 200 pounds sterling muggle currency. You will be allowed to carry your wand. Now look at this map, I'll tell you your route. He directed them to a full map of the magical United Kingdom. This is where we are. Your first checkpoint is at the center of the Forbidden Forest. You have to cross it on foot and expect the worst. The forest is filled with unimaginable dangers. At the center of the forest, you will find a table. It's a portkea. Touch it and you'll be transported to the King's Cross. From there, you'll have to travel to Trent Park. In there you'll find another table which will lead you to a bank of a river. You'll have to cross it from there by any means. Once crossed, you will find another port Kea. Then you will be back at the center of the Forbidden Forest. From there you will return to Hogwarts and have a three-way duel in the arena. May the best win, good luck he finished speaking and left them to prepare. The magical drones were set to follow the three in their race from various angles. If they faced something life-threatening then they'd be helped. Start. As soon as those words came, the first champion dashed into the forest. According to the previous score, the champions were given a head start or delay of five minutes. Hermione went first, then Fleur Delacour and then Victor Crumb. It was probably going to be a very bad day for Victor Crumb due to what Alexander had planned. 
He wanted to disqualify him in the previous round but didn't as it would spoil the relationship with Durmstrang. Hermione dashed into the jungle and headed straight to the center of the forest. She was fast but also attentive to every detail around her. Her first obstacle came as forest trolls. She just levitated big boulders and dropped them on their heads. Fleur decided to take a detour. Victor Crumb was not so lucky as he didn't find trolls but two dragons. They were Myra and Belina. The two mother dragons chased him around in the forest for half an hour before finally giving up. But they did successfully burn his ass a little. The three champions made their way through the forest, some easily and some, read Victor, not so easily. When Hermione reached the center she found a table as told. But on the table, there was a sphinx sitting. The sphinx had noticed Hermione. Solve the riddle and pass, or fail the riddle and wait for 30 minutes, the sphinx said. Hermione nodded. I speak without a mouth and hear without ears. I have nobody, but I come alive with wind. What am I? Sphinx asked. Hermione thought for a while and answered, easy, an echo. Sphinx nodded. You are as smart as he said. You may pass now. Hermione touched the table and got transported to King's Cross. Fleur followed behind after answering a riddle of normal difficulty. Then came Victor Crumb. The Sphinx gave him a random mathematical problem to solve. An integration problem, to be precise. Victor Crumb had to stand there like a fool for the next 30 minutes. Hermione easily took the tube, straight to the Cockfosters station, which was right beside the park Fleur took a cab and also reached the location, she probably had some experience in traversing the muggle world from France. Victor Crumb had no idea about muggle transportation and decided to use his broom with disillusionment and some other charms on himself. He could only go halfway before the broom stopped working and vanished. From there he asked people for directions a lot and finally reached the location by a cab. The cab driver saw that Victor didn't know where he was going so he just increased the bill by riding around the blocks and wasted his time. The magical world was having a great laugh at him. From there, they reached the riverbank. Hermione and Fleur used the same trick to cross the river. It was a very wide river which Alexander had chosen. It was 7.9 kilometers wide and their brooms were only supposed to go 7.8 kilometers. On the other side of the river, there was a cliff, which they were supposed to climb with the help of a rope and a metal hook, which could be made by transfiguring the iron ingot. Hermione was smart and quick. She didn't even have to touch the water as she threw her hook from the broom. Fleur wasn't as fast and she fell into the water. But she also eventually climbed it. There was only Victor Crumb left now. The scene changed and he was seen swimming. It took quite a while for him to complete his 7.9 km swim. By the end of which he was extremely tired. Then they returned to the Forbidden Forest where they once again made their way to the Hogwarts. Victor Crumb was again chased by the dragon but this time they took a pity and lead him towards Hogwarts. Hermione came first and got some time to rest before her duel. She wasn't allowed to take her magic reserve rings in the duel so she was to fight with her original strength which was also pretty op when compared to other Hogwarts seniors. Fleur came 30 minutes after Hermione. She also had plenty of time to rest as Victor Crumb came 4 hours after Fleur. He was given just 15 minutes of rest before the duel started. Unlike the morning, the arena was fully packed with people. After all, after 202 years, a new Triwizard winner would be declared that day. People were excited. Butterbeers and food were being sold like hotcakes. Then came the final showdown. The three champions took their places. As soon as the bell rang they started firing charms and curses at each other. Fleur was a very talented witch but she was no fighter. Victor Crumb threw his item pouch to distract her while deflecting attacks from Hermione. Fleur instinctively sent a curse at the pouch but in that time, Victor sent a freezing charm at her. She fell down not being able to move. She lost. I need to give Hermione some more practical experience in fighting Alexander made a mental note. Now it was just Hermione and Breadcrumb. Hermione could have ended the fight the moment it started but watching Alexander, she had learned that sometimes it's best not to go full power at the beginning. She slowly started overpowering Victor and finally sent the last charm. It was a transfiguration charm which transfigured Victor into a pig. The fight ended with a loud cheer and laughter. Fleur was unfrozen and Victor was turned back into a human. They were sent to the infirmary to get checked as they received some injuries. But the champion Hermione was fine. Edward gave her a nice hug and lifted her in the air. Alexander pointed his finger at the sky and fireworks started. It marked the end of the Triwizard Tournament. Then it was the time of the award ceremony. She was given the huge Triwizard Cup. Her name will be etched on it for forever. The cup would stay in Hogwarts for the next five years. Then she was given the big fat money check. It was Hermione's first self-made income so she felt very proud of herself. She was going to give most of it to her parents. Though she was in for a surprise as Alexander had gifted the couple a multi-story dental clinic for their wedding anniversary. He had also felt that another Granger was on his way to be born soon. He didn't tell Hermione about that as it was her parents' decision to tell her. After that, there was a celebration party at Hogwarts Main Hall. People danced and ate. Alexander was probably the most favorite person to all students of Hogwarts. He also announced that he's opening up a movie theater in Hogsmeade. Students could go there on weekends. By the end of the party, the champion and the most eligible bachelor went missing. Alexander smiled and went back to Galaxy Tower. He was going to attend the ICW meeting the next day and also discuss the release of Grindelwald. Chapter 41, 41 forgiveness. 
We have gathered here for the appointment of the Supreme Mugwump. By the unanimous vote we have arrived on the results that Wizard God, Alexander Maxim Universe is to be appointed as the next Supreme Mugwump. An announcer said from the podium, the ceremony ended and Alexander was given a white-colored coin that had Merlin on one side and his face on the other carved on it. It was a new identity token for the Supreme Mugwump and the members of the Confederation. The other members would have a gray token with the same carvings. Then Alexander took the podium and gave his speech. Let's see if my fabulous performance with Morgan Ellie Fay has made them my staunch supporter. Thank you for choosing me. I will do everything in my power to keep peace and bring justice to any misdeeds. There is one thing that I want to do today though. Please look at the duplicate contract in front of you. I will also pass the original contract to you so you can check it. We have lost so many great and powerful wizards and witches in pointless wars. This is my first step to ensure that it doesn't happen again. Why can find every criminals when we can use some of them to correct what they destroyed in the first place? Why must we spend money on keeping them in prisons? Prisons should be only for those that are beyond hope or reason and only deserve death punishment. But others, with blood contract, we can make the oath bound, not do evil and only do good. If they break the oath then their own magic will kill them. The first one is Grindelwald. You can check the contract. Rune masters and enchanters might be able to detect something extra in it, he said and sat down. They all read the copy and murmured. The original contract was passed from one to another for them to check. Once ancient runes master from the U.S. spoke. This. There's a curse in it. Other people also became attentive. Those who had already touched it looked at their hands. No need to fear. The curse is for the signer of the contract. This curse is as strong as 1000 killing curse pointed at a single point at the same time. It will activate if the person tries to break the contract. I think no one will be able to get away from this curse. He explained. Yes, but you probably can, one guy said. Well, I am an exception, Alexander said while scratching his beard. The people chuckled a bit and then they showed their agreement in the experiment. They believed that the wizard god would not do something harmful. There's another thing I want to talk about. I want the confederation to actively participate in the world to keep the wizarding world moving forward in magical advancements while taking actions against any threat to the muggle or world safety. Don't forget, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We, the world's strongest wizards, gathered under one roof. We should use our gift of magic for good. Alexander said. But won't the various wizarding governments will get angry at that, one of them voiced. Yes, they will at the beginning. But remember, ICW does not exist to serve governments. We exist to serve all magical beings. Our job is to protect all in need. If some government has objection to our helpline people, then I'll deal with them. Alexander replied. Most of the members nodded in contemplation. Alexander quickly checked each one with his eye of judgment and marked those that were beyond retribution. Then he cast a silent curse on them which will make them somehow die from random accidents. He also cast a curse like the one on d.a.d.a position. Except, in this case, the curse would make all unworthy people with evil agenda retire for some reason under one month of them taking the seat. It was meant to go on for thousands of years. After his work was done, he returned to his office to start preparing for his departure from the world. Honestly, he was feeling sad about leaving behind his friends and people who he considered family. He'd miss messing with Dumbledore. He'd miss hugs from Hermione and teaching Edward. He had the idea of taking them with him so he decided to talk to the old man god. Old man, are you there? He asked. Bark. Oh, hey son. I was playing with puppies. You finally got time to remember me, God said, still puppy's voice coming in the background. Well, yeah, I had free time. My work is about to be finished in this world. I wanted to ask you if I can bring Hermione and Edward with me on my travels. He asked, knowing that he didn't need to tell him who the two were. Yes you can, but then all you did will be for nothing. They are supposed to be major characters in the development of the world for at least the next 300 years. If you take them away then the world will stay the same. There will be no improvement. God explained. Sigh I figured as much. All right, then can you create a solar system in my dimensional pocket? It should have at least 10 planets, all of them should be similar to Earth but without extreme climate phenomenons. I am going to save some endangered species in this world. He asked. Oh, that's easy. Done. I've made a big sun, around it 10 planets revolve in the same orbit with equal distance. They all have the same speed of rotation and revolution, I've also nullified their gravitational pull so they will not collide with each other. You can also customize them in any way you want. You can even make meat trees for the dragons you are saving, the whole system will stay separated from the rest of the pocket. God said. Nice, thanks, old man. You want unicorns in your place? I can send you some. They are pretty nice guys. Nah, son. I've already got enough of them. Okay bye, the puppies are getting angry now. BTW, I have a surprise planned for you. Be sure to come to me after completing your work God said and left. Alexander kept on guessing what surprise he was planning. Edward came into the office. Congratulations on becoming the Supreme Mugwump, Grandpa, he said. You too. What do you mean? Edward asked. You will be the next Supreme Mugwump when I'm gone, Alexander answered. Edward suddenly had a bad premonition. How long do you have? Well, according to the speed I'm getting the work done. I have about three years. I calculated it wrong last time. 
I'll have to come up with another plan to make sure that Hermione becomes the Minister of Magic swiftly. By the time I leave, she'll be about 19 years old. Too young to become the Minister. People won't accept her. I am thinking about getting Dumbledore to take up the position for five years. I know he hates to work as a bureaucrat but before I leave I'll make sure things stay calm and you'll help him in work too. Meanwhile, Hermione will work as his undersecretary and gain experience. I'm going to leave a lot of DADA like curse but good ones on many big positions in the ministry so they can never be used by the wrong people. Alexander spoke non-stop. Edward quickly put a hand on his shoulder, calm down old man. Take it easy, you have already done more than enough. Just enjoy your remaining days and leave things to me, though I would still like you to place those curses. Sai ye, I'm getting too worked up. He told himself. I'll go and start doing what I like the most. Invent new things, he said and walked to his small workshop. He then went on an invention spree and made many machines that could make the lives of people better. Machines that could purify seawater. Machines that could produce electricity from mixing sunlight and magic in the air. Machines that could make infertile soil fertile. In the end, a secret machine that could create portals between Earth and Mars. Only Edward will have its knowledge. When Earth becomes too crowded, the wizards will use magic to terraform Mars and make it Earth 2.0. His muggle company had also started to sell many medicines, including cancer medicine. His company had enough strength to compel the world to enforce a strict two-child policy to curb the population increases. Japan and countries like it were exempted though, they were told to have as much sex as possible. Fourth year of Hogwarts came to an end. Dumbledore announced his retirement. McGonagall became the new headmistress and Snape became the new deputy headmaster. Dumbledore was given a nice see off party and after that, Alexander took him to his office to show his surprise. Alexander walked behind, Dumbledore opened the door and entered the office. As soon as he stepped in he took out his wand. How did you get here? he asked. Alexander felt good that his methods to keep his surprise a secret didn't fail. You break my heart, my friend. I came to meet you, Grindelwald said from the headmaster's seat. But you are supposed to be in prison, Dumbledore retorted. I was recently released. All thanks to our old friend there, he said and pointed at Alexander. Dumbledore looked at him, why, no need to be afraid, Albus. He has signed a blood contract. He can't do anything evil anymore, he said. And nor was I planning to. I am going to travel the world and see new places like a retired old man, Grindelwald said with a smile. Dumbledore had a small smile which he tried to hide. But, what will the world say? No need to worry about that. ICW agreed to release him as long as he signed the contract. The media will also tell the world that he's under contract and will only work to help society. Okay, the last surprise now. It's for the three of you Alexander said and brought Aberforth Dumbledore into the room. He put some magic in his ring and a white light came out of it. Alexander just left the room after that. The three had a long chat with Ariana Dumbledore. By the time they called him back in, he only heard the last words of Ariana to her brothers and Grindelwald. I forgive you then she looked at Alexander, gave a slight bow and vanished. He looked around and noticed that the three old boys had tears in their eyes. He waved his hand and glasses and bottles of fire whiskey appeared in front of them. They all sat down and talked for the rest of the night while drinking, remembering about old days. Alexander also shared some experiences from his past life, making it seem like they happened there. Chapter 42, 42 Neville Longbottom three years later, world purity level 89.9%. Sigh just 0.1 more to leave this world. It had been good three years. Hermione had left Hogwarts after her fifth year. She gave her n.e.w.t.s at the ministry and passed with flying colors in 13 subjects. He had retired from the ministry and Dumbledore had taken over the role of Minister of Magic with Hermione as his undersecretary. He probably had three more days to stay there. His company was doing great, both in the magical and muggle world. Most of the orphans in the world now have a place to live and study. No new Dark Lord had tried to rise up in the meantime. Grindelwald also worked in the company administration for the time being. Edward was the only one who knew that Grandpa Universe home everyone loved so much was about to leave them, though he knew that Alexander was just going to another reality to continue his work. He still felt like his old man was dying and leaving him for forever. On the other hand, most of the Hogwarts batch of 1991 had graduated. Harry was an established star in the Quidditch world. Surprisingly, Cho Chang was still with him and also joined Quidditch. Ginny could only suck it up and forget Harry. Ron had taken a managerial job in his company. His brain had been healed now but he was still a normal average wizards. Nogany had settled down with some guy from America. They had taken over orphanage operations in the whole of America. Snape had married the Japanese girl he found online. They were both amazing poti winners and together they had been inventing new potions. They would get them patented by the company and then give up the formula for royalties as Universe Industries had the world's biggest supply network. Sirius had found some muggle girl and married her. He treated her really well and was also happy by pissing off his dead ancestors as the next person to be born in the black family will have muggle blood. Luna was in the last year of Hogwarts, though she had started to smile a lot more. She also published weekly articles in the Daily Prophet. Hagrid had also married Madame Maxime. The law and order had been improved a lot in the wizarding world. Hate crimes had become nearly non-existent. No one cared about your blood, as long as you are good, you'll get the job. 
The Ministry of Magic employs many Muggleborns now. The world followed the example of the British Ministry of Magic and introduced similar laws in their areas. ICW had grown as fine and now actively participated in keeping world peace. Gringotts had been good too. They had apparently invited him to their bank. They wanted to give him a thank you gift. At the Gringotts. Mr. Universe, we are happy to gift you this finest creation of our best goblin blacksmiths. This armor is meant to fit you. It has many magical properties. Then there is the sword. It can grow and shrink in size. Sharpness can also be controlled. This is for the service you have done for us and the whole world. The director of Gringotts said. He knew that rejecting it would be disrespectful so he took it. Image in Discord. HTTPS colon slash slash Discord dot GG slash WTVHDBA. To see them on Instagram, https colon slash slash www.instagram.com slash Mr. Underscore Immortal Underscore Novel. Well, he had planned for his spectacular departure from the world. For that, he was going to see what his animagus was and see if he could use it. He went to the middle of a jungle and turned into an animagus, he wasn't disappointed with what he became. A giant white-winged lion with some ornaments on his body. While on four legs he was 30 meters tall and 70 meters in length. But he could also stand up on two legs and use a sword with his hands. While on two legs, his height would become 100 meters. After seeing his animagus, he decided to use it in his upcoming fake fight. Sacrificing while trying to save the world headline doesn't sound so bad, he thought. There was just one thing left to do. He wanted to gift a philosopher's stone and a perfected elixir recipe to Edward. He wanted them to live for so long that when he becomes strong enough he'll probably be able to come back and see them. Image in Discord, https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash wtvhdba. To see them on Instagram, https colon slash slash www.instagram.com slash Mr. Underscore Immortal Underscore Novel. Alexander was walking around Hogwarts, he just wanted to see it for one last time. While walking around he saw a boy pulling his trolley bag. Alexander recognized him as Neville Longbottom. What are you still doing in Hogwarts, son? He asked. Neville looked up and replied with a shocked expression. I I was taking my herb collection, eh sir. Alexander nodded. He knew that the boy had low self-esteem. He wasn't confident in doing anything. He also knew the reason behind it. After what happened to Neville's parents, he was left under the care of his grandma. He was the heir to the Longbottom family. The problem arose when he didn't show the signs of magic even after some years. It made his grandmother anxious that he was born a squib. She started to put him in danger and purposely made him angry so that he would unleash magic, but nothing happened. However, the real trouble came when Neville's great-uncle tried to squeeze the magic out of him. Once he was thrown from the Blackpool Pier, he nearly drowned that day. Another time, his great-uncle held him by his ankle from the upstairs window and accidentally lost grip. Thankfully Neville just bounced off the ground and nothing happened. It proved that he was a wizard but the scars had already been made. Then they gave him his father's wand when he got selected for Hogwarts. A wand that was not suited for him. Resulting in trouble casting spells which in return made him more unconfident of himself. Because Alexander changed the story so much, the boy never got the chance to shine. Alexander decided to help the poor boy. Come with me, son. You need a new wand. He said and put his hand on Neville's shoulder and operat to the Olivander's shop. Oh, what a surprising visit, Mr. Universe, and who do we have here, Mr. Longbottom? I don't recall selling you a wand, Olivander said. That is exactly why we are here. I want you to help him choose a wand. He won't be needing his father's wand soon, Alexander said. Neville was confused by what he just heard but he didn't have the guts to ask the strongest wizards in existence. He quietly went with the flow and tried out wands. Finally, he got matched with a 13, cherry, unicorn hair. He then saw Alexander paying for his wand. Yes sir he tried to stop him. No problem, kid. Consider it your first job bonus, Alexander replied. Further confusing Neville. Alright, it's time to fix some people he once again put his hand on Neville's shoulder and operat. This time they appeared in the reception hall of St. Mungo's Hospital for magical maladies and injuries. The hospital didn't receive as many patients nowadays. Mostly because everything was peaceful and also because of all kinds of magical healing potions universe industries produces. Son, do you know which room your parents are in? He asked. Neville nodded. Okay, take me there, then, he said. All the nurses and hospital staff gawked when they saw him passing by. I guess I still have some allure to the ladies he thought. Alexander was old but he didn't look like a filthy old man. Nor like Dumbledore. He looked smart and handsome with a muscular body. His skin was as smooth as a later middle-aged man. But his eyes always gave his age away. They showed the look of oldness in them. Soon they arrive in a private room. There were two beds and on them were two unconscious bodies. Bellatrix and some Death Eaters had broken their minds with repetitive Cruciatus curse. This curse is very painful, it makes all the neurons to send the feeling of pain. Repetitively using it on people can break their minds or kill them. An old lady was sitting by the side of the unconscious man's bed. Alexander looked at her with disgust. Neville. She cried. Grandma, Mr. Universe brought me here. He said. She looked at Alexander with shock and worship. Alexander returned the gaze and in a split second, resurfaced the memories where she unknowingly tortured her grandson. She just stood there without moving, remembering the things she did. 
Alexander moved to the two unconscious people and poured some potion. Neville just looked at his parents in hope. After about 15 minutes, their bodies started moving and then twitching. Neville looked worried at that. Nothing to fear, son. Their bodies are just healing. This is normal. That gave him some relief but still. After 20 minutes the twitching stopped and they opened their eyes. Alexander quickly gave them another potion to replenish their strength and relax their mind. Suddenly, Neville's grandma came out of her stupor and quickly hugged Neville. She repetitively said sorry to Neville. When Neville asked what happened, she told him why she was asking for forgiveness. Being the kind boy he was, he quickly forgave her. Then she noticed her now awake and healthy son and daughter-in-law. What? Son, daughter. You are. She stuttered. Yes, mother. Thank you for helping us, sir, Mr. Longbottom said, looking at Alexander gratefully. Neville lunged at his parents and embraced them with a tight hug. He was just 13 months old when they were taken from him. He didn't even know what they sounded like. And now, he had them both. Mention not, Alexander said and left an appointment letter on the bed for Neville. It was a job offer for him to come and work as a herbologist at Universe Industries. Then he left to prepare for the departure. Chapter 43, 43. Medusa and Monty. One day before leaving. In the Forbidden Forest. Alexander stood in front of 300 unicorns. At the forefront was their leader. Alexander was going to save species like these as he knew that no matter what he did, they would still be hunted. Yes, their parts were important for making wands as well but he had given hundreds of new methods and material ideas for making new and better wands. Unicorns were pure creatures, their blood had the power to keep even a dying person alive and for it, many dark wizards would resort to hunting them. They were nearly extinct as well so living in a dangerous forest was out of option too as other stronger animals would kill them. Okay, I'll send you to the place now. It is a whole new planet. There will be more unicorns joining soon and also some more peaceful animal species. He said to the leader. The leader nodded his head and walked into the portal. The horde of adult and baby unicorns followed him behind. Alexander was probably the only human they would trust this much. Alexander then Oxio Suprema all the unicorns in the world and transported them to the new planet. He had assigned a whole planet to the happy and peaceful species in his personal solar system in his dimensional pocket. Then there was Forenza and his pack of stargazers. They were only interested in gazing at stars and living peacefully. He and his 100 friends also entered that planet. Then he gathered the Crumplehorn Snorkax. They were already waiting for him. He also picked up some sphinxes and thunderbirds. Finally, he oxio for any unhappy phoniacs or parentless phoniacs eggs. About 10 eggs and 3 phoenix popped up. Some more small creatures were added. The whole planet was covered with jungles, grasslands, very small deserts, rivers, mountains, and icy mountains in the North and South Pole. He also installed meat trees here and there for some bird species. The fake solar system was also going to have a replica of the sky outside, meaning that they will be able to see real stars. After this, it was time for the dragons. He operat to the dragon enclosure. The enclosure was located around a large mountain. Though most people didn't know that the mountain was actually a very old dragon, on whom the mountain had slowly formed. He was one of the best kept secrets in the world. His body was hundreds of meters long and tall. He was very wise as well and could speak the human tongue. Alexander had the chance to talk to the dragon king. He declared Alexander their god. Alexander in return fed all kinds of elixirs to the giant dragon. Now, he was back in his prime. Though he still stayed still until Alexander came to get them. Surprisingly, the name of the dragon was Ragnarok. He could really cause a Ragnarok if he wanted to Alexander thought when he heard the name. He also found out that all dragons were wise beings but they needed to attain a threshold of intelligence before they could speak like humans. Considering that dragons live for very long, their threshold was very high, probably hundreds of years. He was excited to see what effects will his pure magic cause to them on their new planet. Hey there big guy, it's time, he said to Ragnarok. Yes, I have summoned all the dragons in the world. They are now living in the nearby forest, he informed, while slowly getting up. Alexander had to use his powers to make it all unnoticeable and later recreate the mountain. Image in Discord, https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash wtvhdba. To see them on Instagram https colon slash slash www.instagram.com slash mr underscore immortal underscore novel. Okay, I'll transport you all into your new home. Let me tell you about it though. The whole planet is mostly covered in mountains with caves. The biggest one is yours. There are a lot of rivers and some grasslands and jungles. The whole planet is covered with various types of meat trees and normal trees. I hope you can manage the dragons to not destroy them as the trees will feed you. There will be a large training field where you can teach them various skills. Only dragons will live on the planet. More dragons will join you in the future so I hope you can look after them as well, he said. Yes, I will do my duty well, Ragnarok proudly said. Good, let's get you in now. He oxio all the dragons in the world except ice dragons and sent them to the planet. Ice dragons were safe with Sam in the South Pole. The planet of peaceful beings was named, Fihame. Based on Phoenix and their pure nature, the dragon planet was named Drachium. In Old Norse, Haim meant home. He created his own castle in Fihame, near a sandy beach. Pools, hot springs, and many other things were there for him to relax. The castle was quite big. Probably as big as Hogwarts. 
It will be run by nanny bots and butler golems. He was also taking 1000 elite human elves with him. He wasn't forcing them though, they were all volunteers. 200 of them were master smiths, 200 were enchanters, 200 were rune masters, 200 were podiwoners and alchemists. The remaining 200 were elite warriors. Masters in the art of war and commanding. All of the elves were master duelists too. They will live in the castle as its inhabitants and not as servants. An open training field for warrior elves was made. Smiths had their state-of-the-art forge, enchanters, rune masters, podiwoners had their own big labs. They all enjoyed what they did. With the help of his rune masters, enchanters, and the ghost of Salazar Slytherin, they were able to successfully complete the device which could sense magical children in the world and also teleport them to Hogwarts if their lives were in danger. He had graciously donated it to the school. He also opened some magical schools in unfortunate parts of the world. The population of magical children was surely going to rise soon. He returned to the Galaxy Tower. Edward was the owner of it now. Edward was sitting in his chair, working. Too busy lately? Alexander asked. Edward looked up and smiled, it's just the new Quidditch Championship is coming soon. So many people want to advertise their product in it. Get yourself some assistance. The human elves are very good at organizing stuff. He suggested. Sigh so, tomorrow is it? Edward asked. Yes, and it is going to be spectacular, Alexander replied. I can't even ask you to keep sending letters. You are going to a bloody different reality. Edward said with a bit of anger in his voice. Easy, son. Maybe someday I'll get strong enough to come back and meet you or who knows, you might discover a way to travel through reality and find me. Alexander comforted him. I am not saying that it's not possible but I don't think I'll live long enough for that to happen. I and Hermione are just mortals. Edward said. Well, if you two can reach the realm of the Supreme Magi then you can live for at least 1000 years easily. And if even that worries you then take this. He threw a stone at him. Edward caught it and looked visibly shocked. Is. Is this a philosopher's stone? Yes, I even perfected it. It's purer than the last one. Though you must promise me that you won't eat it. I am immortal so I had no worries but you might just die. Still, you can brew god level elixirs with it. It will keep you young and increase your strength little by little for thousands of years. Keep it a secret between you and Hermione, please. The world has a lot of greedy bastards. He advised. Yes, I'll keep it under Fidelius' charm. Only me and Hermione will know about it, Edward assured, then he continued. You sure, you don't want to tell Hermione before leaving? He asked. I can't see her crying face, but I will not go before saying her goodbye. Not just her but the whole world, Alexander said. Dobby, are you sure you want to come with me? He asked the first free elf. He was the leader of all elves too. Yes, boss. I want to follow you. I can't think of doing anything besides that, he said in a conflicted voice. All right then. Gather the 1000 elves that had volunteered and take them to Fahim. We'll be leaving by tomorrow evening, Alexander instructed. Yes, boss. He had one more thing to do now and operate to the ministry. Dumbledore boredly sat in his office. How's it going, Minister Dumbledore? Alexander entered. Arg. Why did I agree with this? I hate this and it's just been three months. Dumbledore complained. Haha. Things always happen for a reason, Albus. I would have helped you but I am afraid my time has come. Dumbledore looked shocked, but. You are a god, you cannot die. Even gods cannot stay with mortals forever my friend. A balance must be maintained. Alexander said, being a bit cryptic. You mean, you are ascending to heaven? Dumbledore asked. No, not heaven, I am not dying. But something similar I guess, he answered. Dumbledore nodded. When? Tomorrow. Then Dumbledore looked sad, he really considered Alexander his best friend. It's okay my friend. When you also leave the mortal world and go to heaven. I'll meet you there, Alexander said with a light smile. Dumbledore also smiled at that. Well, at least now I know that heaven exists. Alexander then headed to Newt Scamander's house. He wanted to get Medusa as well. She had been a very good girl and had behaved exceptionally well. Instead of eating all the animals in her habitat, she had made many new friends. Hey, Newt, Alexander said at the door. Oh, hey professor. You must have come to see Medusa. She's been missing you lately. It's like she wants to show something to you. Newt informed. Oh, is that so? Then let's go and see what it is. He said. When they entered the big habitat Alexander quickly enlarged himself to 3x the size of Medusa. Medusa he called. Soon a loud voice came. It kept on getting louder. Soon a huge snake came into view. Grandpa an excited childish voice came into Alexander's ears. She had taken to calling him grandpa for some reason as she did have the mentality of a 10 year old. Even though she was a thousand years old. She climbed the giant Alexander and sat down around his neck. She then brought her face near him. Alexander noticed that her eyes were wide open but he couldn't feel any magic in them. Your eyes, he said. Oh yeah, I learned how to control them, grandpa. Not just that I also learned how to become like you. She excitedly said and crawled back to the ground. Then her body started to get covered in white light and little by little it shrunk down. Then the light transformed into a human shape. When the light was gone, a 15 or 16 year old girl came into view. She had green eyes and green braided hair that looked like snakes. Though it looked like she could control her hair as if they were snakes, he knew they weren't. 
She had no clothing on her body so Alexander waved his hand and an elegant silver and green dress formed on her body. Image in Discord, https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash wtvhdba. To see them on Instagram https colon slash slash www dot Instagram dot com slash Mr. Underscore Immortal Underscore Novel. He went close and touched her face. It was cold. How do you feel, my dear? Yes, he was shocked but not really that much. If humans could turn into animals, then why can't intelligent animals turn onto humans? He bet that Ragnarok could also turn into a human. I feel awesome grandpa. But keeping this form takes a lot of power. She cheerful and then sadly answered. Her human form and speech shocked Newt. Oh, it's magic, my dear. Wait, I have a solution. He gave her a pretty blue necklace. It was a magic storage device. He infused a lot of his own magic in it. The device could also refill itself slowly. How do you feel now? Wow, I feel free. Like I don't have to worry about turning back accidentally. I can do it whenever I want. Thank you, Grandpa she gave him a tight hug. He returned the hug and also checked her magical strength. Surprisingly, she was nearly as strong as Dumbledore when he was old. Concentrating the magic of a giant serpent into a small body made it stronger. The only problem now was that Medusa didn't know any spells. Good, I've come to take you, my dear. We are going to a faraway place, he said. Can. Can we bring Monty with us? She scaredly asked. Afraid that she might have to leave her best friend behind. Alexander looked at Newt for an answer. Oh, Monty is the name of the hippogriff. He was the first creature to come close to her. They are best friends now, Newt answered. Can I take him with me? He asked. Sure, they aren't an endangered species anymore. As long as you promise not to harm him. By the way, where are you going? You will know that tomorrow, my friend, Alexander replied. Okay, Medusa. Bring Monty here. We'll take him with us, he told her. She happily ran away to bring her friend. Then Alexander took them to Fahim and settled them down in the castle. They were told about not killing anyone and if they were hungry they could tell a nanny bot or a butler golem. They both agreed and went to explore the area around the castle and make new friends. Chapter 44, 44. See you again. The final day came. It was a very depressing morning. A weird phenomenon was happening around the world. It was raining everywhere at the same time. The muggle scientists declared it as a rare storm but wizards and witches could feel a disturbance in the magic. Which scared them a little. The magical news channels were reporting about it from around the world. So, this is the end ha? Huh? Edward asked. He and Alexander were both standing at the top of the galaxy tower. No, my boy, this is a new beginning. I am not dying you know. Alexander said and looked in the sky. It was turning more and more darker. Then suddenly a black figure appeared in the sky. It was extremely huge. Probably as big as Mount Everest. The figure was covered in black withered robes. You mortals, I gave you my three hallows. In the hope that it would destroy you, corrupt you, but you overcame. Now, I have come to finish the job. Your world is mine. Death shall shroud all. The huge figure said. The whole thing was already being shown live in the wizarding world. The figure dispersed and turned into a multi-headed serpent. Its body circling the entire earth. Its heads attacking each magic city, though not damaging anything. The wizards and witches started to panic. Really, death shall shroud all. Edward said looking at the twitching face of Alexander. I told Dobby not to speak too much but I guess he's too into the role, he clarified. All right, it's time. I should get going, he said and hugged Edward. Edward also returned it. Stay safe old man. I'll miss you. Don't forget to keep your promise of coming back someday. Thank you for everything, I don't know how things would have turned out if you hadn't shown up. Alexander patted his back, I am proud of you, son. Even without me, you would have worked something out. Never stop getting stronger. Never stop believing. I should go now otherwise Dobby will kill half of the magical people by giving heart attacks. He said, slowly flying up. Take care, my son, we will surely meet again someday. He flew to the sky towards the giant serpent. His whole body was shining gold. The armor that goblins gave covered his body. A long sword in his hand. The cameras focused on him. He roared loudly, how dare you try corrupting my world. This planet is under my protection and you shall pay the price for messing with it. You are no death, you are just a demon. Alexander flew up and engaged in a magnificent battle against the overpowered multi-headed serpent. The fight lasted three hours but no clear winner came out. Alexander's body looked wounded but the serpent's not as much. People were starting to lose hope. Let's get serious now Alexander shouted and turned into his animagus. The giant majestic white-winged lion brought people hope. The lion attacked the serpent and cut its heads one by one. But every time he cut one head, two more took its place. God damn it Dobby, cut it out now. I guess there's no other way now, he said and charged at the main body of the serpent, dragging it out of the earth's atmosphere. They kept on flying towards the sun. The more powerful wizards could sense what was going to happen. The serpent of death and Alexander collided directly into the sun. The screams of the serpent and the anger-filled roar of the lion shook the hearts of all. Wizards were dumb, they didn't know that sounds couldn't travel in a vacuum and even if they did, they'd just say it was magic. That was the last roar. Then the sky started to get cleaner, the sunlight came back to the world. Golden-colored sparkling dust started to fall down all around the globe. Only magicals could see it. They all felt the energy of Alexander in the dust. 
Many people broke down in tears, fearing the worst. On the terrace of the Ministry of Magic, Dumbledore, Hermione, Grindelwald, and Edward stood. Edward was trying to calm down crying. Hermione, Dumbledore and Grindelwald looked sad. Then suddenly a bluish ghostly figure came in front of him. The figure put his hand on Hermione's head. Don't cry, my child. Hermione turned around to look at the source of the familiar voice. Grandpa, you're okay. Alexander shook his head, I still have some time before I pass on. Perks of being a demigod. Hermione's face turned even sadder. Don't cry. Remember the words I said when you came to me in Hogwarts for the troll. Hermione suddenly remembered, I am very old. I want to teach you so that you can do good in the future, when I am no longer in this world. She suddenly hugged him tightly. He kept on patting her while looking around at his friends. Dumbledore and Grindelwald nodded at him. I will always be watching over you all. Maybe, someday we'll see each other again. Not in heaven or hell. Don't ask. Edward will tell you some things later, he said. Then a small box materialized in Hermione's hands. Take that, my little cat. It has a bit of my consciousness in it. Just like the portraits. Whenever you feel lost, you'll always find me closer, you too Edward. Dumbledore and Grindelwald, I wish you both happiness. Take care he spoke his last words and his body vanished from Hermione's embrace. All the golden dust that was still falling around the world suddenly flew up and organized themselves into two giant Alexander's faces on both day and night side of the world. The face was so big that every magical in the world could clearly see and recognize who it was. Then the face spoke. My mortal body might have been destroyed but I still see all. Not even minutes have passed and I've started to sense dark ambitions in some. Hear me, I see all and will punish those who deserve my call. Then the dust exploded and again fell down to earth. But this time they disappeared as soon as an adult touched it. Only babies and some pure creatures could touch it for a while before vanishing. Signifying that babies and those creatures were pure. Wherever the golden dust fell on the ground, beautiful flowers bloomed in seconds. It fell on fruit trees, fruits grew in a matter of seconds. Alexander and Dobby stood on the moon. Dobby, stop fiddling with the illusion orb and come and help me set the cannon. Yes, boss Dobby reluctantly put it away and went to help him. Alexander had gifted it to him and Dobby had used it in their show that they just performed. What is the use of this cannon, boss? Dobby asked. It's an intent-based magic laser cannon. If any new dark lord rises on earth and tries to take over the world, this cannon will give them God's punishment and turn them into ash. It will keep people in line and in the belief that I am still watching over them. Alexander explained. Magnificent, boss. So, when are we leaving this reality? He asked. UMM. Probably in three minutes. I've received the message. Hopefully, it will be some advanced modern world. I really want to relax. Still, there's no guarantee. Fingers crossed, Alexander replied. All right, we're all set here. Dobby, you go back into Fihame. Only I can travel the multiverse unharmed. He instructed and sent him away. Then he waited while looking at the earth with a smile. Goodbye everyone, he lightly said. The feeling of being sucked into a thin tube came back. This time, he didn't black out and saw everything that happened. He traverses the space at an unimaginable speed. At one point he felt like his body collided with a dense jelly wall. He guessed that it was the wall that separates realities. After what was like 10 minutes he felt like instead of being sucked into a thin tube, he was being thrown out. Then a bright light came and he found himself flying in midair over what looked like a destroyed castle. Then he looked around and his blood started to boil. No, how can this be? From here on to the end of the next chapter, I've taken some short bits of information from another awesome Harry Potter x Avengers fanfiction called Post-Apocalyptic Potter from a Parallel Universe on Fanfiction Net. It also has Harry x Natasha pairing so those who like it can go and read it. Those who don't want to read more things from an alternate Harry Potter world can skip this and go to the end of the next chapter. Sensing him losing his sanity, God spoke directly into Alexander's mind. No my son. This is not the reality you came from. The one you came from will never have anything like this. You did a very good job there. This one is one of the iterations of the main Harry Potter world. I had sent a reincarnator here to change things, but he died. He thought that he was immortal and became reckless. He jumped into the veil of death to save Sirius in the hope that Harry would be in debt to him later. He even expected to gain some weird power by jumping into it. God said, why am I here then? He asked, not liking being back in some other version of the Harry Potter world. I don't want you to do much. It's a small job. I want you to rectify his mistakes. Death and fate are the main administrators of this word. They can reverse time but the reincarnator will not come back. He lost his chance to his foolishness. You just need to quickly clear the immediate threats to the world and your job will be finished. God finished speaking. Sigh all right, but I want you to keep your ears open when I talk to death and fate Alexander replied. Sure, son, God replied. Alexander changed his clothes to white Jedi robes. He needed to look like a godly person for what he was about to do. With a small glowing potion, his skin and hair started to shine slightly. He also unleashed his divine magical aura so that anyone in his presence would understand that they were not his match. He then flew to the only life sign he could detect in the destroyed Hogwarts. There was still fire blazing in some places and dust was yet to settle. I don't think that the Battle of Hogwarts was this damaging in the original movie he muttered. He then found a man at the center of a crater. 
He was sitting on the ground like all hope was lost, Alexander would have thought that the man was dead if he couldn't feel the magic emitting from his body. Near the man, the dead body of Voldemort was lying. He couldn't understand what his purpose was. If Voldemort was gone then what was he supposed to fix? Who are you? The man asked. Alexander looked at the man. He felt a bit familiar, then he noticed the lightning bolt scar. His heart nearly skipped a beat. The middle-aged man in front of him was Harry Potter. What happened to you, Harry? Where is everyone? He asked. Everyone is dead. Now answer the questions, who are you? Harry asked and pointed his wand at Alexander. Alexander had no choice but to enter Harry's mind. What he saw was beyond sorrowful. The good-for-nothing reincarnator had changed so many things that by the time he died, Voldemort had started making more horcruxes. The Battle of Hogwarts still happened and Harry did win but they didn't know that Voldemort was still alive. The next time Voldemort came back, he changed his approach. He started nuclear war around the world. Then came the nuclear winter. Most of the Earth's population is gone. Voldemort also specifically targeted everyone related to his last defeat. He hunted down all of Harry's friends and new family, even his children with Hermione. Harry survived because he had all three Deathly Hallows in his possession, which made him, somehow, unkillable. He then hunted down Voldemort and the final battle took place just minutes before he arrived. So much pain, loneliness, and misery Harry had to go through. Alexander had a drop of tear at the corner of his eye. He straight up walked to Harry. You poor child. Harry was too much on the edge after his battle. He sent in many spells at Alexander, but it didn't even scratch him. Alexander came in arm's range of tired Harry and tightly embraced him in a good warm hug. I'll fix everything, son. You have to worry about nothing. Alexander's words did something. Harry felt warm. Protected. Like he used to feel when he knew that Dumbledore was there if something happened. Subconsciously, he hugged Alexander and started loudly wailing, remembering all the people he lost. Harry was so exhausted that he fainted after crying for a while. Alexander lifted him up, cleared some space and put him down on a mattress that he conjured. Then he administered some potions to him. After about an hour, Harry woke up with a quick jump. Had a nightmare. Harry looked at the old man in white and creamy colored robes, sitting not far from him. So all that wasn't a dream. Who are you? He asked, this time politely. My name is Alexander Maxim Universe, traveler of the multiverse and God's advocate. He introduced himself. You said you'll fix everything. How? He asked with a bit of hope. Easy, we'll go back in time. I'll beat the crap out of Snack Eamon and his army Alexander answered. Sigh I thought about doing that many times but all the time turners were destroyed a long time ago. Harry answered with a saddened face. Who said I'll be using time turners? Alexander replied and stood up. He walked some steps and then looked at the sky. Come down here, death and fate, he roared. After two seconds, two lights came down from the sky. One black and one white. Death looked as anyone would expect. Black tattered robes and skeletonish body. Fate looked much cleaner. Full white robes. You can't even see if it had a body. As everything was covered. Why did you call us, godson? Death asked, trying not to look scared. It knew that it couldn't kill Alexander and neither could Alexander kill her. But she knew, one word from him and Big Boss God would do the deed. I need you to send me and that boy, back in time to when Sirius was about to fall in the veil of death. He said. God had informed him that he could only go till that point as he would be replacing the dead reincarnator. Why should we agree to that? Time is a very complex thing. It is not to be meddled with. Fate started speaking but was stopped. Shut up, you two. I don't want to hear anything about what you think. I am on a mission, straight from the old man. If you don't comply with me then I'll tell them how death meddled with the mortal world by making deathly hallows and how fate meddled by continuously handing out prophecies like it was nothing. Alexander said. Then suddenly God spoke up. Making both death and fate cower in fear. They did what? That's against the rule. No wonder the whole Potterverse is so messed up. I am going to erase you. God sounded enraged. No father. If you do that, you will be killing billions of innocents as the world is connected to them. Why don't you take away the ability to make magical artifacts from death and prophecy making ability from fate? He suggested. Okay, son. If you say so, I don't think you need me here anymore. Bye, finish up here and come home soon. God said and left the chat. So, are you guys sending me back in time or not? He asked. Yes, yes. Well, do it. By the way, what do you want to do with the mortal? Fate asked. Alexander turned to Harry. Son, do you want to go back in time without your memory or with memory? Harry looked confused, Alexander explained. There cannot be two Harry at the same time so you can choose whether you want your current conscious slash memories to be passed on to the past Harry. You can also choose to do nothing and you'll forget about all that this. No, I might have many bad memories but I've learned a lot of important lessons. All the knowledge too. I don't want to lose it. It may be hard to forget the bad things but I think I'll get better with my friends by my side. Harry reasoned. Alexander smiled and turned to look at the two flying robes. You got the answer. Now send us back five minutes before Sirius fell into the veil in the Department of Mysteries. Okay, my champion. Come and hold Godson's robes tightly. Death told Harry. Harry quickly grabbed Alexander's robes. Their bodies started to fly in the air. They reached the exact place where Harry was standing at the battle in the Department of Mysteries. 
Alexander's body still hovered as he wasn't a part of that time but Harry's feet were touching the ground. Then the time started to go in reverse. It only took five seconds for all it to happen. Alexander turned himself invisible after notifying Harry. The scene was like in the movies. Harry stood near the veil. His friends. Hermione, Ron, Neville, Ginny, and Luna in the clutches of Death Eaters. Lucius Malfoy walking towards Harry while giving his grand speech. Did you actually believe, or were you truly naive enough to think, that children stood a chance against us? Lucius proudly said. I'll make this simple for you, Potter. Give me the prophecy now, or watch your friends die. He continued with his hand in front of Harry, waiting for the prophecy orb. Harry still didn't move. What are you waiting for? No one will come to save you here, Lucius said with irritation now and also a slight ting of uneasiness. His worst fear came true when Harry smiled at him. No, he's already here. Whistle. Nice, Harry. You really know how to set up my grand entry a voice came from behind Lucius. Lucius attacked without even looking at who it was but none of his attacks worked. All of you, except the kiddies, are charged with multiple cases of murder, torture and attempted murder of children. Your trial will start in half an hour in the Great Hall of Hogwarts. Don't worry, your so-called Dark Lord will be joining soon, Alexander loudly said. Then out of nowhere, metal cages started to fall from the sky over the five Death Eaters who had Harry's friends in their clutches. The cages covered them and planted themselves deep into the ground, leaving not even enough space for them to stand. Who are you? Fear-stricken, Lucius Malfoy asked. Alexander waved his hand and another cage fell from the sky on him. I am your judge, juror, and punisher. Now shut up and sit down like a good boy. Chapter 45, 45. Finally ended. He waved his hand and all the minor injuries over the kid bodies healed up. Harry they all ran up to him. Ginny tried to hug him but he ignored her. Well, why wouldn't he? In the future, after marrying Ginny, he found out that she was in it just for fame. Fame, which he didn't want. When he spoke about it, she lashed out. On the other hand, Ron was with Hermione because he couldn't find anyone else. After marrying her, he tried to make her stop working. He was jealous of her talents. So, after both Harry and Hermione were again single, they hooked up and quickly fell in love. Harry, instead of Ginny, hugged Hermione, surprising her. There were small tears in his eyes. Hermione had died right in front of him in the future. He promised, he would never let her go ever again. All right guys, enough chit chat. Voldemort is waiting for Harry out there. Let's go to meet him. Alexander spoke. Harry nodded and was about to walk but five white lights came down into the chamber. They circled around the room for a second and then fell around Alexander. Sirius stood between him and Harry. Are you okay, Harry? Sirius asked. Yeah, I'm good, Sirius Harry felt so happy to see his godfather again. Alexander looked at the new arrivals, Remus Lupin, Sirius Black, Alastair Moody, Kingsley Shacklebolt and Nymphadera Tonks. Moody stepped forward and pointed his staff at Alexander, who are you? His words seemed to bring everyone on edge. They all looked at him and felt a much greater strength in him than even Dumbledore. Oh, I am Alexander. Pleasure to make your acquaintance Alexander said like a good gentleman. Whose side are you on? Sirius asked. Not theirs, that's for sure, Tonks said, pointing at the caged Death Eaters. Let's go, Sir Harry moved towards exit and called for Alexander. Where are you going, Harry? Sirius quickly asked. To face Voldemort, he said without any expression. What? No, we came here to save you, we can't let you go back into danger. Moody yelled. I am strong enough to face him now, moreover, he's here. Not even Dumbledore can put a scratch on him, what's Voldemort? Harry kept on walking. We can't let you do this. Moody roared and tried to block their way. Damn it, you wanna lose your other eye? This is it, I am confiscating your wands, Alexander said and waved his hand. Four wands and one staff flew to him. It looked like an elder reprimanding children. When they arrived on the ministry's main floor, Dumbledore and Voldemort were already in a heated battle. Harry, why did you come here? Dumbledore shouted. Welcome, Potter Voldemort spoke with ugly laughter. Avida Kadavra Harry didn't say anything and directly threw a killing curse at him. Haha, <laughs> good job, Harry, my boy. No bullsh asterisk t, straight to work Alexander praised. Voldemort was surprised by the sudden attack. Harry and his wands were a pair so they cancelled out each other, which meant that he was wide open for Dumbledore to attack. Too much for Alexander's annoyance. Dumbledore didn't use the chance to attack. He was not the Dumbledore Alexander was familiar with. This was a much more senile old man, a fool. Surrender now, Tom. You cannot win. Dumbledore spoke. More like pleaded. Voldemort sensed danger and ran away with his weird flying technique. Sir, I thought you wanted to catch him, Harry asked angrily. No need to worry, son. I can summon him anytime I want. What we need to do now is decide what to do with this old fool. He pointed to Dumbledore. Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore, once again you let Voldemort escape. You had the best chance to kill him and you didn't. You pleaded with a dark lord who had killed so many people and babies, to surrender. This shows that you are incapable of judging the situation. The blood is on your hands now, Dumbledore. You don't deserve to use the elder anymore Alexander harshly said and disarmed his wand. Then he gave it to Harry. You'll be a better master of it, Harry. Even Harry didn't have any liking for Dumbledore anymore. Dumbledore kept too many secrets. 
secrets that were too crucial for defeating Voldemort. All the kids and the five disarmed Order members were looking at the scenes from a corner. They didn't have a wand so they couldn't do anything. Then suddenly, they all operate without their initiative. They all came to the Great Hall of Hogwarts. Alexander waved his hand and all the benches transfigured them into stadium-like seats, on two sides of the room. At the place where the teachers sat, only one big seat at a big platform was present. In front of it was also a table. Oxio Suprema, 200 strongest righteous wizards and witches in the world and all the directly affected people by Voldemort Alexander lightly said. In a second, 200 old and young wizards and witches of all kinds of ethnicity popped into that room. Then another 400 people popped up. All of you, I have summoned you all because you are the 200 strongest of the most righteous wizards in the world or affected by Voldemort. You are to be a witness for the trial of Dark Lord Voldemort, who made Horcruxes and his Death Eaters. Alexander announced. Who are you? One of them asked rudely. Words won't convince you, so here you go, Alexander said and unleashed his magical aura to the fullest. All the people present in the room fell down to their knees. I am sent to this realm because due to some unfortunate circumstances the Voldemort who was supposed to die in three years would live longer and later destroy the whole planet. This is a divine intervention. Be thankful and sit quietly he said letting out his overbearing aura. Man, I hate acting like this. I miss my old world. All the people understood that whoever it was in front of them was an entity higher than them. So when Alexander took back his aura, they went to the benches and sat down quietly. Now, I shall summon the minister of magic and the leader of the goblins as they will be needed, he said. Soon two more people joined the room. Goblin was allowed to go and sit but Cornelius Fudge was also put into a cage. All the professors of Hogwarts and 5th, 6th and 7th year students also joined. Alexander walked and sat down on the high chair on the platform. Harry stood beside him. The Harry you see right now is not the one you all know. His memories and I personally have come from the future. 2026 to be precise. Let me show you what would have happened if we hadn't shown up he said and took out a pensive projector. Harry, put your memories into it. It will project it for all to see. Leave the death and fate part, he lightly said. Harry nodded and put his memories in the pensive. For the next three hours, everyone saw the future with horror-filled faces. Many cried. Alexander had silently tweaked the memory a bit to show Harry and Hermione marrying each other and living happily. Harry appreciated his slight help. At the end of the memory, Alexander appeared and brought Harry to the past. Okay, let's start the trial. But first, we need the culprits. Oxio Suprema, all the Death Eaters, Voldemort, and any more of his supporters. One by one, tens of Death Eaters and his supporters appeared. As soon as they appeared, a cage would fall on them, forcing them to tightly sit down. Then came Voldemort. Hello there, I will not put you in a cage. I'll make you see your Death Eaters get punished first and then punish you. Too bad, I let Edward kill you back then. I should have erased you from space and time. I'll do that now, Alexander disgustfully said. Then in a painful scream. Voldemort's hands and feet were cut down, more like ripped apart. His body was then put in a corner for him to watch everything. Harry and many others felt really satisfied with Voldemort's painful screams. He had killed so many heirs or parents of the people sitting in the room. Let's start with Dumbledore. Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore, you are charged for withholding crucial knowledge, important for defeating the Voldemort for years. You hid the intel that he had made horcruxes and that they needed to be destroyed in order to defeat him. You hid the knowledge that Voldemort was not a pureblood but half-blood and let him hire pureblood fanatics by lying. Time and time again, you let Voldemort escape, because you couldn't bring yourself to kill your precious student. You also didn't inform Harry Potter that he was a horcrux and he needed to die in order to kill Voldemort. You are no savior of the world when you cause the destruction in the first place. Too many people died for your incompetence. You are mentally unfit to hold any important positions in the magical world. I will not send you to a prison but if you try to interfere with the magical world again then you will die. Dumbledore couldn't even open his mouth. He also realized his mistakes after seeing Harry's memories. He sadly accepted his punishment from what looked like a real god. I feel bad now. Good job father, you made me punish my own best friend. I wish I had met him here earlier, maybe I could have corrected him. Next is Cornelius Fudge Alexander called and the cage with Fudge flew to the forefront. You are charged for negligence of duty. Again and again, you ignored the intel that Voldemort had returned because you felt it convenient that way. When was the first time Dumbledore told you that Voldemort had returned? He asked. 1991 Fudge answered. He tried to fight but couldn't lie. You are as much guilty as a Death Eater. But considering you didn't kill anyone I cannot kill you. I am taking away your magic from you and also all your wealth. You will live a life of a squib from now on. Fudge couldn't even counter and was sent away. Now to the main trial. I won't drag this long. Lucius Malfoy, you are sentenced to death. The cage caught fire and Lucius Malfoy died with screams. His son Malfoy saw everything in horror. Alexander just obliviated the boy of his memories of the family, and turned him into a good model citizen. He didn't want Dark Lord Malfoy in the future. Malfoy was too messed up in the head to be corrected without obliviating. One by one, most Death Eaters were killed. Voldemort watched everything with lifeless eyes. There were some supporters too who didn't deserve death so Alexander put them on a time torture of 200 years. The second last one was Bellatrix, Alexander was really interested in her backstory. 
Like what he did with others, he read her mind and looked at her entire life. He was saddened by seeing what made her like this. What changed her from being a sweet little girl to a hateful mad witch. He took the memory and put it in the pensive projector. The memory started to play. Memory. Little nine-year-old Bella just came home after playing outside. Where were you, Bella? Her mother asked. I was playing with Gary, Mommy, she sweetly answered. Who's that? Her mother asked. Oh, he lives across the road. We played in Muggle Park, it was so fun she happily said. What? You touched a muggle. How dare you? We are above them. We are pure. Crucio, her mother yelled in a mad rage. Horror-filled little Bella fell down on the floor in pain. Not even scream came out of her. Her mother cast the Crucio two more times. Fast forward some years. She was married to Rodolphus Lestrange. On the first night of their marriage. From now on, you are to follow my every command and if you don't then I'll dispose of you. You only exist to do whatever I say and satisfy my needs. Your mother has already permitted me to do whatever I want to do with you. Rodolphus Lestrange said. One year later, she tried to run away but was caught. She was then tortured for months. They broke her and made her what she is now. After the memory ended, people were surprised to see tears in Bellatrix's eyes. She had put these memories in the deepest part of her mind, hoping to never see them. She didn't just hate muggles. She hated everyone. Wizards or not, because no one came to help her when she needed it the most. She waited for the fire to burn her and end her miserable life. But surprisingly, the cage lifted up, releasing her. She slowly stood up. Out of nowhere, Sirius jumped and hugged her. She tried to fight but the cage had done something to her strength. Alexander slowly walked to the girl and put his hand on her head, making her suddenly feel warm. Alexander healed her damaged mind and gave her the strength to fight the sad memories. He then cast a cleaning charm on her and there she was. Looking like a fine pretty lady, Bellatrix looked at him with her wide open eyes in confusion. Be happy, Bellatrix. You've suffered enough but you must also atone for your sins. You are ordered to work to protect muggle wizards in the wizarding world from discrimination for the rest of your life he said. She deserved a death punishment but he couldn't bring himself to kill her after what he just saw. Then suddenly an old woman stood up. She was Neville's grandmother. No, I want her to be punished. Because of her, my son and daughter are in a coma. She screamed. Alexander waved his hand and two vials appeared in the woman's hand. Make them drink this. They'll be healed in an hour. Now sit down, or do you want me to punish you for the cruel torture you did to your grandson? He said with slight anger. Now, it's time to punish Voldemort and Rodolphus Lestrange. You will both have your souls rot in hell. But still, I want the world to hear your screams. He poured sensitivity increasing potions in their mouths. It would make their body's senses a hundred times more sensitive. Oxio, Horcruxes nine Horcruxes flew to Alexander. He quickly put them in his space pocket and then took them out, purifying them in a second. Voldemort sensed his connection from the Horcruxes disconnected. What did you do? He scaredly asked. He didn't answer. All right, whoever hates Voldemort and Rodolphus can cast a Crucio or any other painful curse on them. Make them scream he said. People had too much anger for Voldemort. If he didn't give them someone to take it out on, they would never forget that anger. Sirius took out his anger on Rodolphus for doing all that to his cousin. He would have done the same to his mother if she was alive. Other people did the same with Voldemort. After they felt satisfied by punishing them and making them scream like little girls, he killed them with his eyes power. Voldemort's soul was erased from space and time, though he didn't make people forget him in this timeline but in others, magical things happened. In some, Voldemort was never born and in some, he vanished just before killing Lily Potter. It would have been so weird if so many people suddenly found themselves in a hall for no reason. Rodolphus was killed and sent to hell till eternity with no chance of reincarnation. He then created 10 million copies of the memory of the miserable trial and gave them to people to distribute it around the world. Beep beep Alexander received a message on his phone. He checked it and sure enough, his job was completed. All right Harry, my job is done. I'll be leaving now. You can keep all the artifacts slash ex horcruxes but I want to have the Helga Hufflepuff's cup. He told Harry. Sure, for what you have done. It's just a small thing. Thank you, sir. Harry said with immense respect. Haha, it was my job, son, Alexander said and gave him a warm fatherly hug. Now go and have a chat with her. Don't let her get away this time, Alexander pointed towards Hermione. Harry happily smiled, yes, I won't. Alexander then left. He didn't feel like staying there anymore. Seeing the same people with different personalities was just weird. To him, only Edward's world was the real Harry Potter world. Alexander flew out and went through the same multiverse travel experience. Soon, he found himself in God's place. Surprise a very loud cheer came from behind him. He looked and saw a lot of people with birthday hats and decorations all around. Many looked like humans and many looked straight up demonic. Happy birthday son. Did you think I'd forget your birthday? God happily said. Alexander just shook his head and smiled. He walked forward to join them. Did he force the demons to come and celebrate my birthday? He tried to guess while looking at the unhappy faces of demons. Chapter 46, 46. A party with the gods and purple dog. There was no cake at the party but there was limitless veg and non-veg food. So Alexander also let himself go. There were a lot of gods present. He recognized some. 
For example, the one with elephant head, Lord Ganesha, the one with lightning bolt staff, Zeus, and then there was his half-brother Jesus. Jesus was sitting at the bar, drinking some wine. He decided to join him. Hey there brother. Ah, uh, hey, Alex. Finally father found someone to correct his mistakes. Why do you look exhausted brother? Jesus asked. Ha, huh. well, I had to go to the same world twice. He answered and sipped on some wine. Yeah, let me guess, father forgot something. Alexander nodded. Yeah, he does that a lot. One time I was sent to a planet of cockroach civilization. But when I arrived they hadn't even evolved into a stone age civilization. Then I had to wait for thousands of years to let them evolve and then become a messiah. Jesus said as he sipped on his wine. Wait, what's your job exactly? Alexander confusedly asked. Oh, I go to different worlds, get born there, become a messiah and then get killed by them. Well, that sounds more like a curse than a job, Alexander added sympathetically. I am used to now, but sometimes, father makes me regret agreeing to this job. Jesus said tiredly. Then suddenly Lord Ganesha came and sat beside them. Hey guys, well, if we're talking about father problems then let me share mine. When I was small, my mother instructed me to stand guard while she took a bath. Then suddenly my father came, whom I didn't recognize as I had never seen him. Seriously, guys, my mother made me from sandalwood, turmeric, flesh of her own body, and some holy water. I stopped my father from entering into his own home and enraged him. Then he straight up chopped my head off in anger. When my mother found out, she got angry at him. To ease her anger he just put some random elephant's head on my shoulders. I mean, come on, at least make it a lion or a tiger. He said and took a bite of his sweet dumpling, which was his favorite food. Alexander lightly asked Jesus who the guy's father is, oh, he's the Hindu elder god, Shiva the destroyer. Alexander warmly patted Ganesha's shoulders, my sympathies. Thanks, man. You are very nice. Ganesha said and got back to his eating spree. Alexander, come here, son. Let me introduce you, God roared. Alexander walked to his father, who was surrounded by various goddesses. My son, meet Gaia, the mother of life and primal mother earth goddess, God said. Alexander could clearly see that his father had hots for her. Hello, mother Gaia. His words made her blush slightly and God looked at him with a thankful gaze. Oh, just call me Gaia. You are one of us now, she warmly said. But I was born from you, from earth, so no matter what, I'll stay the son of earth. Alexander buttered her. She felt really happy after hearing that and gave him a motherly hug. After some chatting, Alexander and his father were alone. Hey, old man. You once told me that trillions of people call you God. There must be more than just trillion people in the multiverse right? He asked. Yes, trillions call me God, others call me other things. There's even a civilization that calls me C-U-N-T. In their language, it means something similar to God. God said and laughed heartily. Alexander also laughed at imagining people praying while chanting C-U-N-T. After the party, it was time to get back to work. My son, it was fun having you here. Be sure to check up on this old man from time to time. There's one more thing, your birthday present. Take this God gave him a box. Alexander opened it and found a metal rod in it. This is, this is the strongest metal in the multiverse. It can become whatever you want it to be, small or big. God answered. Alexander held it and thought about a sword that he saw in his world once in an adult anime. The rod changed into a six feet long sword. It was called the Dragon Slayer, from Berserk. Nice, I'll use this with my armor, he said. Thanks, old man. It's time for me to go. See you later, good luck with Mother Gaia he teased. Ha ha ha. He heard God laughing before disappearing. A white light came and Alexander found himself standing in a desert. The sky looked orange. Where is this place? Wait, what's this? A glass house. He looked inside the glass house and could only see tall plants. To get a better view he flew to the top of the glass house. At its center, there was an old house and a windmill. A white-haired fat old lady was out to harvest some vegetables with her purple dog, a slash n, guess where he is. The dog walked on his two feet towards the giant pea plant but the plant tried to eat the dog. What the hell is this place, he asked, dumbfounded. He kept on looking and soon all the plants had started to attack the house. Alexander decided to act and broke down the glass. Then he cast a nice fiend fire and burned all the plants down. The dog was also trying to save his owner by picking her over his head and running around. Alexander slowly landed on the ground. The old lady and the dog looked at him with interest. What is the name of this place, lady? He politely asked. Oh, this is nowhere in Kansas. This is courage. Why don't you come in and join us for dinner? She asked. What's with the extra friendly nature? Did she just forget that her life was in danger some seconds ago and I don't think there's a place called nowhere in Kansas. Thanks, I'll take you on that offer he politely answered. The weird dog looked at him with intelligent eyes. Alexander took out some biscuits and gave them to him. Here boy, these are for you, Alexander offered. The dog walked to him on his two legs and took the biscuits with his hands. Thank you. Whoa, it spoke. Alexander followed them into the house, only to find an ugly old man. Where's my dinner, Muriel? I want my food. He demanded. Oh just a minute, Eustace Muriel went to the kitchen. Then the old man looked at Alexander, wonderful, another mouth to feed. You need to pay to eat here. Alexander checked his sins. A useless man he thought. Eustace Baggy, Category 2. 
Dog abuse, 456. Domestic abuse, 29. Attempted murder, 2. His own dog, literally unreasonable, at all time. Dumb, at all time. Sin percentage, 40%. He silently put the old guy through time torture. He faced every bad deed he did on himself but it was amplified by 10 times. Then he also went through a how to be a gentleman class for about 5 years in his mind. Here you go, meat pies, Muriel came with plates. After eating dinner, she further invited him to stay, which he accepted. He looked at the dog and went to talk to him. Hey, Courage, who's the most intelligent person you know here? He asked. Courage though for a bit and then spoke, follow me? The dog took Alexander to the first floor. Then he pointed to the computer. Alexander didn't know what to expect and just checked the computer out. What can I do for you, sir? A voice came from the computer. Alexander felt a sudden dark aura from it. Who are you? He asked. I am the help, sir, the computer said, a bit of nervousness in its voice. You're a demon aren't you? You're the one who's making all the weird stuff happen. He asked. And no, sir. I I am just a computer with artificial intelligence. Believe me the computer stuttered. We'll see about that, Alexander said and quickly put the computer in his space pocket. When he brought out the computer again, there was a red demon beside it. Damn you, you spoiled my fun. This world is mine, go away, the demon yelled. Courage was shivering in fear. You don't know about me? I am God's advocate. Here to purify this world. You mister are going to die, Alexander said and used his eye power. There was only one punishment for demons like these. Soul Erasal. They couldn't be sent to hell as they came from there. They could only be erased from existence. He used his eye power and burned the demon to nothingness. Ah, thanks for saving me, sir. I am forever indebted to you. The computer spoke. You can still speak? I thought it was the demon, Alexander surprisingly asked. No, sir. I am a real artificial intelligence. The demon had been living inside me for years and making people's lives miserable. He even made that dog weird. Computer said. Alexander then remembered the dog. He looked around and saw it hiding in a corner. But it had started to look like a normal dog, just in purple color. He hypothesized that it was the demon's doing. The sky outside also looked normal. The desert had turned into farmland. What's your name? Alexander asked. My name is Alfred, an A. I made to serve and help. The computer replied. Alexander used his eye of judgment just for the sake of it. Alfred the A.I, category 0, sin percentage, no related programming found. All right, you want to come with me? He asked. Sure, there's nothing to do here anyway, Alfred quickly answered. Alexander picked up the AI computer and put him in his castle in Fahame. He left a normal PC in its place. Let's go downstairs, courage, Alexander said to the dog. Downstairs, the old couple looked normal now. Eustace was a perfect gentleman now and was helping his wife. Alexander said his goodbye, gave them some gold coins for the food and left. His task was done. I hope my next world will be a large scale 1 chapter 47, 47, Scammer Raccoon and Game of Thrones. The white light vanished and Alexander found himself standing in the middle of a street and on both sides were houses. He looked around to pinpoint the era he was in. Hmm. The architecture looks like modern Japan. Sweet, I'm gonna buy so much stuff here for my next world. But the main question is, where am I? He started to walk around aimlessly. After walking for a while, he came to an empty lot. There were a bunch of kids sitting on large pipes. Then, then Alexander saw the most powerful and dumb being in the entire multiverse. Probably only second to God. Round head, fat, short, and a fourth dimensional pocket on his belly. I am in Doraemon world. Doraemon was probably the cartoon he had seen the most. No matter when he visited the orphanages in his world, Doraemon would always be on TV. And seriously, some of his gadgets were so up that if they were to fall into someone bad hands, world domination would be a piece of cake. Then there was no bite of the genius. No matter which gadget you give him, he'd always find the worst possible way to use it or straight up lose it to his nemesis Jian and Sunio. His senses came back and saw Jian and Sunio beating Doraemon and Nobita. Seriously how can two, dumb nine-year-olds beat a robot from the 22nd century? What's going on here? He shouted, scaring Jian and Sunio to run away. Alexander looked like a foreigner and was six feet five which was enough to scare them away. Nobita stood up, all bruised up. Alexander waved his hand and all scratches vanished. Even his clothes got cleaned. Doraemon looked at him with interest. Who are you, sir? The fat cat politely asked. Alexander was still wearing his white Jedi robes, so he decided to act the part. His body started to shine in a golden light, giving a warm and majestic feeling. Soon both of them kneeled down and started to pray oh, Kami-sama they repeated. Alexander seriously had no idea what he was supposed to do in this world. It was literally sunflowers and fairy tales. Closest you could come to evil was Jian and Sunyo. Alexander wanted to talk with Doraemon alone so he conjured a remote-controlled plane and gave it to Nobita who took it and ran to Shizuka's house to show it to her. Doraemon, you have not done your duty correctly. You were sent to past to make Nobita better but all you have done is turn Nobita from a normal useless guy to a happy useless guy. Alexander scolded. Okami-sama, please forgive me, Doraemon pleaded and bowed repeatedly. Nobita is mentally sick. He has both ADHD and OCD. He cannot focus on things for more than 15 minutes and he is too obsessed with Shizuka. 
I can heal him and make him normal, but you'll have to surrender 12 gadgets to me, he said. The best I can do is 9, Doraemon said in a mechanical voice. What the, why did he turn into a pawn shop? Is this where all his intelligence lies? Seriously, you don't want Nobita to get better, he asked. Sorry, no bargaining, Doraemon replied. 10. No, 9 or nothing, Doraemon replied. All right, it's 9 and I choose them all, Alexander said. No, you choose 7, I choose 2, the raccoon replied. Okay, I choose, time cloth, anywhere door, big and small light aka Gulliver's beam light, big and small light combined, restoring beam, makes broken things usable, upgrade light, turn fake things real, deluxe light, turns things into a better version of themselves, and mecha maker, put the designs and metal and it will make real mecha. I want these, he ordered. I give you take copter and dress up camera, the raccoon said and took out all the gadgets. This is a scam, such useless gadgets. I really feel like purifying this fat raccoon now. Alexander put them all in his dimensional pocket and left the raccoon alone to find Nobita and heal him. He was going to keep his end of the deal. Alexander found Nobita sneaking around Shizuka's bathroom. Hey, Nobita. Come here he called, scaring the boy. Alexander quickly made him drink some potions and left him there. Then he flew to find Jian and Sunio. He checked the world purity level and it was 89.9%. He found the gorilla and the fox bullying some little kid for his lollipop. Yeah, they need some spanking he thought. He used his eye of judgment and sure enough they had been bullying kids a lot. In a world so pure, even a small kind of evil can have big effects. Jian and Sunyo, Category 2. Bullying, 10,687. Sin percentage, 31%. Alexander put them in time torture. In their mind, they did community work for 10 years. Every time they even thought about something bad, random dog would bite them. After one hour they would wake up. In the meantime, Alexander went shopping. He bought many electrical things for his castle and also bought a lot of miniature models of various kinds of ships and stuff. After one hour he received the message and was on his way to the next world. You can see the images discord, https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash wtbhdba. See them on Instagram https colon slash slash www dot instagram dot com slash mr underscore immortal underscore novel. Come on, send me to a nice world now he cursed. He went through the same experience and when the white light disappeared, he opened his eyes. He looked around. The air was very cold there. He was wearing a white wolf's hide thick long coat with cape over his Jedi robes. He looked around and he was at a large table. Four more people were sitting near him. Then suddenly a memory came. He was the elder brother of the Lord of Winterfell and the Warden of the North, Lord Ricard Stark, the father of Brandon Stark, Eddard Ned Stark, Benyon Stark, and Lyanna Stark. Though, there was also a big secret in the Stark family about him. The thing is that he was this old even when Ricard Stark was born. Every Lord of Winterfell is told about the secret identity of the ever-present Alexander Maxim Universe Stark. He was hailed as the patron god of the Starks and also the true god of the world. They called him Allfather. There were even temples of him all around the world and all people generally agreed on the point that Allfather was god of the gods. Worshippers of old gods, the Seven or any other religion, they all prayed to the Allfather on occasions. Only the Stark patriarchs were allowed to know that the Allfather was very alive. He was currently north of the Wall in a wildling camp. He had won their friendship after defeating them single-handedly. After his memories came he relaxed a bit. A red-headed 13-year-old boy came into the tent with a plate full of cooked meat. What's your name, boy? Alexander asked. Tormund the boy proudly answered. Join us, son. You look like a guy with nice stories. Come s. Before Alexander could say anything more, Dobby entered the tent. He was wearing heavy fur clothing and a similar cloak as his. Boss, a guy from Winterfell is here. Send him in, he said. A young 17 or so year old boy scaredly entered the tent and kneeled. Am my lord. Unfortunate news. The Mad King murdered Lord Ricard Stark and Lord Brandon Stark. Lord Eddard has called the Banners and has joined with the Army of the Vale under Lord Jonarin and the Stormlands under Lord Robert Baratheon. The boy said. Alexander slowly stood up. His towering height adding to the tension in the room. Dobby was way taller but he was standing outside doing something only God knows. And how many days did it take you to come here? He asked. Fifteen, my lord, he said. Sigh well, I guess we'll have to postpone the drinks torment. I've got a king to punish, he loudly said. Yeah, kill the king. The men in the room cheered with whatever was in their hands. Wine, meat, or just fists. Dobby, done the armor. We're leaving for King's Landing. He told Dobby telepathically. He was in a little rush because he could feel that a Stark was still alive somewhere south. Ned was probably just at the Trident fighting Prince Rigor. Check Discord for image of how Dobby and Alexander's armor. Illustrations Discord. HTTPS colon slash slash Discord dot GG slash WTVHDBA. See them on Instagram, https colon slash slash www.instagram.com slash Mr. Underscore Immortal Underscore Novel. Then he looked at the messenger what's your name boy, and why did they send you? Name's Creed, my lord. I was going to join the Night's Watch. I am a commoner bastard so I didn't have many options. I had just arrived at the Castle Black when they received the Raven and then they sent me to tell you. Creed answered. Son. They played you. 
No newcomer is allowed to go alone beyond the wall. Still, the fact that you came, in one piece, speaks about your skills and courage. It's your good luck. How would you like to become my squire? Alexander said while donning his armor. He didn't need to but it was a nice experience. Creed quickly fell to his knees. I'll be honored my lord. Nice, now get up. And stop calling me my lord in every sentence. Call me boss, when we're alone or with the freeman he said looking at men around him. Freeman, it has a better ring to it than wildlings, Hormon said. He was a local leader. Okay fellas, see you later he gave them bear hugs and walked out. Dobby was also in his black armor. Alexander and Dobby wanted to straight away apparate but they had creed with them so they decided to get to Castle Black on horse and from there they'll apparate. Their journey was fast. Alexander and Dobby had fed their horse special potions to make them extra strong and they also lived in Fahame. The horses had their own armor which they weren't wearing at the moment. In some hours, they arrived at Castle Black. The first thing he did was ask for the guy who sent creed alone beyond the wall. Turns out, the guy wasn't working on Lord Commander's orders. Alexander found him and checked his sins. Sure enough, he was a murderer and a rap asterisk st Alexander had checked the world purity level and it was just 30%, meaning that most people on the planet had committed a crime. Slash. Alexander straight away used his six feet long dragon slayer sword and killed him while also using his eye to send the guy's soul to hell for redemption. Many men had gathered around him due to that scene. If any of you have a problem with this, then come and find me at Winterfell he calmly said and left. All right Creed, take this letter and give it to my nephew Benyon. I'll start your training when I return to Winterfell he ordered his new squire. Yes, my lord. I'll fulfill this mission, Creed respectfully bowed. Chapter 48, 48. King's Landing. After letting Creed go away, Alexander and Dobby went to a secluded area and put the horses in Fahame. All right Dobby, we don't know where King's Landing is, if I remember correctly from the show, it's probably about 1,500 miles to the south. We just know the general direction. So we are going to jump 1,200 miles first and then 50 miles till we reach the place. Then we'll find a nice place to get back on our horses. Alexander planned. All right boss, Dobby said and put his hand on Alexander's shoulder. Alexander operat to his first stop. After popping out they looked around. Boss, what's that? Dobby asked. They were both 300 meters in the air with invisibility charms cast on themselves. Alexander looked at the bunch of densely packed weirwood trees in the middle of a big lake. That's the god's eye, the Isle of Faces. We're right on track Dobby. Alexander and Dobby soon appeared over the bunch of trees some kilometers from the gate of the gods of King's Landing. Boss Dobby spoke. Yes. Why didn't you use the anywhere door? You once told me that it can even take you to the end of the universe. A slash n, in earlier episodes of Doraemon, it was said that it could take you to the edge of the universe, but in new episodes, it is said that it can only take you to 100,000 light years. Why didn't you tell me that earlier? Alexander asked. I just thought about it, boss. See, you also forgot, btw, did I ever tell you about this world? He asked while putting armor on the horse. No, boss. I don't think you did. Well, you see. From my original world, an old man or call him a prophet, wrote about this world in a fictional novel and that's where we are in. But, I've never read the book and was only involved in the creation of the T.B show, until Dumb and Dumber spoiled it all. Anyways, I know most of the major things that will happen or have happened in this world but many small things lead to big problems which I don't know. Not that it matters as everything will change once I start building my kingdom and slowly take over the world. I am also gonna go and try to take over the faceless men, they are pretty good at nearly anything. Ack. Why do I suddenly feel like I have amnesia? Alexander groaned. Alexander then noticed the shocked face of Dobby as if he knew something. You already own them, boss. You created them, Dobby subtlety dropped the bomb. What, how and why do you know that, but I don't. God gave me all the knowledge about your past in this world boss, Dobby replied. Good, then tell me everything. He quickly said. I can't boss, you have to ask me specific things for me to answer. God made that rule. Okay, how old am I in this world? He asked. 15,000 years sir. What the, how, and what have I been doing all these years? Tell me more. Alexander nearly shouted. I am not at the liberty to reveal that, boss. Dobby mechanically replied. Why, he questioned. God said that you have to travel the world and visit specific places to trigger a memory. He said it will be fun for you. Damn it, I feel like I forgot something but can't just put my finger on it. I hate this feeling. Who knows what will happen if I visit Valeria, next thing we know, I caused the doom of Valeria. Alexander pressed his head. Actually, boss. Dobby spoke. SH asterisk T, don't tell me I did it. Yes, boss. You did. Dobby said. How and why? Alexander asked. I am sorry boss but I am not at the liberty to reveal that. Dobby again mechanically replied. Dobby are you f asterisking with me? No sir I don't think so. Dobby sounded confused. What? You got amnesia too? He asked. No boss, it's just that I don't know the meaning of are you f asterisking with me phrase. According to my knowledge, f asterisking means mating, but I am not mating with you. Yet. Boss. Dobby replied. What do you mean yet? You know what Dobby, take this. This is my personal favorite stash. Full one terabyte of it. Go and research on it. I don't want you turning homo on me. 
I got nothing against them, but still, if you are, then go find some other man. I am straight, Alexander handed him a hard drive. I don't know what homo means, Sir Dobby again sounded confused. Man on man. Take this pen drive. It has one, not so straight video. Alexander handed another pen drive. Boss, why do you have this if you don't like mating with men? He, hey, it was a mistake okay, the dim thumbnail showed just one cropped Naughty America text, they hid the full text which said, Naughty American men. I downloaded it by mistake and I also didn't have much time in Doraemon world either, I downloaded whatever I could and stopped looking at me like that, even old men like me have special needs you know. Now let's go, stop tormenting me, man. Yes, sure boss, Dobby said with a smirk. Was he messing with me, Alexander thought when he noticed the smirk. Alexander and Dobby rode their horses straight towards the city gate, in their way, Alexander had seen an army headed towards the city, it was flying the sigil of a yellow lion on a red background, well, he only knew that Lannisters attacked the king's landing and massacred men, children, and rap asterisk ed many women, how they did it, he didn't know, the army was still about five hours away and it was enough for him to take over the city, I am sent here to do good and that is exactly what I shall do Alexander said to himself, the world he was currently in was very corrupted and lawless, the people of the south called themselves civilized but they were the ones who committed the most heinous crimes. The people of the north were by far more honorable. Dumb, but still honorable, except that flaying house. When Alexander and Dobby reached the gate of the gods they were halted by the guards of the city watch. The gate was closed, both Alexander and Dobby were clad in armor from head to toe, which was pretty scary to watch. On top of that, Dobby was nearly as big as the mountain. Identify yourself, the guard shouted. Alexander looked at Dobby. Break the gate. I am transferring the data of all the criminals and nearly innocent people in the city. Kill if any criminal comes in your way, make others faint if they do the same. I will transport all the innocents of the city to the basement of the Red Keep. It is a big royal shipyard. You can later go there and protect them. If any Lannister soldiers try to enter, kill them. Understood, boss, Dobby said and walked to the big closed gate with his giant sword. Bam. Just one strike from him and half of the gate fell. The members of the city watch kept shooting arrows and crossbows but nothing stopped them. They entered the city on their horses, whoever came to attack them either died or fainted. Alexander and Dobby were slashing their swords throughout the city. The path leading to the Red Keep got filled with red as if a storm of blades passed by. All right Dobby, here comes the magic, Alexander said. Many people in the city had their bodies glow in white light. Then in a blink, they all disappeared and reappeared in the Red Keep's basement. All of them had their memories altered to think that they went there willingly. Everyone also had their valuables with them, tightly tied with them in a cloth. What will the Lannisters sack when there's nothing worth sacking? Okay, you go and protect them. I'll go and find out which Stark I am sensing in there, Alexander said and dashed into the Red Keep. The horses were put back in Faheim. Your Grace, we are under attack, Lord Varys informed the Mad King Ares to Targaryen. Ha ha ha. Let them come, I am a dragon. I will burn them in my fire. Ha 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 that was the king's reply. He's gone really mad now. I need to get Princess Elia and the children away he thought and ran away or more precisely, fast walked in a graceful manner. Alexander kept on walking downstairs. He had guessed where he was going, the Black Cells. With an invisibility and silence charm, infiltrating the castle was very easy. The black cells were a very depressing place. It was in the third level of the dungeons and there was no light. All prisoners were kept in total darkness, like their future. He conjured a torch in his hands and walked to his destination. Hello nephew, Alexander said to a sleeping chained man. Uncle. I mean all father. Brandon spoke. So, he told you? Yes, he had sensed his coming death and told me about you. The mad king burned him in front of me and kept me alive so he could kill Ned in front of me too, he said sorrowfully. Sad that Ricard had to die because of your foolishness. Alexander shook his head. What do you mean? They had kidnapped Lyanna, Brandon roared. And who told you that? Some random guy? Who conveniently found you on your way to Riverrun? People knew that you act without thinking. They knew that you would go to King's Landing. They knew that Mad King would not take kindly of it. They knew that Ricard would come to save you. There are so many enemies of the current House Targaryen and they used you to start a rebellion. There is no real proof that Lyanna was kidnapped. The only proof is the unknown guy who told you. For all we know, Lyanna might have just gone with Rigor willingly, Alexander argued. B but why would she do that? Brandon asked. Damn it, Brandon. Did you forget that Rigor chose Lyanna as the new queen of love and beauty, placing a crown of blue winter roses in her lap in the tourney of Harrenhal? Alexander answered. Brandon looked a bit conflicted and then angered. Gods, what have I done? He yelled in self-loathing when realization hit. What's done is done. Lannisters are going to sack the city and kill so many people. If you don't want their deaths to fall on your head, then go to the Red Keep's basement. I've gathered all the people there. Take this sword and armor and protect them. You'll find my first knight Dobby there too. Alexander said as he conjured a sword and armor for Brandon. What will you do till then, all father? He asked. Stop calling me that. Just call me uncle as always, and I'll be going to kill the king. Brandon looked a bit shocked but then remembered who he was talking to. Even if the king had dragons, he would still lose. Chapter 49, 49. Glanpa. After letting Brandon free, Alexander headed to the throne room to deal with the king. 
but midway he heard some noise coming from a distance. Alexander had his eye of judgment open at all times these days as most of the people had committed crime in the world, he would kill those who had committed crimes too heinous. Due to his eyes, his senses were always on alert. He saw more and heard more. Quickly, this way a voice sounded. Alexander got interested and walked towards the voice and saw a beautiful black-haired woman coming out of a room, following a fat-hooded man. She had a babe in her arms and a three-year-old little girl following behind her. As soon as they saw him, they got scared. Alexander was wearing his full body armor to look scary to other men, but his looks backfired in this case. The woman scaredly yelled at her daughter to run back into the room and hide. The little girl did as ordered and hid under the bed. The woman also ran back into the room and closed the door. The fat man stood outside, seemingly ready to defend with his small knife. Then the fat man took down his hood and a memory resurfaced in Alexander's brain. Memory. In the streets of Mir, a 13-year-old bald boy sat on the side of the street, begging. His eyes looked lifeless and yet determined to live. Alexander, who was passing by the boy, felt interested and looked into his mind. He was shaken by what he saw. The boy was sold to a sorcerer who only wanted to paralyze his body without dulling his senses and cut his manhood to use it in a blood magic. Then the sorcerer threw him back on the streets. Since then the boy developed a deep hatred for all magic. Alexander walked to the young boy and threw gold coins in his money bowl. There were more than ten gold dragons. Five gold dragons were enough for a small folk family to live for a year, so the money was a lot. The bald boy looked up in confusion. He was taken aback by the kindly smiling old man. He felt no ill intentions from him. Do you want to learn sword fight my boy? Alexander asked. The boy really felt that the man would teach him if he said yes. Holding a sword only gets you killed faster. I want to live, the boy replied. Ha ha ha. Wise beyond age. Good, then how about being a spy master? A person who knows everything and gives that knowledge to one who pays the most. The boy had stars in his eyes. This skill sounded so perfect. Be but, I don't have money to pay you, he sadly said. Ha ha. Look down, son, Alexander said. The boy noticed his bowl which was now filled with gold coins and smiled. Valor Morkulis, Alexander said. The boy had heard the greeting before, though he didn't know what it meant. Valor Dohiris, he replied. Alexander nodded, what's your name? Varys, and yours, he replied. I am Alexander, but people call me Allfather. Like, the god. Varys asked. Yes, like the god. Now, let's go and get your manhood back, Alexander said and put a hand on Varys' shoulder and Operat to the sorcerer's place. When they reappeared, Varys felt his stomach weird and then he looked around. He scaredly got away from Alexander, fearing magic. Alexander shook his head. No, my child, do not fear me. Do not fear magic. It's people who define magic and not the other way around. Then Alexander lifted his palm and a beautiful tree grew on it, see, the magic is a gift from the gods. It can be used to help create life and also destroy it suddenly the tree burnt down. It's on you, whether you choose to use it for good or bad. As he said his last words he sent out many patroness charms. Many different animals started to circle around Varys. The atmosphere turned happy and warm. Varys started to see the magic in a new light, though, still a bit scared. Let's go and punish the one who used dark magic on you, Alexander said and opened the door behind him. Very scaredly followed him behind. Then they found the sorcerer with the dead body of a toddler. Death is too little of a punishment for you, Alexander angrily roared. He put the man in time torture and made him go through 500 years of hell's punishment. Being skinned alive, limbs being chopped, blood being drained, nails being pulled off. He also slowly burned his body. The man went through mind and body pain at the same time. He was a category 4 evil man. His soul would be tortured in hell for eternity. Alexander slowly walked to the mutilated dead body of the toddler and fixed it. Then he picked it up. Alexander and Varys' body flew in the air and they flew to the outskirts of the city in a jungle. Varys was too scared to say anything. Flying was scary. In the jungle, Alexander buried the body, as he had no way of finding the family of the dead toddler. What are you? Varys asked. Haha. Now now. Is that the right way to talk to your teacher? Okay. There are a lot of birds here. Let's start your training and teach you to really talk to the little flying birds and use them for information gathering. After this training, you will go to Bravus with this coin. The House of Black and White will teach you the art of disguise. Alexander said and threw a coin. Memory ends. Alexander slowly took down his helmet and said in a warm voice, Valor Morkulis, son. Varys recognized the voice. He had been trying to find the old man for so long. Alexander was always under strong notice me not charms so no one in West Eros even knew what he looked like, except the Starks. As long as he didn't actively allow people to recognize him as Allfather, no one can ever recognize him. The blade slipped off Varys' hand and he fell down on his knees. Allfather, you really were the one true Allfather. Get up my boy, tell me what's going on, Alexander said while helping him get up. I I was trying to save the princess and her kids from the attackers, he said. No need to do that. It was me, I've been living with the Stark for thousands of years. I am their patron god. The Mad King has gone crazy and there's no place for Targaryens on the Iron Throne. I've decided to actively participate in worldly affairs and make the world a better place for all, Alexander briefly said. Then, are you taking the throne? Varys excitedly asked. No, my boy, not yet. 
Only you know that I am all father. Even if I come out now, people won't believe me. I will remain in the north and slowly start taking over all the great houses while bringing economical development. When people start seeing me as their king, I'll officially take the throne. But that's not the problem right now. The Lannister army is headed to the city. They will sack the city. You go take the princess and her children to my ship in the harbor. I'll join you shortly. Please make her understand that there will never be another Targaryen monarch ever. I'll give her a nice place to live and good food to eat in the north. But she must stay hidden until I take the throne. I don't want to cause unnecessary bloodbath. Varys nodded his head multiple times. Yes, a god sitting on the throne as the king of West Eros is the best thing that can happen. Not just West Eros, Varys. The whole world. But you have a part to play. Robert will take over the throne and I don't have much trust in him running the kingdom. You will remain here as the master of whisperers and inform me of all doings here and in the world. Take this mirror. Call my name when you want to talk to me. Only you can see it, so there's no danger of someone finding it. Now, take me to meet them. I need to change their looks so they don't get caught. Varys excitedly took the mirror and put it in his secret pocket like it was the most precious treasure in the world. Since the fateful encounter with Alexander in his young days, he had started to love everything magical. Varys walked back to the door and knocked. My princess, there is no danger. Please open the door. The door slightly opened and Elia peeked out. Seeing that Varys was unharmed and there was no sword on his throat, she opened the door. My princess, let me introduce, Alexander Stark. He's the one who saved me many years ago from dying of hunger. He's a very kind man. Varys started to blabber like a fanatic. That's enough Varys. We have a more pressing situation. It's nice to meet you, princess. You look weak. It must be due to childbirth. Here, drink this. He handed her a rejuvenation potion. She confusedly looked at Varys, who nodded at her. She gulped down the potion. She didn't know why she trusted the old man but her guts were telling her to trust him. As soon as she drank it, she started to feel like her lost strength was returning. Breathing became easier. Her pale skin once again became a bit tanned like Dornish people. Alexander's eyes then fell on the little head peeking out from under the bed. The dark-haired blue-eyed girl was too cute. Alexander quickly conjured a dragon teddy bear and showed it to her. She slowly crawled out and sheepishly walked to Alexander. When she got close enough, Alexander lowered himself. You can have this if you tell me your name he warmly said. She looked at his face for a second and then smiled. My name is Renis, Glanpa. Alexander felt a ticklish feeling in his stomach for being called Grandpa by such a cute one. Renis looked like a real-life doll. Ha ha ha. Yes, I will be your grandpa from now on, sweetie. Here take this and this and this as well Alexander gave her a plushy dragon doll of half her size and also a chocolate and other candies. Okay, princess. You need to get out of here. You cannot go anywhere in the world without the fear of getting caught or poisoned by assassins, not even Dorn. I'll give you an option. I can change the way you and your children look. I'll take you to Winterfell with me and you will live there as my secretary. I know you are a smart one, so you'll easily be able to do this job. Winterfell is a huge castle, and it'll need someone to manage it, he suggested. But, why are you doing this? Won't we bring danger to your house? She asked. Simple answer, I am too strong. You might not believe it but if I wanted to, I can take over the whole West Arrows easily, but that would not be productive. Alexander bluntly said. Varys continuously nodded his head while Elia weighed her options. Okay, I'll do as you say, she said, hoping that she wouldn't regret this decision. Believe me, by the end of this day, you'd be thanking me, Alexander said and waved his hand. All three, Elia, Renis and three-month-old Aegon's hair turned brown and their eyes became black. All their skins turned white. Matching the northern people, Elia looked at the changes happening to her daughter and son and then herself. She freaked out a little. H. How? No time to answer, Varys will tell you on your way, Alexander said and looked at Varys. Please follow me, my princess Varys led them out. After they left, Alexander created fake dummy bodies of them and left them in the room, with a strong illusion charm. Anyone who would see them would think that they were the real deal. Alexander once again became invisible and headed to the throne room. In the middle of his way, he saw Grand Maester Pycelle. Alexander saw his sins and read his mind. Sure enough, he was a Lannister spy and a pedophile too. Grand Maester Pycelle, Category 3. Murder, 17. Pedophile, 309. Torture, 39. Sin percentage, 55%. Well, I won't kill him yet, but I will save the children from him. From that moment on, Grand Maester Pycelle lost his manhood. There was nothing there but smooth skin, like a plastic doll. He would need to pee and poop from his butthole from now on. Chapter 50, 50. Damn the nobles. In the Great Hall aka the throne room, the king was having his meeting with the alchemist. Burn them all that's all he was shouting. Alexander walked to the side entrance to the throne room and who does he find? He finds the king's guard Sir Jamie Lannister eavesdropping on the king. Oh, since when did the king's guard start peeping on their kings? His words made Jaime nearly jump in fright. He hurriedly unsheathed his sword and turned around to strike. He was surprised to see the stature of the man. Alexander wasn't wearing his helmet anymore but still with the armor, his height looked even more than it really was. He caught the oncoming sword with his gauntlet and broke it and threw Jaime away. Who are you? Jaime asked, now lying on the ground. Alexander Stark. The king has a debt to pay. 
he said and picked him up from his breastplate and threw him in the throne room. He made sure not to hurt him too much though. The king and the alchemist were surprised by the sudden intrusion. Sensing the danger, the alchemist made a run for his life but Alexander threw Jamie's half-broken sword to his throat, killing the mad scientist immediately. Who are you? How much did they pay you? I-I-L-L give you ten times and also grant you lordship. The mad king started talking non-stop. Alexander kept on walking. You are really a different kind of a fool. You killed my little brother and expect me to sell out. Did you forget the saying? The north remembers. He prepared his sword to behead him. The guy was a madman. He enjoyed burning people and rap asterisk ng and torturing his sister wife. Aries 2 Targaryen, Category 3. Murders, 38. Indirect murders, 373. Sexual assault, 234. Domestic violence, 4045. Sin percentage, 61.9%. You can't kill me, I am a dragon. Oh really, then this sword shouldn't be able to cut your head. Well, there's only one way of finding out. Slash. The head of the king rolled down the throne platform stairs. Alexander then oxyo a spear and put the king's head on it and erected it beside the throne. He magically enchanted it to stay that way for one month. No one would be able to remove it. It was left there as a reminder to Robert Baratheon to not mess things up. He then threw the body of the late king from the throne to the legs of now barely standing Jaime Lannister. Alexander's six feet long dragon slayer sword was implanted into the hard stone floor beside the throne. In the Red Keep's basement. Brandon arrived there in time, Sir Dobby. Lord Brandon, how's life treating you? Dobby asked. Please call Brandon as always and life's a mess right now. My father's dead. I don't know what happened to my sister. My little brother has started a rebellion and my uncle has gone to kill the king. I don't think life can get more foo asterisk head up than this. Brandon ranted. Be careful what you ask for, Brandon. See, your wish came true. The Lannister soldiers are heading straight here, Dobby said and got into fighting position. Dobby had already informed the people about what was happening and who was saving them. They all had their precious belongings with them, so they were all happy to have a head over their shoulders. Hundreds of Lannister soldiers attacked but none of them could pass Dobby the steel wall, yeah, that's what the small folks named him. However, Dobby would let one or two guys slip through to let Brandon have some fun. Over time, a small hill of dead Lannisters started to form. He didn't kill those that were innocent though. Alexander was continuously sending him data on who was evil and who was innocent. The fight probably lasted two hours, after which the Lannister soldiers just gave up. They had already lost 300 men. The small folks rejoiced seeing their attackers retreat. Dobby just stood there on a mountain of corpses and fainted men. Back in the throne room, Alexander sat on the throne, waiting for people to come in and see him in glory. He was also thinking about what to do with Lyanna. She was very dumb and caused a rebellion. Too many people died because of her stupid decision. But again, she didn't do it knowing that it would have such consequences. He can't just ignore her, not when he knows that he can save her. His thoughts were interrupted when he heard footsteps coming. It was surprisingly uttered Ned Stark. He came in running but stopped in his path, seeing the scene. Ned looked at his uncle sitting on the Iron Throne in his majestic armor, the king's head erected on top of a spear beside him. His giant sword was fixed into the ground. Uncle, how? He confusedly asked. Come, my nephew. You'll be happy to hear that Brandon is still alive. He's helping Dobby protect the small folks in the basement. Where are the others? He asked. Elated with his brother's news he replied they were just behind me. Should be coming any time. Sure enough, a small crowd of men entered the hall. John Arryn, Tywin Lannisters, Robert Baratheon, Lord Howland Reed and a small group of guards with them. They were also surprised to see the scenes. So it was Lord Alexander who entered the city before us. I was surprised to find a broken city gate and dead bodies of city guards on the way towards the Red Keep. But where are your men? Tywin Lannister spoke. He like others was surprised as most of the Westeros believed that Alexander had grown too old. But here he was. I didn't bring any, it's just me and Ser Dobby. So, how was it sacking an empty city Lord Tywin? Your soldiers must be disappointed when they only found useless things. Alexander asked in a mocking voice. They are good soldiers of House Lannister. They do not take pleasure in killing and looting, Tywin said in his stern voice. Well, whatever. The king is dead. He was planning on blowing up the city with wildfire. He had commissioned the Alchemist Guild to place crates of wildfire in the underground tunnels. You might want to get rid of them before anything else, Alexander nonchalantly said, still sitting on the throne. Everyone had their eyes nearly fall out with the sudden news. They quickly sent their soldiers to carefully remove them. Surprisingly, the loudest of them, Robert Baratheon was being quiet. He also looked a bit scared of Alexander. Then Alexander suddenly recalled a small memory that he had nearly broken Robert's arm when he tried to peep at bathing Lyanna. Since then, he's been afraid of him, mainly because of how easily he beat him up. Well, the throne is yours now, Robert. Make good use of it. Now, you're not just responsible for yourself but also the whole realm. Many people will depend on you to feed themselves and live safely. I hope you do a good job. Alexander walked and patted Robert's back. A bit too hard. John Arryn nodded at his words. Then suddenly some guards came with bloodstained Lannister capes. They put it right beside the people. By the gods. Who did this unholy deed? Killing little babies. Ned roared in anger. 
In front of them were three butchered bodies of Elia, Rennes, and Aegon. Little Rennie's body had more than 50 sword-piercing wounds. Three months old Aegon's head was totally squashed. Brain matter was flowing out of it and Elia's body was also bloodied and beaten. Her head was squashed and there were wounds near her vagina as well, meaning that she was brutally r asterisk ped before being murdered. Alexander already knew this would happen and also that they were dummies but it still made his heart shiver, knowing that this would have happened to them if he hadn't intervened. He was really angry, the whole world was so messed up, so brutal. Lord T. Win, you must bring the men who did this to justice. Killing babies is a crime as bad as kinslaying. Ned said in anger, I am sorry but no such thing will happen. This was a war and many uncontrollable things happen. T. Win replied, weren't you just saying that your men don't do things like this? But it seems like they are even worse than I expected. They seem to take pleasure in raping and baby killing. Alexander said in disgust, are you berating my house? Your words can cause war you know. War which North cannot afford. T. Win retorted, enough, the dragon spawns are dead. It's a good thing. Robert suddenly spoke. His words made Ned even angrier. How can you say that Robert? They were babies Ned said. They were dragon spawns. They all should be dead. That was it. Alexander felt angry now. After so many years of his working as God's advocate, this was the first time he was this angry. How could someone be happy for seeing dead children? He stepped forward and picked Robert in the air by his neck with one hand. What did you say? Does that also mean that you're a dragon spawn too? Your own grandmother was a pure Targaryen princess. If you really hate Targaryens then you should kill yourself too. Such hypocrisy. Do not forget that the only reason you are being allowed to sit on the throne is because of your Targaryen bloodline. If it were not for that, probably Lord T. Win would have taken the throne for being the strongest house in Westeros. Killing children, no matter who it is, is a crime. Don't forget, you are just a thread apart from being named Kinslayer, after all, you killed your own cousin brother. For God's sake, have a bit of decency for a king. All your life you've done nothing but whoring and fighting, even a lord as good-natured as John couldn't put some knowledge in your thick skull. I give you only one chance now. Prove yourself a good king and you will have the support of the whole north. Otherwise you'll have me coming after you. Do you understand Robert Baratheon? Alexander loudly said. His voice made everyone in the room shiver. Robert scaredly nodded. Alexander threw him towards the Iron Throne and he landed perfectly on it. Then he looked at Jonaran. I am disappointed in you if this is what you call fostering. I hope Ned turned out well. Then he looked at Ned. Go to the Tower of Joy in Dorne and get Lyanna safely back to the north. Take Brandon and Ser Dobby with you. By the way, take this bottle with you and give it to Ser Dobby. He ordered. Not letting Robert send Ned to lift the Siege of Storm's End. Ned immediately followed his command and took Howland Reed with him. Alexander also headed out but stopped midway and turned around. He looked straight into the eyes of the scared Robert Baratheon. One chance. Alexander roared and left. He told Dobby the details through telepathy and told him to go with Brandon and Ned. This world is too messed up. Why was I ever trying the political approach? These people have zero sense of morality. I've decided now. Damn the nobles. I'll focus on the small folks. Happy small folks means happy kingdom he inwardly said. He also deployed some of his elite elves. They wore special black dresses and golden wolf masks with red eyes. He had named them the wolf swords, the most elite of the elitist. You can see the image on illustration channel of my discord, https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash dgh cron. Or see them on Instagram https colon slash slash www dot instagram dot com slash mr underscore immortal underscore novel. Seriously, they were all magically as strong as a Hogwarts professor and special forces training made them even better. They could easily massacre an army of dragons. But for now, they were helping the small folk to get settled back in the city. The people had started to see the northern men in a different light now, 